ارثروبلاستي والني ارثروبلاستي دايز ودي اعتقد اوف انترست لكل الزملاء وانا فعلا يعني بدات اخاطب الزملاء في الجامعات في المانيا وفي الهند وفي انجلترا وفي كندا بحيث ان احنا وطبعا في مصر طبعا بدون شك بحيث ان احنا نعمل ايام تكون يعني كل يوم فيهم ان شاء الله تكون ايام كبيره قوي باذن الله تعالى برضه هيكون اباوت خمس او ست ساعات هيبقى شامل كل الدول ويبقى ان شاء الله حاجه اوف انترست لكل الزملاء باذن الله توفيق ان شاء الله يا فندم توفيق ان شاء الله وحشتنا الايام الحلوه دي والله يا دكتور محمد ايوه اه والله <تصفيق> لسه عادل حمادي بعت لي من السعوديه اه لسه منور زوم يا دكتور محمد وحشتنا الايام الحلوه قلت له والله فعلا يعني الواحد افتقد الزملاء كلهم والله لو تفتكر يا دكتور محمود بيه الـ الـ اليوم كان بتاع الكلينيكال ميتنج اللي قعدنا فيه من 12 من بعد صلاه أيوة. قعدنا من وقت الظهر خلصنا حتى بالليل اليوم كله <تصفيق> الحمد لله يعني كان في 57 سبيكر من حوالي 30 دوله فكان يوم رائع الحمد لله الواحد لسه بيتذكره والله بكل يعني ذكريات جميله يعني الحمد لله رب العالمين استاذنا الدكتور جمال حسني جوين اس دكتور جمال بي معانا اه ازيك حسام استاذنا دكتور جمال محمد ازيك يا حبيبي ازي حضرتك اخبارك ايه والله زمان يا دكتور جمال ازي حضرتك اه اه <تصفيق> رجعنا تاني <تصفيق> عود على بدء عود على بدء بالظبط يا فندم احمد الشيخ بيقول لي و... والنهارده برضه فيها للفجر يا دكتور محمد زي الايام اللي قبل كده ايوه قلت لها النهارده ان شاء الله على الساعه 12 هنخلص ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله دكتور لكلوك دكتور لكلوك مش سامع مش عارف ليه محمود عمال قافل المايك هو قافل المايك اكلمه واقول له معانا اخوه من اليمن بيرحبوا بحضرتك يا دكتور جمال بيه وفي زملاء من باكستان انا شايف اهلا وسهلا السلام عليكم دكتور جمال بيه اهلا دكتور محمد ازيك يا دكتور جمال بيه ازيك الحمد لله اخبارك عامل ايه ازيك الح... يا الح... الحمد لله يا باشا الحمد لله الحمد لله كنت منور في الميتنج بتاع الاطفال يا باشا منور باصحابه الله يخليك يا حبيبي الله, الله يكرم سعادتك يا باشا يلا ان شاء الله انشطه جامده قريبا ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله يا فندم ان شاء الله بمجهود سعادتك الله يخليك ودكتور محمد بيه برضه ربنا يخليك يا دكتور هنعمل ميتنج اطفال وكلينيكال ميتنج هنعمله في شهر سبعة اونلاين ل ل ان شاء الله يا فندم يعني هنعمل كلينيكال ميتنجز اونلاين وكلينيكال ميتنجز فيس تو فيس كده وكده ان شاء الله هايبرد كده وكده ولا يعني ولا هو نفس الميتنج هيبقى اونلاين وفي و... لا. و... واحد هيبقى اونلاين واحد 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 فيس تو فيس آه. شهر سبعة هيبقى اونلاين وتسعة ان شاء الله هيبقى فيس تو فيس تمام تمام فندم دكتور جمال بيه استاذن حضرتك ابتدي يا فندم اه اتفضل يا فندم تمام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا طبعا يسعدني ويشرفني ان انا يعني التقي بالزملاء والاحباء من كل دول العالم معانا النهارده انا شايف عودا حميدا للنشاط العلمي اللي توقف فتره وان شاء الله هنرجع ونرجع بقوه باذن الله تعالى اتس جريت بليجر to uh, welcome my dear friends and colleagues from all uh, countries around the world. Uh, now we have uh, our new start with the uh, foot and ankle speciality day. معانا طبعا استاذنا الكبير استاذ دكتور جمال بيحسني رئيس جمعيه جراحه العظام المصريه دكتور جمال اتفضل يا فندم. شكرا يا محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طبعا في الاول انا بشكر الاخ والزميل العزيز استاذ الدكتور محمد الاشهب عميد كليه الطب بنها على النشاط العلمي طبعا الذي لا يتوقف الحقيقه. ونعتبر دوا عود على بدء ان شاء الله بدايه طبعا هو في فتره العماده الاولانيه طبعا كان مشغول شويه لكن مش هينشغل طبعا عن الجزء العلمي لان ده موجود ومتاصل في روحه يعني. ما 
فاحنا بنشجع طبعا البدايه وان شاء الله طبعا انا متوقع ان هيعمل حاجات اشد واشد الفتره القادمه فبشكره وبشكر الزملاء كلهم في كليه الطب منها على التعاون المثمر مع جمعيه جراحه العظام المصريه برضه بشكر كل زملائي اعضاء مجلس اداره الجمعيه واعضاء الجمعيه طبعا على السبورت لهذه الميتينجز طبعا اللي بيعملها الدكتور محمد الاشهب مع بالاشتراك مع جمعيه جراحه العظام المصريه مش هنتكلم كتير طبعا المؤتمر ده على الفوت اند انكل وبيشمل كتير من النجوم الحقيقه في العالم وفي مصر في عالم الفوت اند انكل وطبعا فوت اند انكل دلوقتي بيعتبر جزء كبير جدا من جراحه العظام و الكورس دي طبعا بتشمل البيزكس وبتوصل للستيت اوف ذا ارت بتاعه بتاعه السب سبيشاليتي اند اي وود لايك تو ثانك اول اور جيست سبيكرز فور جويننج اس اند ويلكم اول اور فريندز فروم ذا عربي كانتريز فروم سعودي فروم يمن فروم باكستان فروم ذا هول ذا ميدل ايست فور جويننج اس ديورينج ذس ويبينار And finally, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mohamed Lashab again. Thanks, Mohamed. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank all our Egyptian uh, speakers, guest speakers, and special thanks to Professor uh, Wagih Musa, uh, one of the uh, eminent stars of uh, foot and ankle surgery, Southampton University. Special thanks to Professor Walid Qishta, the uh, head of the uh, orthopedic department at McMaster University, and his team from McMaster University for joining us tonight in this very fruitful scientific session. هنبتدي اول محاضره احنا هنبدا من البيزكس ونبدا نعلى بالمحاضرات بتاعتنا فاخونا العزيز بروفيسور محمود ابو زيد from Banha University will speak at first about the anatomy and biomechanics of the food. دكتور محمود thank you so much. Thank you دكتور محمد. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اولا شكرا طبعا للاستاذ دكتور محمد الاشهب عميد كليه طب بنها على يعني دعمه للنشاط العلمي اللي خلى الناس كلها بتستنى المحاضرات سواء في طب بنها او في اي مكان او في الجمعيه علشان خاطر فعلا الاستفاده بتبقى قويه جدا لان الناس بتتكلم في مواضيع مهمه وفي نفس الوقت بتوصل المعلومه بطريقه سهله وميسره شكرا طبعا لاساتذتنا الافاضل لجمعيه جراحه العظام المصريه على راسها الاستاذ الدكتور جمال حسني شرف لينا كلنا تواجده معانا النهارده وطبعا بنشكر اساتذتنا الافاضل الفوت اند انكل كونسلتنس دكتور هاني الموافي دكتور احمد خليف دكتور محمد مختار زميلي العزيز دكتور احمد رامي استاذنا الاستاذ الدكتور وجيه موسى الاستاذ الدكتور وجيه موسى مشاركته لينا شرف عظيم دكتور وجيه كل محاضره بيقولها بيقول فيها حاجه جديده نتعلم منها حاجه جديده يعني ما شاء الله يعني فاحنا ان شاء الله اول محاضره هنبدا فيها النهارده هنتكلم عن الاناتومي اند باي ميكانكس اوف فوت اند انكل ان بريف وهي محاضره هتبقى فيري سيمبل عشان تبقى الاستفاده مش هتبقى حاجات ان ديبت عشان نستفيد منها كلنا ونطلع بحاجات احنا يعني ما ننساهاش حاجات بسيطه بس تبقى تبقى اساسيه في الشغل في اي حد هيشتغل فوت اند انكل The first question in anatomy and the biomechanics of foot and ankle, what are the essential functions of foot and ankle? The essential functions of the foot to provide a structure supporting platform for the body and to absorb forces and to be able to adjust different trains to if the patient or if the person stand on uneven ground, this foot can adjust this uneven ground. is adjust the different trains and to convert to convert transverse torque from lower extremity and to become a rigid liver capable of forward propulsion the ankle the ankle itself formed from tibia fibula and talus the primary motion of the ankle consists of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion the range of motion of the ankle Extension is about 18 degrees and flexion is about 48 degrees. The bimolar axis in the coronal plane, it was 82 degree and the axial plane from 13 to 18 degrees external rotation. 
the ankylosing smoothness, the ankylosing smoothness consists of three main components, primary, the anterior, inferior, talofibular ligament. The anterior, inferior, talofibular ligament attached to the anterolateral tibial tubercle, the fragment called chapeau, and avulsion of this fragment leads to chapeau fracture, and attach it to the anterior tubercle of the fibula, white stuff fragment. Second thing is the interosseous ligament. This interosseous ligament consists is a continuation of the interosseous membrane between the tibia and fibula. Finally, it is consists from the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. Posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament attach it to the posterior tubercle of tibia volcaban and avulsion of this fracture lead to fracture of the posterior process of the tibia and inserts laterally to the posterior fibula. The normal X-ray alignment of the ankle joint, the telopleural angle between eight to 15 on mortis view and the medial clear space should be less than four millimeter on mortis view as in this view. Increase of this medial clear space denotes lateral tailor shift. And the tibial fibular clear space, this is space is, should be less than six millimeter in AP and mortis. If, the, if it is more than six millimeter on AP or mortis view, it denotes synthesmotic instability or synthesmotic disruption. Another criteria for synthesmotic Assessment is the tibial fibular overlap. This gap, if it should be more, more than six millimeter, if this overlap is less than six millimeter, it denotes synthesmotic disruption or lateral displacement of the fibula. And it should be less, more than one millimeter on mortis view. If it's the ligaments of the ankle, the lateral fibular ligaments. It consists of the anterior telofibular ligaments, which attach it to the anterior part of the distal fibula, to the, from the talus to the, the anterior part of the distal fibula, and it is uh, the weakest, and it is consists of intercapsular thickening and the Calcaneo fibular ligaments, is, which is the posterior and is the longest, narrow, cord like, and the posterior fibular ligaments is the deepest and strongest, which is posterior. The anterior fibular ligaments is tightening with blunter flexion, but the calcaneo fibular ligament is stretched on inversion. The medial ligament is a deltoid ligament consists of two layers, superficial and deep. Superficial consists of tibio navicular and tibio calcaneal ligaments, and deep consists of anterior and posterior telofibular ligament. The anterior and posterior tibio telar ligament. The etiology of the foot and ankle foot consists of 26 bones, 7 tarsal bones, 5 mid tarsal. 14 phalanges plus the semis of flexor halos previous. The hind foot consists of the calcaneus and talus, and the mid foot consists of cuboid, navicular, and the three cuneiforms. And the fore foot consists of the metatarsals and phalanges. The calcaneus consists of anterior, middle, and posterior facets. Three facets consist of the articular surface of the calcaneus. The middle articular face is supported by, by the sustentaculum tili. Two angles should be noted in the calcaneus. It's very important in case of fracture can calcaneus, especially the depression fracture. In the bohler angle, the bohler angle consists between the, the maximum highest part of the anterior process of the calcaneus and the highest part of the posterior facet and the angle between this line and a line tangential with the upper calcaneal tuberosity. This angle normally between 20 to 40 degrees. 
this angle and the Gisane angle. This is this Gisane angle from the highest part of the anterior teleprobosis to just anterior to the posterior facet of the calcaneus and from the anterior part of the calcaneus to the tangential with the posterior facet. This is normally between 95 to 100 and degrees. Increase of this Gisane angle denotes depression of the posterior facet. The talus, the talus consists of body, neck, and the head, and the articular surface of the talus consists 60% of the talus, and no muscle attachment to the body of the talus. And the posterior lateral process of the talus called the osteoigonum, with the attached to the posterior telofibral ligament. The blood supply of the talus, the blood supply consists of three main blood supply, the posterior tibial artery, Dorsalis pedis artery and boronial artery. The posterior tibial artery is, is the artery that to the tarsal canal, give to a deltoid branch and calcaneal branches. And this posterior tibial artery is the primary blood supply. Dorsalis pedis artery, the medial tarsal branches and artery is the tarsal sinus tarsi. And the boronial artery contributes the artery of the tarsal sinus. The rest of osteology of the midfoot is the cuboid. The cuboid has the groove, it's under surface, receives the tendon of the peroneus longus and the navicular and cuneiform. The middle and medial with the lateral cuneiform, the middle cuneiform doesn't extend as far distally as the medial and lateral cuneiform. At, it allows the second metarsal to, to be a key in this space as a key in the door. The forefoot, uh, in general, the metatarsals and phalanges are similar in shape and function in those in the hand. The semoid need the first metatarsal head are paired within the tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis. What is the muscle attached to the base of the fifth metatarsal is the peroneus brevis muscle. Together with this attachment, this is a attachment of the lateral band of the plantar fascia, plantar to the base of the fifth metatarsal. And this is responsible for uh, uh, mechanical instability of the base fifth, uh, especially in joint fractures zonic knee. The basic alignment is the calcaneal inclination angle. Calcaneal inclination angle between the ground and inferior aspect of the calcaneus, normally between 18 to 22 degrees. This calcaneus tilted upward to the base caves or horizontal orientation in cases of base plants. This is the Muris angle. The Muris angle is the alignment between the long axis of the talus and the first metatarsal on wet peering lateral X-ray. This angle is more than four degrees. If more than four degrees, it is abnormal. The lateral telocalcaneal angle is a bisecting angle between the long axis of the talus and calcaneal inclination, normally between 25 to 45 degrees. If more than 45 degrees, suggest hind foot valgus deformity, as in cases of flat foot. The kite's angle is the bisecting line from the head of the talus and parallel line to the lateral order of the calcaneus, normally it is between 15 to 30 degrees. If more than 30 degrees suggest hind foot valgus malalignment as cases in flat foot. Another angle in this, this space is the uh, Taylor, Taylor head coverage angle. It is between the articular surface of the head of the talus and the articular surface of the head of the navicular. If this Taylor head and coverage is in cases of forefoot abduction, in cases of flat feet deformity, and this denotes we need a, a forefoot abduction osteotomy as Evans or Mosca osteotomy to correct the forefoot abduction. Another basic alignment of the foot and ankles, sinus or size, see throw sign. This indicates external rotation of the hind foot, often seen with virus and forefoot adduction in cave virus deformity. 
And this is the hallux valgus angle is between the axis of the first intertarsal and the axis of the proximal pharynx. Normally, it is less than 15 degrees. Exaggeration of this degrees denotes hallux valgus deformity, in which if it's between 15 to 25 degrees, denote first degree. If between 25 to 40 degrees, it is the second degree, moderate, severe, moderate deformity. If more than 45 degrees, denotes severe hallux valgus deformity. Another foot alignment is the intermetarsal angle, which is the angle between the longitudinal axis of the first metarsal and the longitudinal axis of the first metarsal. Normally, it is less than nine degrees. Exaggeration denotes hallux valgus deformity. This is a, some questions about the arthrology of the ankle, which is the structure attached to the anterior lateral tibia and it's responsible for T low avulsion fracture in the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is the anterior part of the syndesmosis. And what is the structure attached to the posterior lateral tibia and responsible for posterior malleolus fractures? is the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is the posterior part of the synthesis. So small fragments fraction of the posterior malleus require fixation, as it is avulsion fracture. Fixation of this small fraction attribute to the syndesmotic stability, not the ankle inst stability. We used to fix the large fragment more than 25% from the articular surface as it is affects the ankle stability, but now small fragments should be fixed as it is attributed to the syndesmotic stability due to attachment of the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is a thick and very important ligament for syndesmotic stability. The joints of the foot, the ankle joint, which is the telocleural joint, subtalar joint, telonavicular, calcaneic cuboid, intertarsal joints, and tarsometatarsal and interphalangeal joints. The transverse tarsal joints made of calcaneic cuboid and telonavicular. These joints permit rotation in the sagittal plane to do subination and pronation and allows adduction and abduction in the coronal plane. The less frank joints, which is immobile, would consist between the base of the second metatarsal is recessed between the third, the three cuneiforms. The less frank ligaments is a blunter and joins second metatarsal base to the medial cuneiform. Another question. What tendon runs beneath the syntaclum tuli is the FHL, the flexor hallucis longus. And what is the plantaris tendon medial or lateral to the Achilles tendon at the ankle? It is medial. The plantaris tendon is medial to the Achilles tendon. What is the, what is the root innervation of the extensor hallux brevis is L5. So the root innervation for the foot and the ankle is very important in diagnosis and assessment of motor function of the foot and sensations and sensation, especially in cases of tendon transfers around foot and ankle. A complete common peroneal nerve injury at the level of the fibular head would result in loss of sensation to which area this lead to sensation loss in the dorsum of the foot. Following over reduction on terminal fixation of the calcaneal fractures through the lateral, sensi, the lateral approach, the patient complains of numbness along the lateral border of the foot. What sensory nerve have been injured is the shoulder nerve. So, Sinus tarsi approach avoids this complication. It is a smaller incision above this level of area, above the level of above the level of shoulder nerve. So uh, this sinus tarsi approach, which is uh, replace the ordinary lateral approach, extensile lateral approach of the calcaneus, allow avoidance of the injury of the shoulder nerve. The subtalar joints, uh, subtalar joints, pro subtalar joint provide inversion and inversion, and the calcaneus moving under the talus. So the range of motion of inversion is 33 degree, 33 degree, 
and inversions about 18 degrees. The subtalar joints is uh, due uh, supination and pronation in a triplane motion. The supination is and pronation is not a just simple motion. Pronation consists of abduction, dorsiflexion, and inversion. Subination consists of adduction, plantar flexion, and inversion. So from this triplane motion, we can divide the diseases of the foot and the ankle to a pronation disease and a subination disease. Subination disease at the cavus foot, pronation disease as the case of flexible flat foot, rigid flat foot, interstitial coalition, and so on, brunial spastic flat foot. We can categorize the diseases in these two main groups, bronation and subination disease. As a bronation is not a simple technique, simple motion. It is and consists of abduction, dorsiflexion, and inversion. And subination consists of adduction, plantar flexion, and inversion. The subtalar joints with what is the uh, sinus tarsi is the anatomical space. It's medially continuous with much narrower tarsal canal. Its boundaries consist of superiorly the talus, inferiorly the calcaneus, anteriorly the talocalcaneo-navicular joints, and the posteriorly the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. This is to note the boundaries of this uh, sinus tarsi to when you fix the calcaneus, you should know the sinus tarsi to, uh, uh, if you will fix the calcaneus from the sinus tarsi approach, you should know these boundaries to be uh, familiar with the fixation of the posterior facet through the sinus tarsi approach. And in the sinus tarsi syndrome and so on. The hind foot is connected to the midfoot through the Schubert joint. The midfoot is connected to the forefoot through the less frank joint. The tarsal and midfoot joints, this consists of the little motion occur through the intercuniform and the cuneiform joints. The fourth and fifth tarsal joint are the most mobile, with range of from five to 20 degrees of motion. The second tarsal metatarsal joint is the least mobile with one degree of motion. It's the corner stool, it's the, the, the apex of the Roman arch in the foot is the second, the second metatarsal. The medial arch, the next lecture, Professor Lacluc will talk about these arches. I will give uh, just uh, small uh, ideas about the arches of the foot. The medial arch, which it formed by calcaneus, talus, navicular, cuneiform, first, the second, third metatarsal. And this uh, medial arch is elastic with the talonavicular part is the weakest point. And the calcaneonavicular ligament, which is called spring ligament, uh, which she plans with the deltoid, aims in support and support the head of the talus inferiorly and supported by the T-post, the gallus posterior tendon, plantar fascia, muscles of the sole of the foot, tibialis anterior, and boroneus longus. The medial arch, we can show in this diagram the windless effect of the plantar fascia. With two extension, tightness of plantar fascia occurs, raises the arch, inverse calcaneus, Stiffen the foot in pronation to push off and make propulsion. The lateral arch conformed of calcaneus, cupoid, fourth and fifth metatarsal, and this arch is less elastic than the medial one and supported by two strong ligaments, long plantar ligament, plantar calcaneo cupoid ligaments. The weight distribution in the foot is the anterior pillar to the posterior pillar consists one to one with the part to uh, transfer to the calcaneus and the forefoot 50-50. The anterior pillar, uh, the medial arch to the lateral arch two to one and the medial uh, three metatarsals consists of 33% of wet pairing and the fourth and fifth metatarsal consists of 17% uh, of wet pairing. The transverse arches Series of transverse arches transit by the interosseous plantar and torsal ligaments and by the muscle of the first 
to the fifth tooth as the adductor hallucis abraneus longus. And combination of arch gives rise to that tripod stand concept with the uh, uh, tripod uh, weight pairing on calcaneus first metatarsal and fifth metatarsal head. Uh, as in cases of cavovirus foot with plantar flexion of the first metatarsal, the plantar flexion denotes uh, or the plantar flexion of the first metatarsal denotes elevation of the calcaneus and elevation of the fifth metatarsal. So to compensate the weight bearing, the calcaneus inverts and the lateral border of the foot, which consists of the fifth metatarsal, lies downwards. So the, the form is a deformity in the virus and uh, weight bearing on the lateral side of the foot, which is responsible for callosities in this area. Subtalar and transverse tarsal interaction. Subtalar pronation causes the transverse tarsal joint axis become more parallel from referred to the unlocking. And subtalar subination causes the transverse tarsal joint axis to become non parallel and become locked. The foot distribution during uh, way, way poking is the four to the four multiplied by the body weight, and during running, it is 12 multiplied but during running. The muscle actions uh, to, in the foot and the ankles, it's the muscles anterior to the ankle act as the dorsiflexors, posterior to the ankle acts as the plantar flexion, and the lateral side to the, to the subtalar joints may act as everters, and the medial to the subtalar joints make as inverters. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Abu Zaid, for this very interesting talk. Uh, if, uh, if you have any questions to uh, Professor Mahmoud Abu Zaid. Yeah, Dr. Mahmoud, to the point, you made it very simple, Sarah. Uh, our next speaker, Professor Mohamed Laklouk from Minya University. Professor Mohamed. The head of <laughs> orthopedic department, uh, Benha Faculty of Medicine. Dr. Ahmed, you are very welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Mohamed Laklouk from Minya University. Professor Mohamed will speak about Arsh's philosophy of the arches of the food. Dr. Muhammad has taught us a very simple way to talk about the arches of the food. Why God has made the arches of the food and the philosophy of it. Uh, he will make it in a very simple manner. Then Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Muhammad, mashallah, he is a great man. If he is not able to finish, he will not be able to finish. So Dr. Muhammad, inshallah, will try to simplify it. In his, inshallah. Uh, in inshallah. His, في في التكنيك الجميل بتاعه يعني اتفضل دكتور محمد بيه ان شاء الله في البدايه بنشكر استاذنا الاستاذ الدكتور محمد الاشحد على المجهود الخرافي الصراحه يعني مش اي حد يقدر يقوم بالمجهود ده لكن هو لها ان شاء الله وهو عودنا على كده دايما وباشراف استاذنا الاستاذ الدكتور جمال بيه حسني رئيس جمعيه جراحه العظام لان هو برضه طاقه ابداعيه في عمل المحاضرات والمؤتمرات يعني ربنا يكرمه ان شاء الله برحب باخويا وحبيبي الاستاذ الدكتور احمد علام رئيس قسم العظام في بنها ومش هنطول كتير في المقدمات عشان ما نضيعش الفرصه على بقيه زملائنا ان احنا نستفيد منه اور توك توداي ادفرت بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Our talk today about philosophy of the food arches. Introduction. We have uh, two sets of uh, arches, either longitudinal arch, we have two longitudinal arch, medial and lateral, and series of transverse arches, anterior and posterior incomplete arch. A lot of them know that you have a separate arch, medial longitudinal arch and lateral longitudinal arch and transverse arch. But actually, it is not a separate arch. It is a continuous vault, like this foot, and like this foot. If we show the foot arches and compare it by this vault, 
it is the same shape. If we take the same letters A and B and C, medial uh, first head of the first metatarsal, fifth metatarsal and the calcaneus, we can see the same distribution in the foot. It's equally medial longitudinal arch and lateral longitudinal arch, and it's equal the uh, transverse arches. And because the arch of the foot is not a separate arches, so any destruction of one arch in these arches cannot affect the other arch because it is a separate arch. But actually, we have a void. So destruction of any part of arch can affect all arches of the foot. The arches of the foot contains, uh, consists of three supports. As we said before, the head of the first metatarsal and the head of the first metatarsal and the calcaneus. And we have three sub arches medial and lateral longitudinal and anterior transverse arch. What about the inherent instability of the arches? Number one of this inherent stability comes from the shape of the bone. The shape of the arches, like this Roman arch or old Roman arch, also it's like this convex bridge. We have three types of bridge, either convex bridge like this, and the distribution of weight are distributed downward and outward like these arrows, and flat bridges, and the weight is distributed directly downward, and concave bridges like this, and the weight are distributed downward and onward in this empty part. The foot like this type of bridges. So the distribution of the weight comes to the periphery in the calcaneus and the first metatarsal vein. Also, we have a lot of system of uh, stability uh, come from, number one, presence of the keystone, this is the tip of this arch, and preserves the integrity of the arch. It is like the, Taylor's pole, which is considered the keystone pole. Also, the presence of these stems that connect two stones to each other, it looks like this interosseous ligament in the ligaments of the foot. Also, presence of this type beam, which is increases the stability of this bridge, it looks like this plantar fascia, which act as a type beam. Also, it's the suspension bridges, which has a sling to maintain the stability of this bridge. It looks like the effect of the muscles action through the foot. This is pronius longus, which acts the same as a sling for this bridge. For each uh, arch, we have a keystone. In the medial longitudinal arch, we have the talus bone. In lateral longitudinal arch, we have the quiboid bone and in that uh, middle transverse arch is medial cuneiform bone. It's just safe and arrangement of the bone is enough for this inner stability. Sometimes may be enough, but in a lot of condition, it is not enough to maintain stability of this arch. So it may be destructive at any time. What about other factors that maintain stability of the arch? It comes from ligaments like spring ligament, interosseous ligament, plantar apneurosis, long and short plantar ligaments, or from the muscles. And these ligaments are interosseous ligament. What about the effect of age in the arches of the foot? The arches at pairs are not present. Between age of 11 months and 14 months, and uh, still the foot is flat. At the age of five years, the children approaches get parameters similar to those of adult, but is not completely mature. At age of six, seven years, become nearly adult shape, become mature and complete maturation at age of 10 or 11 years. Arches of the foot, the anatomy of the arches of the foot, I will not talk uh, more about this because my friend, Dr. Mahmoud Abu Zaid, he gave me a short notes of uh, the component of arches but we will shall talk about variables keeping the medial longitudinal arch and the lateral longitudinal arch and transverse arch. At first, variable keeping the medial longitudinal arch, 
I, uh, what is mean the factor maintaining this arch? Number one, pole, the shape of the pole. As we see in this bridge, the shape of the, uh, these blocks are wedge shape. Also, at the foot, each bone has a wedge shape like this. Also, presence of the keystone, as we said before, and the sustentaculum to lie with the partially support the head of the talus in the medial longitudinal arch. Also, presence of the ligament and aponeurosis, like spring ligament, interosseous ligament, and plantar aponeurosis, which act as a static splint for these arches. Also, the muscle tendon, like tibialis posterior and tibialis anterior, flexor halogens longus and pronius longus, and the abductor halogens, which act as a dynamic support for these arches. This muscle acts as a sling, as we talked before, like the tendon of the bialis posterior, which support uh, the head of the talus because it passes beneath uh, the spring ligament. Also, the tendon of the bialis anterior act as a sling, and uh, muscles act as a tie beam, like short muscles of the foot. And the muscles act like as a support, they like uh, flexor halus longus, which can support both calcaneus and the talus. Also, stress transmission through the arch, and my friend Dr. Mahmoud Abouzid talked a lot about this category. What about the lateral longitudinal arch? It is formed of four bones. Also, variable keeping this lateral longitudinal arch, it looks like medial longitudinal arch, either the shape of the bone and the arrangement of the bone. It looks like this Gothic arch. Also, presents in the long and short plantar ligament and the muscles and the tendon, which work as a type beam, like short muscle of the foot and the plantar roses and the transit muscles of the foot. What about the transverse arch? We have more than transverse arch. Uh, uh, number one, it's the anterior transverse arch, which is complete half circles. It's at the level of the head of the metatarsal, and both ends touch the floor. And uh, middle transverse arch is formed by three cuneiform and cuboid bone. And posterior transverse arch is formed mainly by navicular and cuboid. As we said before, the middle transverse arch, it is not incomplete. It touches the floor only in the cuboid bone, but both transverse arch from medial and uh, from right and left legs form a complete circle. Also variable keeping the transverse arch, like uh, the shape of the bone and the ligaments and the muscles, which act as a sling or type beam like Tibialis posterior and the bronias longus when to maintain the stability of the transverse arch. What is about the function of the arches of the foot? Number one, this uh, can preserve weight distribution through the post feet, either through anterior pillar or the posterior pillar. Number two, it serves as shock absorption, like this. Uh, shock absorber system present in the old car and the trains. We can see the foot, the arches of the foot act as a shock absorption mechanism. The medial longitudinal arch gave a propulsive force during locomotion. And the lateral longitudinal arch function as a stationary organ for support and weight transmission. The concavity of the transverse arch can maintain the, uh, the, uh, the neurovascular bundle beneath it. Also, inverter and the inverter help with the shifting weight distribution. What about the shape of the bone and difference between medial and the lateral longitudinal arch? When we see here the medial longitudinal arch, we can see have obtuse angle or acute angle, like this like is present in the Gothic arch. We can see this type of Gothic arch. We are not in need for bulky uh, support for this arch. As 
present in the medial longitudinal arch, the main support here lie over the subspeculum to lie, where the head of the talus lie for over this weak bone. So we not need in this uh, part to bulky bone. Like these types of this arch, is the cosic arch, it has acute angle, so we need uh, we are not in need for the bulky support, but in the round romantic arch, we need a bulky support. So in the foot, in the middle of the arch, we have obtuse angle or acute angle. So we not in need for bulky bony support in this area. So only the sacrum teroid is enough to support this arch. But in the medial longitudinal arch, it is around the arch. So we need a bulkier support like the body of the calcaneus. What about the mechanism of foot function? The foot function either as a thyroid and truss or a windless function or a human foot act as a spring. Number one, the function as a thyroid and the stomach. We can see this building, the stability of the ceiling depends on this uh, thyroid mechanism. Also, this system are present in the foot it's an anterior strut and the anterior strut and are connected by the thyroid, which is represented by plantar fascia. Also, what about the windlass function? This is the old Spanish windlass to approximate this bulk of wood. We can twist this rope to narrow the space between this bulk of the foot to each bulk of the foot are approximated to each other. But in this system of windlass mechanism, we can traction of this part of the rope to approximate the bulk of food to each other. This accuracy occurs in the food. If we can see the food, we have this anterior bulk and the posterior bulk of the bone. And by traction of this rope through dorsiflexion of the big two, we can approximate of this strut anterior and the anterior and the posterior and increase the height of the arches of the food. We can see the foot when there is a dorsiflexion of the big two, we can see approximation between anterior and posterior pillar of the foot. This windless mechanism doesn't depend about the presence of foot in active or passive motion on weight pairing or non weight pairing motion. What about if there is a tightness in plantar apneurosis? It is become is a motion about the first tars metatarsal uh, motion become stiff and we can, do, uh, we can see injury of the capsule of this joint. Also tightness of this plantar fascia prevent line of gravity to move anterior to the toes during uh, walking. So normally the line of gravity lies posterior to the axis which about through the tars, uh, first uh, mid tarsal joint. And in the second uh, rocker, uh, line of gravity are moved anteriorly. And in third rocker, the line of gravity move more anteriorly near the tars metatarsal uh, pharyngeal joint. Also, the stiffness or tightness of plantar aponeurosis uh, assist the active tooth flexor muscle structure to press the tooth into the ground and support the body work on its limited base of support. What about the disorder of windless mechanism? What about is the presence of a uh, tightness of tendo Achilles? Normally during motion and windless, uh, windless mechanism, but in early stage of tightness of contraction of the tendo Achilles, there is a quinous position to the windless mechanism become less effective. And later stage of the endo Achilles contraction, uh, the mid foot break will occur. And in the presence of hyalux rigidus, normally during propulsion of the mood is complete movement and elevation of the heel from the ground. In hyalux limitus, only slight elevation of the heel from the ground. But in the presence of the hyalux rigidus, there is no propulsion at all during motion. So we can treat this condition either by elevation the big two by a bed to uh, facilitate this motion 
or by doing arthrodesis of the joint or arthroplasty. What about the wind glass mechanism in case of amputation of the big two like this case? We can reconstruct uh, wind glass mechanism through connection between the flexor uh, halogen longus tendon and the extensor halogen longus tendon together to pass it through a groove in the head of the ferrous metatarsal. So during the contraction of the extensor halogen longus, and we can uh, track the flexor halogen longus, longus tendon and restore the function of wind glass mechanism. And we can pass the tendon either through a groove in the head of the metatarsal or through the window through the head of the first metatarsal bone. And the human foot acts like a spring through uh, during with tearing and uh, the thigh is stressed act by done by plantar apneurosis. So it is can do a shock absorption during walking. What about the pathogenesis of arch disorder? This is normal arch. If the arch, uh, heart, uh, height of the arch is increased, it's called a cavus deformity. And if the arch is disappeared, it's called flat foot or flat arch. In case of best cavus, it is the normal distribution of the bone in the lateral view. The bronius longus, which acts as a sling, was beneath the cuboid bone, he inserted in the first base of the first metatarsal and uh, first uniform and act as a sling. With contraction of this muscle, it can elevate the cuboid bone and increase the height of the arch of the foot because it acts as a sling, like this movement. With contraction, elevate the arch of the foot and increase the height of the arch and doing this cavus. So the pronius longus muscle raise the cuboid bone and increase the height of the arch. On the other hand, the is anterior muscles. It inserted directly in the dorsum of the first metatarsal, base of the first metatarsal and uniform bone. So with contraction, it uh, through the action, through the center of rotation, it can drop this first ray of the foot and decrease the height of arches. So to be honest, anterior, dorsiflex first ray and below the arches of the foot. When the both of muscle act together, the bronius longus and to be honest, anterior, if there is equilibrium between each other, the foot work will and both. But if the bronius longus overact the bialis anterior, so they need to best give us deformity. What about the tibialis posterior? It raises the navicular bone to increase the height of the arch and lead to this cavus. Bronius previous, on the other hand, inserted in the base of the fifth metatarsal and it can dorsiflex first ray and as a fifth ray and decrease the height of the arches of the foot. When both of muscle tibialis posterior and the bronius previous act together, if the tibialis posterior overact or overpowers the bronius long previous muscle, it leads to basically vas deformity. The proposed muscle agonist antagonist mechanism of biscavus formation in cavovarous food, the tibialis posterior and the bronius longus are too strong. They overpower the tibialis anterior. It pulls the forefoot downward, lead to cavus deformity, and pulls the hand foot inward, lead to varus deformity. How can correct this deformity? In case of bronius longus overpower tibialis posterior, we can do transfer of pronius longus tendon to the pronius previous insertion through this approach. In case of tibialis anterior overactive pronius previous, we can do transfer of the tibialis posterior tendon to the dorsum of the foot to restore active dorsal flexion of the foot. In case of uh, tibialis anterior overpower, we can transfer half or all of the tibialis tendon to the proboid or lateral uniform bone. If this, tendon transfer cannot overcome the cavus deformity, we can do bony operation like dewar calcaneal osteotomy or metatarsal osteotomy. 
What about the flat feed deformity? The proposed muscle agonist antagonist mechanism of his planus formation, the tibialis posterior muscle act as a sling and it is can preserve the height of the arch, uh, longitudinal arch of the foot. In case of dysfunction of the tibialis posterior, lead to flat feet or base planus deformed like this photo. Also, injuries or weakness of spring ligament, which can support the head of the head of the talus, can lead to uh, dropping of the arches of the foot, as is injury of spring ligament. Also, in case of congenital ligament, the laxity act as injury of the spring ligament, which can lead to flat foot uh, feet deformity. So, in case of uh, ligament laxity, we can find most of the babies have a flat foot deformity. This condition occurs also with the cerebral palsy and the arterial poses and the muscle dystrophy and the spina bifida. There is muscle imbalance and the liver arm dysfunction. All of this can lead to deformities of the uh, foot. We can lead to bisplanus deformity. Also, any condition affects the stability or the structure of the bone can lead to a flat feet deformity like neuropathic problem in case of diabetic foot. Destruction of the bone leads to flat feet deformity. In case of drop, the keystone in arches can lead to destruction of the stability of the arches, like this photo, can occur with a fracture of the talus and neck of the talus. Also, this fracture lead to flattening of the arches of the foot. Also, in case of tersal coalition, lead to bisplanus deformity. And finally, to take a home message, there is a lot of variable keeping the foot arches integrity, like bones, ligament, aponeurosis, muscles, and tendon. All of these components preserve the integrity of the arches beside the normal shape of the bone. We have any deviation from normal arches, increase height arch lead to bisquivus and decrease height arch to lead to bisplanus deformity. And finally, thank you. Shukran gazeelan, says Dr. Mohamed Laklouk. Thank you so much, Professor Mohamed Laklouk from Minya University. Uh, Dr. Mohamed, you make it very easy to understand the arches of the food and the factors contributing to it, its function. شكراً جزيلاً أستاذنا الفاضل. العفو يا فندم، إن شاء الله تكون يعني الأمور وصلت بسيطة هي محاضرة كبيرة بس أنا قدرت حاولت أبسطها في تلت ساعة زي ما حضرتك طلبت مني يعني. ربنا يخليك يا فندم، وجود حضرتك أوه. شرف معانا يا دكتور يا فندم ده شرف لينا التواجد مع حضراتكم في في المحفل العلمي ده. تسلم يا أستاذنا. أور نيكست سبيكر أخي الحبيب العزيز أستاذ دكتور أحمد علام uh, رئيس قسم العظام بجامعة بنها هيد أوف أورثوبيديك ديبارتمنت بنها فاكولتي أوف ميديسن. Uh, Professor Ahmad Alam will speak about many invasive techniques in the management of pylon fractures. Professor Ahmad. Fadali Fan. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. First of all, I would thank you, Professor Muhammad, for this kind invitation. It's an honor to me to be with you today. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, you have my screen shared now? Zahra, Dr. Ahmad, Okay. Uh, after Professor Laclouk and a lot of uh, architecture and engineering, we will go back to a little talk about minimally invasive surgery in pillion fracture fixation. Generally speaking, the main concept which must be always kept in mind and distressed on during any surgical procedure is that the soft tissue envelope and the biological environment of the fracture must be always respected. This is very important to decrease early and late post-operative complications. This should be always aimed. To do this, I think the slides must be uh, I make a turn in my slide now. Uh, I will stop sharing and do it again. Okay. This is a presentation. This is sharing. Okay. Okay. This is the next one. Okay. I will go back. I will do another thing. Sometimes these are technical errors. Mm. 
another sharing without can we go like this without uh, making it in the play one moment ايوه تمام تمام كده okay. تمام فاضل اوكي فاضل اوكي سو تو ديكريز ايرلي اند ليت بوسيبلتي اوف كومبليكيشن ذا سوفت تيشو انفلوب شود بي اولويز ريسبكتد تو دو ذيس وي هاف جنرال رولز فور اني ارتيكولار فراكشر ات از ذا تايمينج اوف اوبريشن فيرست بيكوز ايرلي انترفينشن از ماتش از بوسيبل ماست بي اولويز ايم تو افويد سيرجري ان ذا بريزنس اوف ماسيف سوفت تيشو اديما بيكوز اوبريشن بيرفورمد ان ذا بريزنس اوف سيفير انترا ديرمال اديما or fracture blisters may increase the risk of bone tension leading to sloughing of skin, tissue necrosis with subsequent infection and effect on the final results. Second point of interest is decreasing further soft tissue trauma and manipulations by limited surgical approaches or what we call mini incisions, minimal dissection and soft tissue stripping and minimal implants used enough to give stable, not essentially rigid internal fixation. And generally, we should do early mobilization and the early weight bearing as conditions allowed. To do this, we have a lot of techniques. Generally speaking, for non-articular fractures, the minimally invasive percutaneous plating is one of these methods. Closed nailing, external fixation are used for external of articular, non-articular fractures as minimally invasive methods. And for large joint fractures, whatever the joint is, we can do always do minimally invasive fixation by minimal incisions and minimal implants. This is why, because we have a lot of management controversy in certain fractures. This fracture as, as an example, this is Thompson Epstein 5, Pipkin 4. This is hip fracture dislocation. A little controversy is present here. You should fix the establum, you should fix the head, usually with screws or a blade, and no much controversy is present in such cases. But in commuted interarticular fractures of the TPL plafond, TPL plateau, distal femur, distal end radius, distal humerus, they are one or most challenging orthopedic fractures, and the optimum treatment of these fractures is always controversial, ranging from one stage, two stage fixation, uh, initial fixation and late arthroscopic assisted fixation, ligamento taxis use, and a lot of controversy remains present always. That is because of the complications always gained after these major fractures. Regarding the pelvic fractures, Rudy and Algewar and Brad also, uh, these are persons having the most large series in pillion fractures in history, more than 7,000 fractures, and reported that they developed within one to two years cases of osteoarthritis. In broad series, it is 94% post-traumatic osteoarthritis, ranging from mild, moderate to severe, affecting nearly all patients having type two or three fractures in all their series. So, Post-traumatic arthrosis can occur as a result of the damage of the articular cartilage at the time of the in injury initially, and also the dissection and periosteal stripping needed for fracture reduction and fixation can also aid in this by jeopardizing the vascularity of these fragments, leading to delayed union and non-union rates with higher reoperation rates later. So several investigators return it back to the old principle of check, which he proposed in 1865 at the summit of the era of the EO fixation. He proposed that we should do limited open reduction and minimal soft tissue stripping and minimal fixation for articular fractures. But at that time, this was not accepted. So we have a little tips that in the literature, the most notable evolution in the management of particular fractures is increasing early motion, reasonable stabilization, but essentially rigid, and gaining active motion as early as possible according to pain and swelling allowance. Similarly, 
when stable not essential rigid internal fixation has been achieved early weight bearing has not resulted in either late displacement of the fracture or delayed healing as advocated by many authors these banahan university hospitals where we work in egypt uh, professor ashab is uh, in command now for the reconstruction of the new hospitals. So again, we have basic rules, early intervention, limited approaches, minimal dissection, minimal soft tissue stripping, minimal implants, enough to give stable fixation, early mobilization, and the early weight bearing. For this TPL pillion fracture, and the general background, the name pillion comes from the French word pistol or rame. Interarticular fractures with distal tibial plafond are called pillion fractures, which are a combination of ankle and distal tibial metaphysial fractures, usually with interarticular comminution. They are considered among the most challenging orthopedic problems. More than 20% of them are open, and the optimum treatment of these fractures remain controversial, as we told before. We have a lot of classifications. One of the oldest and preferred by many surgeons like me is that of Rodé and Alguar, which is type one, which has a T-shaped undisplaced fracture of the distal end of the tibia extending into the joint. Type two, the same as type one with displacement. Type three, which is a complex interarticular multifragmentary fracture. Ovetia and Beals added another two types Type four, which has metaphysial extension, and type five, the most severe having the diaphysial extension. This adds to the more comminution, which is a characteristic of many of these high energy fractures. When we review the management in the 60s and 70s, the traditional management for these fractures was non operative because a lot of complication they met. However, the results were always not satisfactory, especially loss of motion and non-union. This opinion was replaced later by the principle of the AO having open reduction and rigid internal fixation, but early post-operative problems were marked, including skin necrosis, superficial deep infection, loss of fixation and amputation. Late complications included delayed union, non-union of the metaphysial, diaphysial junction, various or vulgar smell union and non-anatomical reduction or post-operative philosophy reduction of the articular surface. External fixation and limited internal fixation gained some popularity in the late 80s to abolish this high complication rate. They have recorded complication rates with variable incidence. However, the optimum treatment of this type of fracture is still controversial. So, we propose to having a limited open reduction, minimal internal fixation by doing multiple small separate incisions directly positioned over the displaced main fragments along the anterolateral tibial classic approach according to the fracture main fragments morphology. Sometimes we can achieve reduction through the open wound itself. Manipulation and reduction are done under X-ray facility or CR facility. Only interfragmentary screws and K wires were used, fixing the major fracture fragments with the K wires provisionally and the application of cannulated screws over them or beside them. If we have a little bone stock. For the fibula, small leg screws or K wire or intermodal rush pin was always enough. When the fibular fracture was not commuted, is what it was reduced and fixed first to aid in reduction and length. Otherwise, fibular fractures were managed after tibial fixation. In some cases, femoral distract distractor was used and notitious cancellous bone grafting was done in a lot of cases to fill voids. As an example, this patient, 26 years old, was type five of Adi and Beals. We saw here the comminution, metaphysial, and diaphysial extension. The CT shows us how much comminution we have here at the left of the joint and how much extension up to the mid diaphysis of the tibia. This is a principle we told you about. 
This is minimal internal fixation for the major fragments. This is six weeks post-operative, and this is 16 weeks post-operative, and this is on the right, the patients to off and the heel push at that time. Another case also type five with metaphysial and diaphysial extension. And this is the final result after 14 weeks with nice joint congruity and healing with the fracture. This principle was applied and physical therapy was done early, two to three weeks post operatively, and the weight bearing was allowed partially from three to five weeks, starting with two touch and the progressively increasing according to progress of callus formation. This was conducted at our unit years ago till now. Uh, generally, these are the results encountered. To conclude, excellent results were obtained in about 39% of cases, good results in 39, fair in 16, and poor in about 6% of cases. And this is was relatively comparable or slightly better than most of other techniques. Complications we encountered, mainly delayed union in 16% superficial minor infection in 16% also, and reoperation rate was about 6%. To conclude, limited open reduction and the minimal fixation, stable fixation, not essentially rigid, is usually satisfactory in most displaced balloon fractures and is associated with reduction in healing time and complications and reoperation rate. As you know, I work in bone listening. These are some examples of bone lengthening we do. My cat, my car, one of my patients. Thank you very much for your attention. For this very interesting talk. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, we have one question from uh, one of our colleagues. Uh, yeah. Do you support these screws with cast post operatively? We use only slab, usually for two to three weeks post operatively. As we have callus starting to appear in X-ray from three weeks, we discard it and we start tip to uh, walking for two weeks maximum, then increase with bearing gradually according to the degree of cognition and degree of progress of callus formation. Just the racket slab is enough usually with non-weight bearing for two to three weeks. Shukran, Gazeera. Thank you so much, Professor Ahmed. I remember, as you know, the audience, that we أساتذة الأفاضل من الـ الـ Egyptian speakers will continue عندنا لسه أربعة speakers من مصر وبعدين هنبدأ الـ speakers من إنجلترا بأستاذنا الكبير أستاذ دكتور وجيه موسى وبعدين هيبدأ الجانب الكندي we have six speakers from McMaster University now it's seven speakers from McMaster University بس عشان فروق التوقيت هما كلهم هنبدأ من عشرة ل 12 بالليل محاضرات الـ, الـ professors الكنديين uh, we have another question, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, high energy trauma is indication for external fixator in pylon fractures. What do you recommend? Yes, this is right. This technique or any other technique is just a way of thinking. According to the patient, you should tailor your management according to your soft tissue injury, according to your degree of comminution. Sometimes you can't reduce unless you do an external fixator and do distraction and ligament to taxes. So each case should has its own way of management. This is just a way of thinking. If it is right and give you a good result, you can continue. Not giving you the end result, you should shift to another way of thinking or management. So sometimes, of course, you can need, you can augment this fixation with an fixator. You, you feel when you release tra traction that the fragments can collapse. So this construct is not stable enough. You can put an external fixator for a few weeks and then remove it. This is not a problem. Uh, and then uh, another two questions, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, how much is the length of the approach and how do you plan the site of the screws? The length of the approach, it is several approaches. The maximum of them is two to three centimeters, just enough to visualize the ends of the fracture fragments and push it manually to be aligned with your eyes and under CR. So you, when you just push it, have 
good reduction. This is enough for each fracture line or each major fragment. And this is planned under CRM control, of course. So there is no full length approach or no complete approach. There's several stab wounds distributed around the tibia along the major fracture fragments. So each screw may have each stab wound for itself. Yes, sir. Uh, we have another two or three questions. How soon after injury do you operate uh, these factors bearing in mind swelling after injury? If I received the patient early in the first few hours, I operate immediately. Yes. If I have him late with much swelling, we should conserve for a few days with elevation and the usual me measures of anti-edema till you have reasonable swelling subsidence and you start. And because you are not aiming to doing a big approach, we can do in the business of a moderate edema. We are not making a big approach and have a problem of skin tension. Yes. Uh, another question, sir. Could we achieve a stable anatomical fixation for pylon fractures by minimal invasive techniques? Usually it is stable enough here if you put the screws in the right place and in the right number and protect the patient for the initial period, which is usually maximally three weeks, this is enough to be stable. We're not talking about rigid. This is cancellous area. You must have to be, make it stable enough. Yes. Can we apply these screws, sir, in open fractures? Yeah, we do it. More than 20% yes. of cases are open. Dr. Ahmed, we have also a question for you. Please, I'm going to ask you. Under you. How much are you? How you assess the quality of articular reduction, sir? You assess it clinically and operatively by the ankle position and range of motion and by CR or X-ray control, of course. Is, this is enough. Yes. Do you apply uh, screws with washers or without washers, sir? Usually we don't do compression. We just need little pressure for the fragments to be pushed in place. So usually we don't use washers. Yes. وطبعا لأهمية الموضوع اللي حضرتك بتتكلم فيها دكتور أحمد هي الأسئلة كتير قوي معلش يعني لو الوقت يسمح تحت امرك اه احنا عندنا لسه another uh, two questions we have two minutes قبل ما دكتور احمد رامي يبتدي uh, how much step off could be allowed in the ankle you should not have any step off except you have bone loss you have some fragments of the articular cartilage which is lost with with, uh, with its uh, underlying bone but you shouldn't accept any step off the ankle is like the elbow doesn't accept the step off, not, not like the knee. We don't accept the step off in the ankle, but you are, if you have bone loss or avoid, you can't replace it. You can do only grafting beneath it to support the underlying or the subchondral area. Yes. آخر سؤال دكتور أحمد عشان نبدأ ال 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 talk next talk عشان الجانب الكندي لازم يبدأ الساعة عشرة. In all cases, do you fix the fibula first? Uh, as I told you. If the fibular fracture is a stable one, transverse or short oblique, we start with it first to aid in alignment and length. If it is comminuted or have bone loss, we make it last to construct the joint first. And even if you have fibular shortening, it is not a problem. The most important is the articular congruity for the distal tibia. Yes. Shukran gazilan, Dr. Ahmed, tabnak bil asila, bis al mawdoh shayyuk, very interesting. Thank you so much, sir. I hope I was uh, helpful for you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Professor Ahmad Rami from Helwan University. Dr. Ahmad Rami will speak about a very interesting topic, which is the stress fractures of the food. Dr. Ahmad. Dr. Ahmad. ربنا يخليك يا بيبي متشكر جدا لحضرتك. اولا طبعا يعني انا سعيد بتواجدي مع حضراتكم واساتذتي دكتور جمال حسني دكتور محمد الاشرف دكتور احمد علام وبيتي الاول يعني ومع زميلي الفضل دكتور شرف لنا وجودك معانا دكتور احمد شرف لي يا فندم شكرا جزيلا لحضرتك. نبدا الشريط كريم دلوقتي.
اعطاها كده الشاشه ظهرت يا فندم هي بتز... ظهرت كده يا عبد الرحمن اتفضل يا فندم تمام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في البدايه كده نحب نبص على الاكس راي ديت دي زي ما احنا شايفين بلان اكس راي لفوت فور بيشنت 35 years old male patients uh, a military uh, person uh, he was presented uh, for a junior doctor in the NE and he was complaining of uh, sudden uh, onset pain for around one year uh, one week and this is, was the x-ray at the time of the presentation and uh, because uh, the junior doctor didn't recognize any abnormality in the x-ray he has uh, uh, released him with medical treatment uh, the patient uh, presented again after five weeks with this x-ray and as we can see here there is a sound healing and sound union at the uh, mid shaft of the second interstitial bone and this is actually the, the uh, uh, classic scenario of the stress fractures. By the end of this uh, uh, talk, we will be able to list the common stress fractures in the foot and the ankle and to identify the risk factors of stress fractures and to outline the methods of treatment for each one, especially the high risk uh, stress fractures of the foot and the ankle. First of all, we need to ask ourselves why, why this happened. As we can see at the first presentation, the X-ray was free, but after around four or five weeks, this was the uh, uh, end result uh, in this X-ray. Stress fracture, by definition, it is a maximal repetitive loading on non-pathological bone associated with imbalance between bone resorption and bone formation. This imbalance leads to microfracture, which ends with macrofracture as we have seen. Who are exposed or more susceptible to the stress fractures? As we can see the females with what we call female athletic triad who are uh, 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 suspected or exposed to high uh, stresses and the dietary strains uh, and uh, low bone quality. And also the athletes and the military population who are uh, exposed to sudden increase uh, in the intensity of the activity or the exercise, especially with using of uh, uh, um, non-professional uh, shoes, like uh, rigid shoes, and using uh, uh, not well-equipped ground. The epidemiology of the stress fractures shows that it represents about 1% of the general population and 15% of, of the runners. And in the military population, it represents 3% of females and 9.2% of the females. This uh, classification is important because it will guide us for the treatment of the uh, stress fractures. As we can see, there is a group of high-risk stress fractures and another group of low-risk fractures. The high-risk group includes the navicular, fifth metatarsal bone, median malleolus, talus, and sesamoid bone. The low-risk group includes the calcaneus, cuboid, cuneiform, and lateral malleolus. And because of the high-risk group is more important, we will concentrate on this group in this talk. How could we diagnose and pick up these patients? Usually the patient is presented with history of insidious onset pain of the foot with no history of clear trauma. The patient usually has uh, localized tenderness with erythema and edema and pain for range of motion. And actually the key of the uh, diagnosis is high suspicion. We have to have high suspicion index to pick up such a patient. The imaging, as we have seen, this is a plain X-ray we have shown in the uh, beginning of our presentation, and it has uh, uh, no uh, clear fracture, but after four or five weeks, we can see here callus. And this is normal. This X-ray is normal during uh, the first three weeks. We will not recognize any uh, signs of fracture or healing. After the three weeks, we can see uh, in the beginning line uh, 
uh, leucine line of the fracture and some periosteal reaction. And later on, as you can see here, we can so we can see uh, clear uh, signs of callus formation. And because the X-ray is not uh, a good tool for diagnosis in the early stage of the disease, we can we have to find another uh, imaging tools like the bone scan. The bone scan is a good tool for picking uh, uh, such uh, injuries uh, early, and it's uh, highly sensitive, about 74 to 100 percent. But it's not specific. We can uh, uh, we can it can misdiagnose with uh, like uh, uh, bone infection or foot infection. But the MRI is highly sensitive and highly specific. As we can see here, this is a fracture line of the uh, Taylor body. And earlier, we can see this high uh, uh, signal around the shaft of the metatarsal bone and the high signal here uh, in the middle of the second metatarsal bone. And this is could uh, be seen uh, during the first week of the uh, fracture. The CT is important. A tool for uh, confirmation and getting more information about the uh, fracture, not for uh, diagnosis. We can uh, see the line, the, the fracture line, demarcation, and the comminution and the sclerosis, if uh, any. That means the treatment depends on the type of the fracture. As we have seen before, we have two groups: the low risk fracture and the high risk fracture. The low risk fracture usually are treated was uh, conservative treatment by period of immobilization and rest until the patient is asymptomatic. And this is usually around six to eight uh, weeks. And the high-risk fractures, also we can start with conservative treatment with non-bearing cost immobilization. However, we can shift to the surg uh, surgical intervention in case of failed conservative treatment. And we can also start with surgical intervention from the beginning in case of displaced fractures or high demand athlete patients or with delayed diagnosis or late presentation of the patient. Some fractures have special consideration and most of them are the high risk group. The first one is the navicular bone. The navicular stress fractures represent about 15 to 32% of track athletes. And this is explained by the watershed theory. As we can see, this is uh, 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 the navicular bone with the uh, blood supply distribution of the bone itself. And the middle zone is known as the watershed region because it has less blood supply between the blood supply on the outer part from the coronal artery and the other part from the posterior table artery and this middle zone is kept with the least blood supply. And unfortunately, this, little, this middle zone is also suspected to maximal shear stresses caused by the compression forces by the first metatarsal in this area and the second metatarsal in this area and on the other side by the body weight transmitted through the talus. So this zone is exposed to high stresses with less blood supply and this make it prone, this make it prone for uh, stress fractures. Saxena and his colleagues has a very uh, nice classification for the navicular stress fractures. In this study, they have uh, uh, done this classification. Uh, it's a CT-based one on uh, 57 patients. And he has, uh, and they have classified it into uh, three types. The, th the first type, shows only, only dorsal cortical break. The type two shows also the dorsal cortical break, which propagates to the body of the navicular, while the type three, the fracture line penetrates another cortex. It's a complete uh, uh, fracture connecting between two cortices. Type one, the simplest one, is treated with non bearing cast immobilization for six to eight, to eight weeks, while type two and type three are treated with open reduction and internal fixation. The another uh, high risk fracture with a special consideration is the talus. Actually, it's not uncommon, but it's easily missed. It's usually affecting uh, the head while the body is 
less common. Uh, fortunately, the conservative treatment with non-weight bearing cast is usually sufficient and successful treatment, but if picked early and it, if it's not missed. The next high risk fracture with special consideration is the median malleolus. Actually, it's a rare one, but with high risk of non-union and untrue medial impingement. That's why we have mentioned in the beginning that the high suspicion index is the key for the diagnosis because losing uh, or missing the diagnosis will end with serious complications as we can see. The sesamoid bone also is a high risk one and the non-union is common with uh, conservative treatment. That's why the surgical intervention uh, uh, provides a very good option for the treatment, especially with sesamoidectomy because the internal fixation uh, uh, don't provide uh, rapid return to sports while the sesamoidectomy does. It allows more rapid return to sports and uh, better rehabilitation. The last uh, fracture with uh, uh, high risk is the fifth metatarsal bone. And as we can see here, the Torg and his colleagues has classified the uh, fifth metatarsal stress fracture into three types. Type one, according to the uh, X-ray findings, is characterized by sharp margins with no fracture, line widening, sclerosis, or periosteal reaction. Type two, the fracture will show line, fracture line widening, sclerosis, and or periosteal reaction, while type three shows gross fracture widening and sclerosis. Type one is usually treated conservative, type two and type three are usually treated by surgical intervention. Our take, our home message today is the stress fracture are common in running and jumping athletes. Bone scan and MRI are sensitive in evaluating athletes with suspected stress fractures. Relative risk and the gradual return to play are successful in treating most low risk stress fractures, while high risk stress fractures often require operative treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmad Rami, for this very interesting talk. طبعا احنا يسعدنا ويشرفنا ان احنا نرحب باستاذنا العزيز والعلامه المميزه لجراحه الفوت اند انكل في مصر والعالم العربي كله، استاذ دكتور هاني بي موافي، طبعا يعني شرف لنا ان حضرتك معانا دكتور هاني. دكتور هاني حضرتك ميوتد. انا متشكر على الدعوه الظريفه اللي انت احنا اللي متشكرين على قبول الدعوه الكريمه يا دكتور هاني بيه بجد يعني يعني تشريف حضرتك معانا ده شرف لنا يا فندم الظريف اللي انت بتقوله متشكرين جدا يا العفو يا استاذ العفو يا فندم الله يخليك دكتور محمود ابو زيد اف يو هاف اني كويستشنز تو دكتور احمد رامي Okay, I think we, we, we do not have questions. شكرا جزيلا دكتور احمد بيه، شاكرين يا فندم. احمد عفوا يا فندم شكرا جزيلا. احنا هنبروسيد على طول لاستاذنا الكبير دكتور هاني بيه موافي، اعتقد حضرتك معانا في 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 فرنسا دلوقتي ولا ما سافرتش يا فندم؟ لا انا في فرنسا والله. معلش احنا اسفين ان احنا قطعنا يعني ال ال يعني قطعنا اليوم بتاع حضرتك هناك يا دكتور هاني بيه ربنا يجزيك خير. ربنا يخليك. طبعا شرف لنا ان حضرتك معانا يا فندم. الله يخليك. اوكي. دكتور هاني طبعا يعني يعني هيكلمنا بخبرته العاليه قوي 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 على فيري انتريستنج توك ويتش از ذا كارنت كونسبت ان ديلينج ويز كومبلكس فود ديفورمتيز شاكرين على ان حضرتك معانا دكتور هاني بي الله يخليك يا حبيبي شكرا يا فندم هو كده المفروض ان انا كده ال اوكي كده هي 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 لسه لسه ما ظهرتش يا فندم يعني هي لسه ما اشتغلتش معانا كده اشتغلت ولا ما فيش؟ لا لسه اوكي ارجع تاني ستوب شير اهي اوكي
سوري يا احمد محمد لا لا يا فندم تيك يور تايم يا فندم العط اوكي كده المفروض في باين كده المفروض تكون آه. باينت هي هي باينت بس لسه ما اشتغلتش الفول يعني البرزنتيشن نفسها يا فندم اوكي انا فتحتها كده لا لسه ما فتح يعني لسه ما فتحتش السلايدز نفسها يا فندم اوكي اوكي كده اه كده كده فتحت يا فندم فول سكرين سير بليز اوكي اتفضل يا فندم شكرا يا فندم uh... Uh, first, I would, like to, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mohamed Lashad for this invitation and also for, for this presentation. Uh, uh, I'm going to speaking about the current concept dealing with complex deformity. But before we speaking about uh, the, this concept, we have an, uh, well, we have to define what is a complex food deformity, which is a multiple uh, multiplanar deformities. With, with combination of true bony deformities and joint contracture. So, uh, what is the goal of the uh, of the the treatment or management of complex foot deformity? Actually, I would like to to say that to get straight, you must have a destination. <clears throat> so. Firstly, before I speaking about uh, the goal, I would like to speak about some research which defines the goal. And this is uh, one of the research in uh, 2018, uh, published in 2018, said that uh, although the complication rates were high, but the majority of goals were met. So there is a mini complication, but the goal is met. And also there is a, a mini researches uh, published in 2006. First is the, the first one in Foot and Ankle International, which concluded that laser of extensor, external fixators allow simultaneous correction of all severe deformities, foot deformity. However, in Pediatric Orthopedic Journal, is a paper published in Pediatric Orthopedic Journal in 2006 also, said that uh, the results is poor outcome associated with the recurrent deformity, which requiring revision surgery treated with Elizabeth. And also the another, another uh, uh, paper published in 2006 also in Pediatric Orthopedic Journal said that the function results were better in this patient in spite of poor surgical outcome. All of them said that surgical outcome is very bad, and one of them says that the, uh, there is an uh, allow simultaneous correction for all severe foot deformities. And another paper published in 2018 about the treatment of complex foot, uh, complex foot deformity said that deformity recurrence can be observed in some cases and the treatment remain challenging and said that distraction of stigmatism should be reserved as a salvage solution for management of complex for deformity so what is the goal yes. our goal is painless plant grade and functional and cosmetically accepted so if we are going to this, uh, uh, these cases, is a lady about uh, 28 years old, type 1 diabetes, sustained a road tra uh, a traffic accident, RTA since about two, two, uh, 2001. And this patient suffered now, suffered from uh, uh, complex foot deformities and also shortening of the left, uh, of left leg. And this is an X-ray showing that shortening and how the, uh, the deformity is. And this patient is referred from uh, diabetic foot clinic in uh, internal medicine. And so we did a lengthening of the tibia and also correction of the foot. 
and the patient is, uh, however, there is an, some uh, uh, still very deformed, but the patient is satisfied about his uh, uh, food and she, she was happy. So uh, we did an, what's called Berg peanut osteotomy because the skin is very bad. And uh, uh, I published this, uh, this, uh, this paper in 2004. And this is my conclusion. Complex food deformity of any cause can be treated by percutaneous calcaneal V osteotomy with laser of with correction. So I, I, uh, I said that any cause of deformity, but nowadays I couldn't say that any cause of deformity because the deformity has a, a, is an important in uh, the cause of or the etiology of the deformity as important for planning of the uh, management of complex for deformity. So after four years, the patient came with deformity, uh, recurrent deformity, and also an ulcer. So I decided that, and I uh, decided for, for, uh, for diabetic uh, foot clinic, uh, I said to my colleagues that this patient needs amputation. But the patient refused completely amputation, and she said that, okay, I'm agree about amputation, but you have to try first, and then I will see. So, painless, plant grade, functional, and cosmetically accepted, but the problem is there is an recurrence. So how to decrease the recurrence? So, uh, firstly, the, I addressed many uh, many uh, statement about the main cause of deformity, which is very important, and the patient age is also important. How was operation were done, and the bone morphology of the foot, degree of stiffness of the foot. So, if we said that the, the morphology of the bone here, it is an osteoporotic bone, and also there is many stiff stiffness of the foot. So, I need a stable foot. It means. To, 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 and also, I would like to make an arthrogis for all joints with, with this patient to prevent any recurrent, especially at the lateral aspect. So, I, I do an Elizarov, but uh, actually, I did what is um, and reverse it, not this direction. I, I make compression, not this direction. So, and correct the deformity by compression, not with, uh, uh, not distraction and also i i crushed all joints i know this is by this compression and to get stability and <clears throat> after that the patient is completely uh, uh, corrected and the patient here i think it is good good result for this and this is the patient after 10 years follow-up which is it's a blunt grade without any recurrence for the deformity. So in, 2000, uh, in 2009, I published what is functional salvage of residual and recurrent deformities. And also I said, uh, said that we found that recurrence depends on many factors, such as bone morphology and also number previous operation and degree of stiffness. And so, this patient has a chronic osteomyelitis and the, in the fifth metatarsal. And when in, uh, general surgery uh, made a takeoff to the all fifth metatarsal. And so after one year, the patient had this deformity. And he came to me. And so I, uh, I uh, decided to correct it with Elizarov and also. I found that I have to, before uh, or after I finished from the correction, I have to do um, an uh, arthrogis to the calcaneo cuboid joint to prevent any recurrence. And the patient after, during the correction, and after correction, and I did a calcaneo cuboid fusion to prevent recurrence. So, after that, after about uh, seven years, the patient came to me with this, de uh, this deformities or an ulcer in metatarsalgia and also cloned toes. So 
it's actually it's a problem because here this is a recurrence, but how can I prevent the complications of uh, to doing the recurrence? So it is very important to know that. Okay, if I would like to do a painless plant grade function osmotic acceptance, I have addressed I have address the main cause deformity, the patient age, how many operation and the bone morphology and also the degree of stiffness of the foot. But if I would like to prevent recurrence or complications, so I have to do mechanical analysis for the deformity to prevent any recurrence. And also I have to maintain the mechanics of the tripod or, uh, or uh, plant grade foot with a little bit me mechanically accepted for the beadle construct. So, for example, for all this of deformities, so we can say that it is a multiplanar deformity with combination of bony deformity and joint contracture. And many of these deformities result from a combination of muscular, anatomical, and neurological dysfunction. So, and also we have to do an, or imaging studies by, for example, brain x ray. It beyond the lateral and also special views, is, which is very important. And also, we have to do a CT scan and, uh, and uh, uh, 3D and also uh, 3D for, for, uh, for the patients and also spectral, uh, spectral CT, CT scan. And we can also we do foot pressure. And uh, it's very important to know wh where is that. Uh, uh, pressure area there. For example, this is an os uh, distraction osteogenesis where the patient has a, an op uh, an previous operation, but actually the the configuration of the foot is um, or uh, the anatomy or there is no def uh, uh, pony deformities, and so we did an lazar correction with lazar and with also uh, when I can. Uh, uh, modified joints and all uh, and uh, lengthening of Achilles, all of them is very important to and we, we did also hyperextension to the uh, uh, medial column and patient after correction here and without any uh, recurrence. And this a patient has many also previous operations, but the problem is the deformities of the of the bone. We did a V osteotomy for this patient, and we corrected all component with during uh, through this osteotomy by uh, as as of a, as V osteotomy allows uh, allows uh, the foot can we can correct it all uh, all regions so or whatever forefoot hind foot. And also midfoot. And the patient after correction here. And this is another patient has an uh, about uh, 18 years old. And this, uh, 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 sorry, yeah, 18 years old. And this patient has uh, uh, sustained a uh, traffic accident with the skin grafts and uh, has uh, also by nation the various deformities. And so we did an uh, 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 clinic ray and also we did a scan scanogram and we, we see here there is a deformity. So we have to correct for, uh, uh, the foot and also correct the uh, tibia. And this is a patient and this is after correction. Another girl, this is a girl 18 years old and this patient has a uh, meningocele and some problems for this patient and uh, the right <coughs> the right foot uh, or is amputated because there is, uh, she, she had uh, deformities uh, she got uh, the foot deformities and did an operation and this operation has uh, severe infection and the patient amputated so after um, after five years the problems for this patient but actually she's scared from uh, from operation because she has a bad history about uh, infection and the fortress. So I, 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 I found that 
I have um, to do an operation with not multiple hardware. And also I'd like to, to make an uh, at least maneuver to, uh, to get a correction. So with the anticipation and how the patient is well, uh, is well. So, and this is an X-ray, and we show that the uh, how the tele is the tele couldn't go uh, 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 got into to the configuration of the uh, of the tele uh, or or to the ankle joint. So we did an colectomy here for the patient, and the patient after colectomy is correction very well, and also to the stable. <clears throat> and this is a patient pre, and how she uh, she uh, walk it is unstable, and she is happy with her food, and she can wear any shoes without problems to her. So we can conclude. Each cause of the uh, 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 each cases must be treated individually. And also, the open surgery or circular frame, both methods are considered in the treatment of uh, complex foot deformities. The appropriate technique must be as regard the foot deformity. <clears throat> so, if we said that the main cause of the deformity, the age of the patient, number of operation, quality of shape of bone, and configuration, uh, configuration of the joint, degree of stiffness, and the analysis of foot deformity, and also analysis of uh, foot deformity biomechanically is a cornerstone in treatment of complex foot deformity, decrease the instance of recurrence, and also to decrease the complications. So finally, I, I said that also complex foot deformity, I say management is usually has infinity. You couldn't say that, okay, this is our goal because it is actually, it is, and it's challenging the formative. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, our dear professor, Professor Hani Mwafi, Mansoura University, and one of the uh, keystones of foot and ankle surgery in Egypt and all over the world. Thank you so much, Professor Hani. Shukran gazilan, Ustazna al Fadil, and Malishi, and we have a lot of people who are in the city. Shukran, Mohammed. But I'm not going to be a doctor, Mohammed. And I'm not going to be a doctor, Mohammed. 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 ويعني نشوفكم على خير ان شاء الله ويا ريت نتمنى ان الدكتور اسهل بس يشرفنا في المؤتمر كده يا فندم ده شرف لنا يا فندم ده شرف لنا يا فندم ربنا يخليك يا فندم شاكرين جدا دكتور هاني بيه بشكركم لان انا ورايا الوقت عشاء فانا هستاذن من اي اتفضل يا فندم ربنا يخليك يا فندم اوكي سلام شكرا يا دكتور هاني بيه طبعا انا بيسعدني ان انا ارحب باخونا العزيز الحبيب استاذ دكتور محمد بيه مختار عن شمس يونيفرستي دكتور محمد يعني يعني وجود حضرتك معانا طبعا يعني اخذناك من وسط شغلك ومن وسط اجازتك احنا اسفين جدا يعني ده شرف لنا يا دكتور محمد بيه. يا فندم ربنا يخلي حياتك ده متشكر جدا على دعوه حضرتك. ده شرف لنا يا فندم. ويعني ومش بشكر دكتور هاني على محاضرته القيمه وبشكر حضرتك ودكتور محمود على تنظيم الايفنت الجميل ده. يا رب يعني المحاضره تكون مفيده ليكم ان شاء الله ويعني ترقى تو ميت يور اكسبكتيشنز ان شاء الله يا دكتور الله يخليك يا فندم طبعا استاذنا دكتور محمد بيه مختار هيتكلم على فيري انتريستنج توبيك فراكشرز اوف ذا تيلس فطبعا ده يعني حاجه يعني ديلي يوز زي ما بنقول كده شير سكرين واضح يا دكتور محمد آه لا هي لسه ما اشتغلتش المحاضره يا فندم هو لسه يا فندم لسه لسه المحاضره نفسها طيب ماشي تمام كده لا, لا لسه لسه برضه يا فندم ممكن حضرتك تخرج وتدخل تاني يا دكتور محمد بيه من ال من ال من الزوم من الزوم لا لا مش من الزوم لا, لا يعني من الشير سكرين سكرين وتعمل شير سكرين تاني فندم ستوب شير 
تمام اعمل شير ساعتك سكرين تاني كده فهم تمام تمام تفضل سعد تفضل يا تمام هي المحاضره اللي دكتور محمود ودكتور محمد كلفوني بيها عن الفراكشرز اندينز اوف ذا تيلس وده الحقيقه موضوع مهم جدا لان التيلس من الـ من البونز اللي لايبل للكومبليكيشنز والسالفج بروسيدورز بعد اللي بعد التيلر فراكشرز ما يبقاش دايما سهل دكتور محمد دكتور محمود ودكتور محمد يا فندم اتفضل يا فندم اتفضل يا فندم هو في كله في يعني في ناس نيتف انجلش سبيكر بس كله انجلش ولا عادي؟ في بعض الانجلش سبيكرز بس ممكن نضيف عربي في النص ما فيش مشكله هو حكي التارجت ان هو زمايلنا المصريين يعني بس هو في اجانب معانا طيب اوكي في من باكستان وفي من من العربي. كذا دوله وفي كنديين بعد كده لسه هيجوين تمام تمام So fractures and malunions of the talus are a very, impo are very important topic because uh, talus is an unforgiving bone and management of complications after talar fractures is not always easy. The problem is that not, not all talar fractures are like this. This is a very simple fracture talus. Any orthopedic surgeons can manage. Simple fracture neck talus. But Fracture dislocations are common. This is a case of fracture medial malleolus, ankle dislocation, and the comminuted fracture of the neck of the talus. This is an open fracture of the talus with comminuted talus and nearly extruded talar body. This is a, a, an uncommon fracture talus, which is a fracture head of the talus, so not a fracture neck of the talus, but a fracture of the head of the talus. Also, you can face a mismanaged talar fracture, like in this case, the fracture of the talus was not managed properly in the first operation. So all of these situations are, ch are challenging situations that you need to deal with. Also, you can, try, you can, be, you can face problems like this, post-traumatic talar deformity. So the objectives of this lecture is to evaluate cases of complex Taylor fractures, to plan for management of difficult and complicated cases of Taylor fractures, and to classify and plan for treatment of post-traumatic deformities of the talus. The talus is a very uh, unique bone uh, with seven articular facets, and 70% of the, of the surface of the talus is covered by articular cartilage. It articulates with the, with, the, with the ankle joint through three facets, the main tibiotalar facet superiorly, and with the medial malleolus as a comma, inverted comma-shaped facet, and at, uh, on the lateral side, an inverted triangular facet, and three facets for the subtalar joint, and the head anteriorly is articulating with the teronavicular joint. There is no single muscle attachment, but numerous ligaments are attached to the talus. And the blood supply is critical. The main blood supply is the artery of the Tarsan canal, which may be injured in fractures of the neck of the talus, leading to a vascular necrosis of the talar body. When we go to classification of Taylor fractures, it's not Hawking classification. This is a very important point. Hawking classification is classification of Taylor neck fractures. But Taylor fractures can be Taylor neck fractures, Taylor body fractures, Taylor head fractures, and lateral process fractures. This, this classification is important because many, especially lateral process fractures, gets missed and diagnosed as ankle sprain. So you, you have to know that not all Taylor fractures are Taylor neck fractures. There are other Taylor fractures. Using this classification, how to differentiate between Taylor neck fractures 
anterior body fractures. In this paper, we say that fractures anterior to the lateral process are considered Taylor neck fractures. Posterior to the lateral process are considered Taylor body fractures. Just to be a, a uniform classification that we all understand each other. Hawking classification is a classification of Taylor neck fractures, not Taylor fractures. And it's classified into non-displaced fractures, so, uh, type one, uh, subtalar subluxation or dislocation, ankle dislocation, and ankle and telonavicular dislocation. The importance of Hawking classification is mainly prognostic. So the, 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 the stage of Hawking classification affects the prognosis of the fractures, not the management. All these fractures need early reduction and stable internal fixation and perfect anatomical reduction. The difference is in the prognosis. Uh, this paper uh, is a systematic review of literature comparing the, uh, the, the complication of Taylor neck fractures according to Hawking classification. And they found that all complications, AVN, osteoarthritis of the ankle, and subtalar osteoarthritis increased significantly from stage one to four Hawking classification. So a vascular necrosis, which is a main concern in Taylor, fracture, Taylor neck fractures, and type one, it's 0%, type two, 21, uh, type two, 15%, type three, 38%, type four, 55%. So osteoarthritis and subtalar osteoarthritis all increase with more um, uh, Hawking stage in Hawking st classification of Taylor neck fractures. So because of all these complications, we used to consider Taylor neck fractures as surgical emergencies, but is it really a surgical emergency or can we delay it to the next morning? So the question in this paper was, are displaced Taylor neck fracture surgical emergencies or no, we can, we can avoid doing it overnight while not everything is prepared and go to the next morning. The result of this study was that 60% agreed that the treatment after eight hours is acceptable and 46 degrees agrees that treatment after 24 hours is acceptable. So the most important point in managing displaced Taylor neck fractures is to do it perfectly. If you feel that the circumstances or the equipment in the operation are not ready for the operation, then delaying it to the next morning is not a problem. But this is not the rule in all cases. If there is neurovascular compromise or impending skin penetration by the, the postromedial fragment, then it's a surgical emergency. When we do the operation, what is the approach? Is it medial, lateral, combined medial and lateral, or posterior? This depends on the anatomical site of the fracture. Is it Taylor neck only, Taylor body, Taylor lateral process, comminuted Taylor neck fracture? So the approach depends on the anatomy of the fracture. In, in simple Taylor neck fractures, I prefer the medial approach. In lateral process fractures, I prefer the lateral approach. In posterior process fractures, I prefer the posterior approach. In comminuted neck fractures or neck fractures combined with lateral process fractures, I prefer combined medial and lateral approach. Because if you compress the medial side alone and leave the lateral side, you will end in malunion in varus. So in these cases, you have to see the neck from both sides, medial and lateral for perfect anatomical reduction. This is uh, an example of the medial approach, fixing the Taylor neck, a simple Taylor neck fracture by two screws from anterior to posterior. And this is another point of discussion. I prefer screws from anterior to posterior. Maybe 
uh, screws from posterior to anterior have more powerful grip, but the grip of the screws from anterior to posterior is enough. And I don't have to use two approaches, one for reduction and one for screws, because using screws percutaneously from posterior to anterior is associated with soft tissue injuries. You can do two screws from medial or one screw from medial, one from lateral. And if there is no enough room to take the screw from the extra articular part of the talus, you can put it through the articular surface with a double double compression screws or headless, headless screw through the articular cartilage from the anterior to posterior. And as we, as we mentioned before, percutaneous uh, screws from posterior to anterior are associated with soft tissue structures injuries, the bundle and the, the flexor tendon. So uh, it should be avoided. Many plates are used in cases of comminution because if you, use, if you use screws in cases of comminution, this will lead to shortening of the tailor neck. And if you do this medially, it will end in virus malunion and this is difficult to manage later on. Another important problem that we face uh, in tailor fracture is extruded body of the talus. If the, art the articular surface or the tailor body is extruded outside an open fracture of the talus, should we remove it because it's highly complicated, uh, com contaminated, or we wash it and do replantation like in this case? Many studies showed that Re-implantation gives good results and should be done in cases of extruded talus. Otherwise, you will lose the articular surface and the geometry of the talus and reconstruction later on will be difficult. And we can see this patient, this is the X-ray of the same patient later on with full union of the talus and uh, just subtalar arthritis. And this is the range of motion of the, of the, of the, of the ankle joint. Now we come to post-traumatic tailor deformity. If the patient was treated in, in a, not in a proper way or complicated uh, due to a vascular necrosis or infection, how we manage these cases? This treatment algorithm by Stefan Rammelt is a very concise and clear algorithm for management of these cases. They classify Taylor uh, malunion or post-traumatic Taylor deformities into five stages, five types. Type one is malunion with displacement. Type two is non-union with displacement. Type three is either a malunion or non-union with partial AVN. Type four with complete AVN. Type five with septic AVN. So type one, malunion, type two, non-union, type three, partial AVN, type four, complete AVN, type five, septic AVN. So with malunion, with joint displacement, the treatment is clear. There is malunion, no avascular necrosis. So usually corrective osteotomy, maybe corrective fusion if the osteotomy or the um, Reconstruction is difficult, but it's as osteotomy or fusion. Non-union, internal fixation, it's clear. Partial AVN, it depends on the extent of AVN. Type four is complete the AVN. We have to remove all necrotic bone, bone grafting, and fusion of the ankle and subtalar joint. In cases of septic avascular necrosis, then we have to do radical debridement, then bone grafting and corrective fusion of the ankle and the subtalar joint. So this algorithm is very important. You can have few seconds looking at it again. We will now show some cases of post-traumatic Taylor deformity and the treatment according to this algorithm. This patient is a 32 years old male with neglected fractures, 
he was treated conservatively for more than six months with non-union. And we can see here the Taylor neck fracture is non-united and displaced. And there is also non-union of a fracture lateral process of the talus. And there is no avascular necrosis of the Taylor body. This is evident by MRI, but the MRI is not available now. So how can we classify this case? Is type 2, two non-union without a vascular necrosis. So what is the management? Without EVN. Without EVN. So uh, without EVN is non-union without EVN. Type 2. Open reduction and the internal fixation of the fractures. This is the open reduction and the internal fixation of the Taylor neck and lateral process fractures. This is the post operative CT. And this is the CT after union of the fracture. Yeah. And this is the patient one, one year after the operation with full range of motion of the ankle joint and full power of the ankle joint. So even non-union of Taylor fracture. Uh, we can see here. So non-union of the Taylor fractures can be managed uh, with internal fixation with good result if the body is not a vascular. Is this another case, 21 years old female with fracture of the talus two years ago was open grade one fixed by K wires. And you can see here, there is no Taylor body. The Taylor body was avascular and completely resorbed. Now the patient is in varus, equinus, shortening and pain. So what is the classification of this fracture? It, if this post-traumatic Taylor deformity is type four because it, it is complete vascular necrosis. The management is corrective fusion of the ankle and subtalar joint. There are point of, points of discussion here. What is the perfect approach for doing this and how to maintain the length? So to maintain the length, we have to do a structural graft to, to distract the area between the talus, the tibia, and the calcaneus to maintain the length. The approach, the operation can be done anterior or posterior. You can do an anterior approach or a posterolateral approach with distraction that put the graft and do fixation. Also the fixation, we can do the ankle and subtalar fusion by a nail or by special hind foot fusion plate. So in this case, we did a posterior approach, like you can see here, the clips are posterior with distraction of the space between the tibia and the calcaneus by bone graft and fixation by a hind foot fusion nail. And this is after union of the, of the, of the ankle and subtalar joint. And this is the patient later on. Sorry for the... This is the video of the patient later on of the gate of the patient. She is in about five degrees of equinus. So she walks perfectly with a little bit high heels, but barefoot is a little bit difficult. But with, with high heels, she walks perfectly as we can see here. This is another patient with non-union of the Taylor body fracture. And uh, as you see, extensive avascular necrosis of the Taylor body. So the classification of this patient is type four post-traumatic malunion, post-traumatic Taylor deformity because there is non-union and complete avascular necrosis. So treatment would be excision of all necrotic bone and the hind foot fusion as we see here, removal of all necrotic bone and uh, ankle and the hind foot fusion by nail. This is the CT after complete union. And this is, oops. This is the gate of the patient. So 
The take-home message of the of the lecture is that Taylor fractures need proper assessment and atomic reduction and internal fixation. Combined medial and lateral approach is useful in difficult cases. Choice between screws and plates depend on fracture diminution. Post-traumatic deformity management depend on the presence or absence of avascular necrosis and infection. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Mahmoud again for the nice invitation. Uh, and I hope uh, the lecture meet, uh, meet, have met their expectation. Thank you very much. In case of Taylor's fracture, which is amenable, not amenable for fixation, like that severely comminuted, would you be referred to uh, do immediate or delayed arthrodesis? Uh, I would try to do immediately as, as I can to, uh, you can add grafting and fixation with plates and try to maintain the anatomy of the talus and subtalar joint. If the comminution is severe and you, is, is non-fixable, then you can do not delayed, but primary fusion. You can remove necrotic bone and do primary fusion from the start because waiting will not add anything for the patient. في حد تاني بيسأل حضرتك uh, implant of a choice for comminuted Taylor neck fractures, plates or screws? If comminuted, I prefer plates. Another question, how can AVN be diagnosed by MRI? It's, it, it will be a dark area in T1 and T2 in, in the MRI. And we, in the X-ray, it's usually evident by the extensive sclerosis as, as we showed here in the case. شكرا جزيلا لحضرتك يا دكتور محمد على المحاضره الجميله وشكرا على وقت حضرتك. شكرا شكرا على الدعوه الكريمه شكرا يا فندم. شكرا جزيلا دكتور محمد زين ربنا يا فندم. I just stop here. Thank you so much, sir. Our next speaker, Professor Gamal Hosni, the the president of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association, Dr. Gamal B will speak about Charcot Ankle. Dr. Gamal? Okay. لو تسمح لي حضرتك دكتور جمال قبل ما نبدا ارحب باستاذنا الكبير بروفيسور وجيه موسى from Southampton University UK. Professor Wagih, uh, it's a great honor that you are with us tonight, sir. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Continue with you tonight. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Gamal B. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Mohammed, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Charcot foot and ankle. Can we save the limb? Uh, I'm not going to speak about early cases, you know, early diagnosed cases. This is not uh, my domain because I'm not a foot and ankle surgeon. So perhaps I'm going to talk about such patient or such a patient. I just want to remind everybody with the 18th, uh, our International Deformity Conference from 4 to 6 August in Cairo, Intercontinental Sit Stars. We have many workshops. And this is an important event. You know, this was published in the Journal of Bone and Joints, the American uh, one. Uh, the very popular annular deformity courses are Baltimore, Hull, and Cairo. So please come. Which patients? Sometimes we talk two different languages. Why? Because we don't talk about the same patient. Somebody is going to talk about uh, how to diagnose uh, Charcot joint, the early treatment or something. But I'm going to talk about these patients, neglected cases with this dislocated ankle infected with a, with a bone gap, dislocated foot with a bone gap and foot ulcers, infection and chronic osteomyelitis. So when people talk about Hello, something, Hello. they talk about evidence-based medicine, yeah. evidence. -based. Hello, alaykum. Alaykum salatu barakatuh. If we talk about Zahra neglected, Zahra complicated, sharp with foot and ankle, how we get evidence-based medicine, it's a bit difficult. Remember what Bertrand Russell said, you think you are defending your thoughts 
And then you find out that you are actually defending their thoughts. قد تقضي عمرك وأنت تعتقد بأنك تدافع عن أفكارك ثم تكتشف أنك في الحقيقة تدافع عن أفكارهم التي زرعوها في فيك في عقلك. So is it possible to change our beliefs? Our beliefs should be hypotheses. We test, not treasures we guard. Now we are talking about major global epidemics. The, the instance of diabetes mellitus, missing early diagnosis can lead to severe complications. And this is not the topic. Perhaps you have just an innocent fissure. You can end up within three months with this picture. Charcot and destroyed ankle. Because you forgot that with this innocent fracture, you underestimated the soft tissue injury, as usual. And if you have neglected or complicated cases, what are the protocol of treatment? No protocol of treatment. Don't talk to me about uh, um, we need to go to a specialized center. We need uh, different specialities. We need uh, vascular surgeon, um, things like that. When we talk this way, that means just we want to get away from the, this problem. I'm talking about neglected, complicated cases of Charcot arthritis. So again, these are the, the, the photos of the cases, some cases. I'm going to discuss one issue because people talk about sometimes amputation is a life-saving operation. So we forget this picture with chronic infected, also the foot and dislocated foot for more than one year and the patient is on a wheelchair with heavy weight fat patient on a wheelchair for one year and uncontrolled diabetes with different problems due to uncontrolled diabetes and the people talk about amputation is a life-saving operation and this patient went to different places in egypt and she went abroad and they just tell told her that this is a really life-saving operation again if you have this chronic chronic osteomyelitis and the patient with charcot foot and again not responding to any type of treatment to debridement or something and they had minor amputation on the other side and they called him this is a life-saving operation so is it really a life-saving operation why amputation is a life-saving operation because people talk about the vascularity fortunately it's usually preserved and peripheral pulses may be bounding. So it's not the vascularity. It's not the issue. Perhaps it's the opposite. People talk about life saving, but I'm talking about it has in death. It makes your patient closer to death if you do amputation in such cases. I look to the mortality rate after amputation. After major amputation, we have mortality rates between 33 to 65%. And after minor amputation, 18 to 45%. And in this patient, the mortality rate over all five year mortality rate from 29 to 69% of patients following minor amputation and from 52 to 80% for patients with major amputation. I'm not going to repeat myself. So limb salvage in this population is especially important with this high risk of death after amputation. So if you compare amputation to limb salvage, let us talk about limb salvage. The second tibio-taylor, tibio-calcanian or tibio-taylor fusion. So this is tibio Taylor and this is tibio calcania fusion. And this is the, an example of 61 years old female who overweight and controlled diabetes with dislocated osteoporotic joint, chronic infected ulcers with multiple debridements before, as you see here. And she had minor amputation before. 
what we did, we did the ridement, the wounds, reduction, partial reduction. Because we thought if you do a, a, a rear reduction, perhaps you have neurovascular problem because this is severe, severe deformity, primary wound closure, frame application, and we have residual equinus. So this is the frame we do. Then we do gradual reduction, one millimeter per day. Why you put multiple wires here? Multiple wires because sometimes from the frame, we cannot assess the reduction. Frame evolution. Because with the cases I've done before, we have high rate of pentrike infection and marked swelling or edema. We change the frame now. We do more levels of fixation, perhaps three times the normal, different size of rings, perhaps. We do three or four sides of rings, more pins and wires, early removal of infected wires in the outpatient clinic. When you have just persistence of infected wire or half pin, we just remove it immediately. Multiple intermedullary wires, like this patient. This is size 140, 160, and 180. So that three sizes. We have three wires. We have two hydroxyapatite half pins. Look to the many wires. And you see, this is the closure of the wound. After frame removal, so this is not the end of the story. We remove the frame, then we pull another wires retrograde from the heel. We put four, five, or six wires. Then we put the patient in a cast, and this is the shape of the cast. Look to the shape. This is the empty part in T to allow for the wires to be bent here so we can remove them without admission of the patient to the operating theater again. And now we allow full weight bearing to the patient, just full weight bearing. You see here with the cast for two months. So this is another period of protection and full weight bearing of the patient. Okay. Then we exchange the cast and we'll leave the wires in place. We exchange the cast. And then with a few days, we remove the wires from the outpatient and you see the picture here during a cast exchange. And then after removal, look to the skin. Look to the union. Another case of chronic osteomyelitis, see here in the gap. And just, uh, they made the, 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 uh, uh, the, the isotope scan and they told the patient, she has, she has to do an amputation, she has an infected wound, and this is chronic osteomyelitis and there's no hope, things like this. And we did the bridement and compression distraction compression, and this is the end picture. Another example with infection and compression, distraction, compression. Bone transport with this bone gap and bone lengthening. See the bone transport. Again, with dislocation, corticotomy and bone transport. See the lengthening. Foot, infected foot. And it was ready for amputation. And we did transverse bone transport. And this is how we do it. We do a longitudinal incision far away from the problem, which is in the upper tibia. And we do corticotomy for about 1.5 by about 15 centimeter, multiple drill holes. Then you put half pins in this segment. And this is, then we do distraction. When you do gradual distraction, one millimeter per day, you have this vessels and increase blood supply by about 300%, which will solve the problem. This is one week. And this is the site of the distraction. We just did the bridement and we left it. 
and this is one week afterwards, one month, look to the infection and the distraction here, two months, closure, three months. See, it looks like no risk. And this is after two years of this patient. So two years follow up. This is before and this is after looking. This is the sole of the foot and dorsum of the foot. And look at the shape of the tooth. Then after three years, the patient came with the right foot. Look to the right foot again. Chronic osteomyelitis, infection. And he had ray excision before. Again, with the transverse bone transport to the other side. Okay, the bridement. So one month, two months. You see, this is before, and this is before the right and the foot, the left side. And look, both legs. You link for all. This is transverse bone transport. And this is the TB on both sides. This is the site of the transport. We were not going to stress about the prophylactic treatment. We all know this. In conclusion, we have to respect the minor trauma to the foot and ankle. Remember the question, amputation in diabetic patients, is it life saving or harsh and death? Charcot arthropathy, neglected cases. Are we going to do an amputation or limb salvage? The application of low tension stress bone transport can be a good alternative for amputation in difficult cases. Don't talk about the frame, because people ask me this silly question, not even in Egypt, even abroad. How many frames do you do per week? How many frames do you do per month? This is a silly question. The frame is just, uh, it's just uh, iron and stainless steel. We are talking about ideas. We are talking about principles. I'm not going to talk about the frame or a circular frame or something, but this is nonsense. These are the methods, the bloodless technique, the bridement compression, distraction compression, longitudinal bone transport, transverse bone transport, the bridement gradual correction of the deformity or dislocation. And this is the frame I'm doing now, just the frame of evolution more levels of fixations, different size of things, more pins and wires, early removal of wires. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gamal Hosni, the president of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. So Gazeel and Sazna Fadl. Dr. Awesome. Mahmoud, any questions to Professor Gamal? You are muted, Dr. Mahmoud. Shukran Gazeel and Haq Fandim on the Mahadra Raya, but Sazna Haq Nibda El Asila. Our colleague, uh, Wael Dahshan, asked uh, you about uh, what is the percent of death after salvage operation? What about sepsemia? It's not a salvage operation. <laughs> this is the first answer. <laughs> this is reconstructive operation. We don't have cases of septicemia. Why septicemia, I, I wonder, why? No septicemia cases. Our colleagues, in other questions? Yes. Any other question, Dr. Mahmoud? Okay. I would like uh, it's a great pleasure to have you Wagi. Uh, thank you very much indeed sir thank you Dr. Gamal thank you Habibi thank you very much الله حضرتك وفي النهارده يوم شغل لا يا فندم النهارده عشان اجازه في انجلترا فانا وصلت مصر حضرتك في مصر دلوقتي ما شاء الله يا اهلا وسهلا عشان كده لابس كاجوال النهارده يعني مصر منوره يا فندم هو بالنسبه لنا النهارده عيد يا دكتور وجيه يعني انت معانا يعني طبعا طبعا عيد طبعا عيد لجمعيه وبنها طبعا مش عايز اكتب شكرا يا فندم طبعا يا فندم الصوره واضحه يا فندم كده ولا واضحه سعادتك يا فندم اتفضل يا استاذ اتفضل يا استاذ 
thank you very much indeed, Professor Mohammed Al-Ashab and Professor Jamal Husni and all the Banha online team. It's a great pleasure to be with you. It's always an honor to be uh, with my colleagues and friends and family to talk about uh, trauma and orthopedics. Uh, when I choose a subject, I try to make sure, uh, or uh, to the best of my ability, that it has some clinical implication. And I hope by repeating these uh, messages uh, from your God self and others, uh, we change the way we practice. I think we all have learned from the practice of managing fracture necrofema uh, in different area, and Southampton is one of those. We have a very clear guidelines of what to do when you have an elderly person coming with fracture necrofema. You know which patient to have fixation, which patient to have uh, hemiarthroplasty or a total arthroplasty, and even with the fixation, who's to have plate and screws, dynamic hip screws, and who's to have proximal femoral nails. So quite clear guidelines, and it is multidisciplinary from elderly care physician, anesthetist, physiotherapist, nutritionist, and so uh, 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 tissue viability team, and everyone else. I think time has come to do and apply similar guidelines for fractures ankles or fractures around the ankles in elderly population. Old people are getting increasing in number. Uh, in Southampton, we have 270 ankle fractures per year, not all treated uh, surgically, of course. A third of these uh, uh, 270 fractures will be patient over the age of 75. So 90 patients every year with fractured ankle that we need special care. So we have to set up some guidelines. Now, if we treat this fracture in a 25 years old patient in the same way that we treated in an 85 years old patient, then we have a problem. And this is uh, the dilemma. Old patient, multiple comorbidities, not just medical uh, comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, kidney failure, steroids, but also physical disabilities, i.e. multiple joint arthritis and loss of function, difficulty to mobilize none with bearing or partial with bearing, in addition to the, the osteoporosis. So if we do an open reduction in internal fixation, you try to preserve, or we try to preserve the range of movement, but there is high risk of complication. We're going to have the evidence of that soon. If you have a fibular nail, I call it a fibular, but some people call it a fibula nail, you preserve the range of motion, and you have early weight bearing, but slightly restricted. If you uh, opt to have a hind foot nail, that is the calcaneo talo tibial nail, then you sacrifice the range of movement in the ankle and subtalar joint, but you allow immediate weight bearing. So we have to have some idea, why do we do those? When do we do them? And we introduce them to our young colleagues. This is a repeated pattern. It's like when you look at an X-ray of a fracture hip and you say this is guarding grade three, or guarding grade four or whatever classification you use. We having these X-rays coming day in, day out, exactly typical. What would you do to that? Traditional method of stabilization was open reduction and internal fixation. With the plate, with an osteoporotic bone, probably this is not the best way. The wound infection in these cases is reported to be up to 26% of patients. 50% of the metal work may require removal. And this was a old paper. Complication even more than 26% in elderly population and in diabetes and in smokers. And smokers, I understand, obviously in Egypt is pretty common. Further to that, you have to wait for the soft tissue swelling to settle before you go for the open reduction internal fixation. So you occupy the bed in the hospital for good few days, and this is, cost, this is not cost effective. You don't want to see that, really. You better see that. If that is going to get you to do the operation on the following day and the patient to fully weight bed straight away with significantly less risk of soft tissue complication. You don't wait for soft tissue swelling to settle because you go through the sole of the foot, which is not swollen with this type of injury, as we all know. Even better, you could have that. 
you still have your joint preservation. So the jo ankle and subtalar joint are preserved. This patient will have slightly restricted weight bearing on the following day of surgery. Again, surgery could be done straight away. So these are two options. And in addition to the overproduction internal fixation, this is a third option. You have to be careful and you have to have the three options available if you want to give the surface that you would like to give. So this is a classic. You get this fracture, soft tissue, swelling. What would you do? Would you go through the blisters and have an overproduction internal fixation? Would you wait for a week or two or less or more to try to reduce the swelling and the blisters before you go ahead for surgery? Or could you go straight in in the same day through these multiple stab wounds? This is a fibular nail. This is the entry hole in the distal part toward the heel and the other two proximal ones are the locking screws. So you can do that and the job is done straight away. You are not going to do an open reduction and internal fixation when you have blisters like that, unless you have soft tissue team that deal with the blisters with whatever way they do. So what are the advantages? of the fibular nail. It's an alternative stabilization, small incision, early operations charge. It's desirable when you are worried about soft tissue and diabetes and smokers. We all know from the biomechanical study that intramedullary devices are better mechanically or similar to the looking uh, uh, plates. The distal looking uh, allow you to, to restore the length of the fibula, which is a problem if you don't restore it. We do it on the same day, following day, third day, when there is a surgeon who is able to do this type of surgery and allows early mobilization. In the UK, length of stay of hospital is a very important parameter of your practice. We, I'm going to show you some studies from Southampton, how much it costs us for the patient to stay one night extra in hospital. There are surgical tips and tricks that obviously when we come to do it practically, it, uh, we will talk about it in details. Not just in old people. This is a 50 years old female who had nephrectomy and she's on high doses of steroids. So we expect her to have some issues with the quality of the bone, straight in, fibular nail, fracture of the medial malleolus reduced and percutaneous medial malleolar fixation. 12 weeks later, job done. The device itself is pretty simple. Obviously, there's a steep learning curve like everything else in orthopedics. Again, this is a repeated pattern. This is an 85 years old lady, came in, had an external fixation because of the worry about the soft tissue. Depends who is a surgeon. Started to drift, as you can see in the external fixation, started to go into valgus and the fracture started to open. Some clever person did that. The fracture was not lagged, but a plate that was not really adequate. And this is what we expect. This is what, how they come in, and this is how they ended up. So she had it up, an ankle arthrodesis preserving the subtalar joint. You could have done that straight away, day one. Again, it's a repeated pattern. Similar patient, external fixation, locking plate. Pretty adequately done with lagging of the fracture, but with a period of immobilization. Job done. But soft tissue has to allow us to do that because to put that plate in, you have to have a mighty big scar tissue. Similar patient, hind foot nail. That, that X-ray was intraoperative and I can see it was on the 2nd of March, 2022. The operation was done. This X-ray was on 14th of April, five weeks later, done, job done. So this is what I think, this is my personal feeling, but what the literature say, and let's talk about it carefully. There are lots of comparison, and let's go through some of them. As we said, the dilemma is the elderly population, multiple comorbidities, poor soft tissue, and osteoporosis. We've talked about this before what you want to achieve, you have to have the three modalities of treatment available at your disposal. Then you could make a decision which one will suit you, the skills you have, which one will suit the patient uh, condition, the fibular nail. 
there are multiple numbers of cases that were uh, uh, reports. Uh, in the past 10 years, there's increased publication about fibula bleed. Uh, Tim White in Edinburgh wrote quite a lot extensively since 2012. And we all know that in Edinburgh, they were a leading center for trauma. And this older colleague may remember the days when the first paper came about of intramedullary nailing of the tibia in open fracture. And that was very early on when we used to wait weeks and weeks and weeks before we do definitive, definitive treatment. And that was Charles Court Brown and Margaret McQueen. And they introduced the early approach of fixation of the uh, open fracture. So Edinburgh has a big role in management of complex injuries. These studies were biomechanical studies, retrospective case series, small randomized trials. So here in uh, between literature review between 1994 and 2013, 17 studies, total of 1,008 patients, they categorized into three types of intramedullary fixation. Three studies talked about intramedullary screw fixation. Again, we may remember that in Egypt, we used to put big screw in the fibula, uh, no locking, nothing else. Then six studies about unlocked nailing and eight studies about intramedullary locking nailing. The measures were the outcome union rate and the secondary outcome measure were functional outcome. The results from intramedullary screw fixation uh, union rate was 95 to 100%. Complication rate where it was 8.6. The functional outcome was telephone questionnaire, so it was subjective. The unlocked nail, uh, union rate was 100%. Complication rate was 8, again 0.5, so similar complication. Majority symptomatic metal work that will require uh, uh, removal. Functional outcome, 60 to 92 again, was subjective. Results of locked intramedullary nail, which we currently we use, there was eight studies, all cases, uh, Tim White, and it was a randomized control uh, trial comparing the intramedullary locked nail with open reduction and internal fixation. The mean age was slightly higher now, 6.7, and union rate was 98 to 98%. Complication rate at 12%, fibular shortening and the metal work problem was most frequent. We have learned since then how to overcome the fibular shortening. So when you put the nail, you do the distal locking in the fibula and you put traction in the fibula before you do the syndesmotic uh, screw fixation. So there are steep learning uh, curve there. Uh, the old and uh, Molinder score is the one used uh, frequently. Majority of the studies reported good to fair with some excellent uh, results. The function outcome uh, showed no functional difference between open reduction internal fixation and uh, intramedullary, uh, and that was a randomized control study. So you aim to get the same result with less complication. Another study optimizing the long-term outcome and avoiding failure with fibular intramedullary. This was the large, largest published uh, single series from Edinburgh again, Tim again, and that was published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2019. It was retrospective, and it is 30, 342 patients. Primary short-term outcome, uh, construct failure was the issue, and one of these patients actually had the fibular nail outside the distal fibula. The construct failure was due to device failure, which has been sorted out. 13 was surgeon's uh, learning curve issues. Another study, optimizing long-term outcome and avoiding failure. We lots of work done about the design of the implant, the surgical technique, et cetera, et cetera. The aim of the fibular nail is to maintain the congruent mortis and patient satisfaction was high. Failure occurs due to intra or post operative surgeon's error. So, really, it all comes to us. And that is why you shouldn't just have a go at it. You have to really see someone doing it, doing it under supervision, do cadaveric course, 
and started to get your hands on all the uh, 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 shortfalls and pitfalls that can cause you a problem. It favors the, intra, the intramedullary fibular nail compared to the ORIF. The recent uh, randomized controlled trial uh, prospective published uh, Brunel of Joint uh, Surgery 2016, comparison fibular nail versus ORIF again in patient over age of 65, which we have huge number of them every year, as, as, as I said, approximately 90 every year. Uh, the outcome was uh, over the Molnar uh, score. Secondary outcome was a complication rate with follow up was three, six, and 12 months. Post operative rehab was standards between the groups, uh, converted to walking cast or orthotics 24 hours after surgery. And that's a big advantage is to allow this elderly patient to get out of bed and to be allowed to go some weight. No difference in the uh, score, foot score between the ORIF and the fibular nail. So they are pretty similar with the difference of the soft tissue complication. 36% were complication infection in the open reduction internal fixation, 12% in the fibular nail, mainly symptomatic heart. Again, repeating the same study. So there's uh, and that was the most recent uh, in uh, meta-analysis in 2022. And there was four comparative studies, including 262. There was no statistical difference in reoperation rate between the two. So to summarize the fibular nail, safe and effective in unstable ankle fracture, functional outcome similar or potentially superior to overduction internal fixation, associated learning curve, and I have to stress that very, very clearly, and wound complication lower than overduction and internal fixation. Now, that was an audit from Southampton University Hospital. Although we've done some financial counting, the intramedullary nail was 571 pound. The one third tubular plate for seven, and seven screws was 129 sterling pound, and the distal fibular locking nail was 286. But the fibular nail patient stays shorter period of, of night, and one night in the hospital, in the National Health Hospital, cost 280 pounds. So it paid for itself just to save one night stay in the hospital. How about young patient? Can we use that in young patient? Yes, you can. And there are intramedullary nailing versus plating in fibula in ankle fracture in young active patients. The advantage of that is the patient can with it straight away. How about hind foot nail? Hind foot nail to me is a heavy machine. Really good thing to do, but you have to choose your patient correctly because you're going to sacrifice ankle and subtalar joint. You don't repair the surfaces as fusion. That's very different. If you could do a hind foot nail for correction of a deformity, you clear the ankle joint and subtalar joint to even to fuse them. But this one is closed nailing. So stab wound in the plantar aspect of the foot with two proximal stab wounds for the locking. Uh, screws. Again, increased publicity is becoming very popular now, and it is focused on frail, low demand patient group. So it is on patient who is wheelchair bound, patient with significant comorbidities, patient that you want to get out of bed. Similar results to a fibular nail. And most articles are small retrospective cases. Fragility fracture and ankle. So the term fragility fracture is becoming used more often, and we compare functional outcome following that nail to other means of fixation. 2005 in the bone and joint surgery, again, studies, 2008, 2013, 2014. This is the further retrospective series, number of further cases series, number of patients was 15 to 30. Similar result reported, uh, was multiply comorbid patient, age approximately 65, 60, 75 to 85. And this is a very important cohort of patient that would require a lot of care at home or a nursing home if you don't get them uh, out of bed. Complication rate was 7 to 29. Again, further studies, fragility fracture of the ankle, one randomized controlled trend in hind foot nail, uh, versus uh, over-reduction elderly patient, single center, prospective, 
uh, randomized control. No significant difference in pre or post operative foot score. Rate of complication and reoperation rate was higher in the open reduction group, which is, that is a message I want to get to you. You may be able to do it. Yes, you would, but the rate of complication is pretty high, requiring further surgeries, requiring a patient to stay in hospital longer. Length of stay is reduced in nailing group and patient can wait there, wait there straight away. So what is, can we compare the fibular nail and the hind foot nail? There's no comparative studies till date. So we will compare the fibular nail with the open reduction and internal fixation with plate, and they compared hind foot nail with open reduction and internal fixation of the fibula. So that is work to done for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, our dear professor, Professor Wagih Musa from Southampton University for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. You're most welcome, sir. Dr. Mahmoud, if we have any questions to Professor Wagih. You are muted, Dr. Mahmoud. شكرا لحضرتك يا فندم على المحاضره الرائعه احنا طبعا كل محاضره حضرتك بنتعلم فيها حاجه جديده احنا بنستاذن حضرتك كنا بس وي ونت تو كونسنتريت اباوت ذا جوينت بريبريشن ان ان هايند فوت نيلز ذير از نو نيد فور جوينت بريبريشن ان ساتش كيسز اف يو دو هايند فوت نيل فور ا فراكشر انكل اتس ا كلوزد نيلينج لايك اني نيلينج ذات يو دو يو دونت اوبن ذا انكل جوينت you don't open the subtalar joint, you do the reduction and you put the nail, distal locking screws and proximal locking screws and nothing else. There's a very small minority of these patients who may require to come to remove the nail, but this is very, very small number of patients. Otherwise they don't. That's why when you select this patient, you have to be clear that they can wait there, but they are not going to play football for Liverpool. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about uh, the need for uh, removal, of, for another surgery for removal, in case of fine foot need, especially? Very rare, very, very rare. That when we had to remove them, they were removed because of associated complication, like in diabetes, and the, the surgeon did not pay enough attention to the soft tissue handling. But the advantage of that, of, of the hind foot nail, if the patient can wait there as they would like, straight away. And as I said, in theory, you could say, I will ask the patient to partial wait there or none wait there. That's in theory. In real life, sometimes it's almost impossible. Any other questions? There is, a, there is a question for our colleague, Mustafa Meher. In Egypt, which patient can we choose for hind foot nail? If you have a fragility fracture, if you, if you have, a, I'll give you a simple example. If you have an 85 years old osteoporotic with a trimalleolar ankle fracture, would you, go, would you do a posterolateral approach and plate the posterior malleolus? And would you plate the fibula? and you stabilize the medial malleolus in this patient? No, you don't. Uh, they are osteoporotic, they have got comorbidities. They may not be even fit to last that long to have prolonged procedure. And after that, they were not going to comply with lung weight bearing. So this patient and the sole of the foot, as I said earlier, is not swollen, does not swell up when you have ankle fracture. When you have ankle fracture, the swelling is around the fracture, around the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus but it does not go to the sole of the foot because of the compartments. So the sole of the foot is not swollen. So it is safe to go in day one. You reduce it, you put your guide wire as you do any closed nailing, any interlocking, and you do the reaming, you choose a size, you use a big size, and you put your nail and you do the locking in the talus, uh, one in the talus, one in the uh, calcaneum, and two in the tibia. Okay, sir. What about another question? What about Charcot joint? Ah, Charcot is a different matter. And we can use hind foot nail for Charcot, but is it the Charcot uh, provoked by the fracture or the patient comes to you with hind foot Charcot? That's a different matter. 
and we can la yufta wa malik fi al-madina fin al-doktor hani muwafi هو دكتور هاني في فرنسا دلوقتي هو عنده عشاء دلوقتي يا فندم قال المحاضره بتاعته وبعدين خرج ايش ايش ا ديفرنت ابروتش اتس ا ديفرنت ابروتش فور شارك يس يو كان جو ترانس فيبولار يو كان يوز ذا فيبولار از ا جراف اند يو كان اتس ا ديفرنت واي اوف ثينكينج بس اي ام توكينج اباوت باي ماليولار تراي ماليولار انكل فراكشر ان ان اولدر بوبوليشن ويتش اي ثينك اند وي بيليف This should be treated in a special way. This should not be in the hands of a trainee, naib, or with respect, taban, or mudaris musaad. Who have been doing it for 25 or 30 years, who have been putting plate lateral with screws medial, we treat them in such a way. This is not the approach. And as I said, and I go, I give the example earlier of the fracture of the femur. The fracture of the femur, you know the classification. You know who's going to have a hemi arthroplasty. You know who's you have bipolar. Who's who. To have a hemi arthroplasty, we'll have a total uh, arthroplasty. So it's exactly the same for your ankle. You do that is why in big centers you have a foot and ankle unit which will deal with all of this. And we have the backup of elderly care physician, diabetologist, anesthetist, pain management team, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You do the operation as soon as you can. We always say the sun should not rise twice on a fractured ankle in an old person. Yeah, my bet Charlie, you mean. Okay, sir. Another question, uh, it seems that uh, the, uh, the point of joint preparation is not clear for our colleagues. Another question, what about uh, the pain after uh, operative intervention with hind foot nail as non-union, as we doesn't remove the cartilage? You have an interim, as I said, you have the large nail, you have the biggest nail that you can get in there. There's no movement. You have a nail in the calcaneum, in the talus, in the tibia, and you use size 11 or 12 or whatever size you use, depends on how much you ream. There's no movement there. And we said, it's an special, this, these are not someone who's going to climb the ladder. And uh, this is a cohort of patients, the low demand, and you want them to get out of bed. And if you leave them in bed in a back slab until the swelling settle, they will have ulcers either in uh, the sacrum or ulcers on the heel or ulcer on the fracture side. They will have chest infection, they will have pneumonia, etc. Et so it is a patient that you want to get out of bed with a straight leg. Thank you, sir. Thank you, welcome. our professor. You're most welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Professor Wagi Musa from Southampton University for joining us tonight. It was a great honor for us, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You. Uh, now you. we come to the uh, second uh, part of our webinar tonight, which is uh, the uh, Canadian uh, presentations by our colleagues and our friends from McMaster University. I would like to thank all of them for joining us in our webinar tonight. And many thanks to my dear friend, uh, Professor Walid Kashta for arranging these uh, very, very fruitful presentations. Uh, our first presentation from uh, McMaster University will be Professor uh, Selina Len will speak about pediatric food assessment, gait analysis, and orthotics. You are very welcome. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Let me just share my presentation. Um, can everyone see okay? Yeah. Apologies. Thank you so much. God, <clears throat> apologies. I'm losing my voice right, right for this. Um, <clears throat> but my name is Dr. Lynn. I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, also known as a physiatrist here in Canada. And I've connected <clears throat> with Dr. Kishta and seen many of his patients in my orthotics clinic. Um, so I have no disclosures. Only thing to note is that I do work for the prosthetic and orthotic department um, in Hamilton, which is a for service or for profit, uh, for profit service. I don't receive any money or financial gain from the selling uh, or from the sales of prosthetic and orthotic devices. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm gonna take you through an approach to an orthotics-based foot assessment. We'll briefly go through gait, and I'm going to introduce a number of types of orthotics used. 
So the typical patients I see in my clinic, so I may see pediatric patients with foot pain, such as OCD lesions, post-fracture, post-surgical intervention, which has failed um, <clears throat> to improve their pain. I'll see ankle instability, foot deformities, primarily pes plana valgus or cavus foot and contractures. <clears throat> I'll also see a number of neuromuscular patients, including muscular dystrophies or Charcot-Marie tooth disease. And I'll see idiopathic toe walkers as well. Now, when it comes to an orthotics-based assessment, gait is really the fundamental um, assessment that I start uh, all my physical exams with. <clears throat> and when doing a gait assessment, I ensure that I observe from the back, front, and from the side. I'll do a head-to-toe assessment looking at any head deviations or head to debation, looking at arm swing, looking at symmetry from side to side. I'll look for any pelvic obliquity. And then I will have dedicated views at the knees and ankles. <clears throat> Um, when it comes to the gait cycle, there's two periods of the gait cycle. So the stance and the swing phase, uh, sorry, swing periods. And the phases really are weight, accept, uh, weight acceptance, single limb support into limb advancement. And when it comes to the periods of gait, 60% of the gait cycle is in stance phase and 40% in the swing phase. And when someone moves from walking to running, the fundamental difference is they lose double limb support. So at no point are two limbs touching the ground. So it's essentially single limb support um, cycle. <clears throat> the other fundamental piece of orthotic prescription comes down to looking at the center of, center of gravity and the ground reaction force. Um, so center of gravity typically lies just the anterior to the S2 vertebral body. And the ground reaction force, <clears throat> the force of the body weight transmitted to the ground through the feet, there's a counteracting upward force, which guides a lot of the stability of joints. And in quiet standing, that line falls anterior to the ankle joint anterior to the knee joint for stability and posterior to the hip joint. The other uh, um, analysis I keep in mind when doing my gait analysis is thinking of the prerequisites of gait. And there's five prerequisites of gait that lead to an efficient and optimal gait pattern. And that includes ensuring they have stability in stance, sufficient clearance and swing phase, appropriate pre-positioning of the foot and terminal swing, adequate step length and energy conversation. And the reason this is important is I often look at what prerequisite is lost as a way of knowing what orthotic may be appropriate for them. And when it comes to the periods of gait, 60% of what prerequisite is lost as a way of knowing what orthotic may be appropriate for them. When it comes to the periods of gait, sorry. Oh, perfect. <clears throat> um, so when I'm thinking of stability of stance and look, thinking of any ligamentous laxity, looking at any deviations, pes planus or pes plana valgus, sufficient clearance and swing. So plantar flexion contractures in particular, they have a longer limb. So how are they compensating to clear the limb? I'm thinking of pre-positioning. So in cerebral palsy patients or spastic patients where they might have tip post spasticity and they are internally rotating at the ankle. And then <clears throat> adequate step length, so primarily from intelligent gait. And then overall, how are they connecting all these to have ener good energy conservation? Now, there's also another gait analysis I use is looking at the foot rockers. And there's four foot rockers. <clears throat> Essentially, this is how weight is distributed and accepted in the limb as the tibia progresses progresses into terminal stance. And when we see a loss of the rocker, again, it also helps me determine what orthotic might be best for them. So heel rocker is essentially initial contact, loading at the heel, glute sort of activation happens with this. Tibia starts to progress over the ankle. They're getting uh, into mid stance. They then move to the forefoot. So they're starting pre-swing and then toe rocker where they're ending in terminal stance where they should get the majority of their push off. So I do have a video here of one of my pediatric patients. I'll just play it <clears throat> and think about what you might be seeing. And one more time. And if you can just stop there for a second. And then if you turn around, face the other wall. Yep. Yeah. Uh, sure. And then face the back wall. Perfect. 
So this is a patient <clears throat> that was sent to me primarily with forefoot pain, and he has been uh, essentially unilateral toe walker for most of his life. I think he's around 13 or 14 in this. Mom always thought it would improve, but it essentially didn't. And what you can see in this video are a few things, and I'll play it and talk through it. <clears throat> so his right limb is relatively longer than his left. So you're seeing a bit of a lateral trunk lurch to the left side as he has a step down to the shorter limb. When looking at the right and knee, just up there for a second. we're not seeing any hyperextension in the knee, which is important to know if we have to control that. He has his uh, left foot fixed in plantar time. flexion. He's clearing it by vaulting a little bit. And then he lands essentially on his and forefoot. And if you just stop there for a sec. So he loses his heel rocker, ankle walker, and essentially goes straight to his forefoot and toe rocker. And on the left, the only thing to really note is he has a very early heel rise. So he can land and in, in heel on his heel, <clears throat> but the heel pops up very quickly. So that's telling me right away, he's got a lot of gastroc tightness, possibly even spasticity. And one more time. After I do my gait assessment, I move on to inspection in stance and in seated, and I'm looking for swelling and erythema atrophy deformity. This patient in particular does have quite a bit of calf atrophy as he essentially has no range of motion at the ankle and the gastrox really don't have to activate all that much simply because he's fixed in that position. And then I'm looking for any pes planus, pes cavus, and in particular hind foot positioning and forefoot positioning. Next, I move on to a range of motions, so looking at true ankle tibiotalar motion, subtalar motion, looking at midfoot. And as I'm doing this, I'm trying to determine where pain may be uh, derived with these motions and stressing the joints. I'll do an assessment of knees and hips if I'm suspecting either spasticity or something more proximal contributing to their gait deviation. One of the more fundamental things in orthotics cl uh, clinic is really looking at forefoot position. And this is looking at the position of the first ray relative to the heel. So I do this with the patient prone <clears throat> with their feet hanging off the edge of the bed. And essentially what I do is get them into neutral tibiotalar joint, feeling for joint line equal on both sides, and then look at the position of the first ray relative to the heel. So this is showing a forefoot varus where the first ray is higher relative to the heel. I also look at, is this flexible or is this fixed? So how much do I have to accommodate it? If it's quite flexible, orthotic may not need to accommodate it. But you can see as they go to load the foot, they have to pronate at the subtalar joint to make contact with the great toe on the ground. If they don't do that, they're going to lose the push off in, in um, a terminal stance. And this promotes a lot of pronation. And this is something that I find if people don't get appropriate orthotics, this is not addressed. The other thing I look for is general hypermobility. So if a patient has excessive dorsiflexion in combination with a pes planus, I'll start to think of if there's a hypermobility syndrome at play contributing to this. And I'll use the Baton score as a way of assessing that, looking at hypermobility at the wrists, fingers, elbows, knees, and hips. The one thing I find this score doesn't pick up is if there's isolated hypermobility at a joint, such as multidirectional instability at a shoulder or around the ankle joint, but it does give me a screen. And younger kids may grow out of this, but if I'm looking at teenager with more than uh, four or more on the scale, I'm thinking there's a benign hypermobility syndrome and I might screen for other causes such as Ehlers-Danlos. Next is a neurologic assessment, and I do a neurologic assessment on essentially all of my patients, regardless if it's just muscle skeletal um, issue, and I can pick up a lot of hyperflexia, spasticity issues, and something that may have otherwise been idiopathic, so I'm going through my differential of if there is something central that might be contributing, such as cerebral palsy or hereditary spastic paraplegia, and it's just not been picked up. Sensations also really important to note because if someone has impaired sensation from a Charcot-Marie tooth disease, then putting a thermoplastic device on their foot and they can't tell if there's excessive pressure, they may be prone to ulcer development. <clears throat> now I'll move on into orthotics. So orthosis is essentially just an external device applied to the body to provide one or more different functions, orthoses being two of them and orthotic being an adjective. I've included a link here 
<clears throat> to a great YouTube video looking at our workshop, following one of the orthotists and how they fabricate and manufacture um, various number of orthotics. Um, something I keep in mind with all my patients is thinking through what are the nine functions of an orthotic? What am I trying to do? And an orthotic is really just one tool I have at my discretion to help manage pain. The biomechanics drives a lot of the dysfunction. If I can improve the mechanics, pain typically improves, but it's only one tool. I can you know, assess for medical intervention, whether physiotherapy or other modalities is needed, um, medications, topical or oral, uh, and even an injection management using ultrasound guidance. <clears throat> but I'd like to treat the true biomechanical driver if there is one. And the nine functions we look at are to reduce pain and comfort, prevent or correct deformity, support or stabilize, improve function, augment weakness, control spastic muscles, limit range of motion, or unloading of a disease or damaged joint. And for some, the kinesthetic reminder and awareness of their limb and space can improve function. So foot orthosis can be either custom or off the shelf. Off the shelf here, we have devices such as Superfeet. Essentially, they just provide some arch support and maybe some cushion. But a custom foot orthotic fabricated by an appropriate clinician, such as a third of certified orthotist, really can control the mechanics of the foot. And you can see here how custom these are and how many layers they are. Many centers ship them off to another center. They're fabricated offsite. They aren't typically custom. And it's one of my biggest pet peeves when someone pays money for a device that is completely suboptimal. Here, they're modified in-house and a patient can come in needing a modification. They take it to the workshop and fix it. Some of the things in particular for my pest plane of valgus patients, a foot orthotic for some is enough to correct them. We have to look if there's first ray, um, if they have a forefoot varus, then I'm going to put medial posting through the forefoot to bring the ground up to their foot so their foot doesn't have to come to the ground. And that controls a lot of pronation and subtalar valgus that they might have. Uh, adding a medial wall can again control um, the pronation moment. Now, sometimes we need to move to a UCBL device. Don't use this all that often. It's a custom thermoplastic device that can provide more hind foot control if you can't get that hind foot valgus under control with a simple foot orthotic. For younger five to eight kind of smaller kids, I might use this. It could still slip in their shoe. Now, <clears throat> an ankle stabilizing orthosis is something I use a lot with kids who have either perineal tendonitis or tendinopathies, whether there's a ATFL or lateral ligament tear or sprain and need further stability. The nice thing about this is you can control what motion they need more stability in using the side straps. It can fit in their shoe and it does provide that kinesthetic reminder and a bit of reduced range of motion. Now, sometimes this can be accomplished using a shoe, such as a high ankle shoe or a high hiking shoe. The only challenge is, you know, teens and young kids like to look for things that look nice. But if the heel counter isn't rigid, they're not going to get that hind foot control. So even though it might be a high top runner, if it's still a flexible shoe, it's really not going to do what I want it to do. Now, <clears throat> moving up from foot orthotics, we have supramalleolar orthoses. So these come above the ankle, they're custom, they're thermoplastic devices typically, and if we need higher leverage for subtalar control, we'll move to a device like this. The one on the right is a dynamic motion control device, which I quite like. Uh, what this does is you overcorrect the patient, allowing them to still have a bit of pronation from their overcorrected position. So more athletic kids who like that springy motion often find this more comfortable and functional. And then we move to ankle foot orthoses, which for some patients where their pes plane valgus is so severe, we may need a device like this. Typically, they're thermoplastic and they're custom devices. And the flexibility really just depends on this posterior strut. The more it comes around the ankle, the more rigid it becomes. I'll use a flexible device. I have a child with a common perineal neuropathy from crossing his legs a lot, maybe as a predisposition for pressure palsy. A flexible AFO will give him that dorsiflexion assist he needs. Semi-rigid devices, 
Um, an ESR device in particular has two plastics and you get some energy storage in dorsiflexion and it pushes off in plantar flexion. And I use this a lot um, when I need to get some of that push off or controlled tone. And I'll use an articulated device with the medial T-strap to really pull them into subtalar neutral positioning. There is various number of knee orthoses for patellar tendinopathies or Oshkid Schlatter, which can also be quite useful. Um, and then we move to our knee ankle foot orthosis, not used all that often in my primarily MSK patients, but in a spina bifida or uh, a flail leg from polio syndrome, we may need to use a KAFO to stabilize the knee. Challenge with this is the devices are quite heavy and bulky, and if they don't have good hip flexion, advancing the limb can be quite challenging in these devices. The last device I really wanted to mention is a reciprocating gait orthosis. This is a special type of HKFO that allows uh, contralateral hip extension with ipsilateral hip flexion. So they work together. And I have an example here of one of my pediatric patients who has spastic quadriplegia and she's quite dependent on her family, but using the RGO lets her be independent in stance and it reduces the burden of care for her family. They, I'll show you here how her dad can help her walk Okay, you're you're on. Good job, Giselle. So it's not a true use of independent mobilization, but it allows for better hip development, reducing pressure injuries, contracture prevention, and overall bone health. And the last thing I just wanted to leave off with is some patients might seem think you might think that they need an orthotic. So this is someone with quite a significant length like discrepancy from a longitudinal deficiency of the femur. But orthotics, we can't accommodate a discrepancy that much. And we actually have to move to a prosthesis for that. So a leg extension prosthesis such as this is really needed to make up that difference. And that's all I have to present for you today. Thank you so much, Professor Selina, for this very interesting talk about the orthosis. Thank you so much. Welcome. If we have any questions to Professor Selina. Uh, I, I don't have questions. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you so much. Now we will move to the next speaker, Professor uh, Heba El Takruri from McMaster University. Professor Heba will speak about a very important topic, which is foot and ankle imaging. Professor Takruri, you are with us. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Heba Takruri. Um, I'm a pediatric radiologist at McMaster Children's Hospital, and I will present imaging of the pediatric uh, ankle and foot. Um, Sorry, I'm not so good with computers. I don't know how to share my screen. <laughs> One second. Hmm. The, the green button down the share screen. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Where is it? My, uh, sorry. One you should open the PowerPoint first, then you share the screen from the yeah. icon share. From the icon, the green icon down. Yeah, Here's which key. I cannot find. One second, sorry, guys. Oh. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. Okay. Do I have um, the ability to share my screen? I can't find the button at all on my screen. Uh, you didn't open your... Uh presentation first, uh, Dr. Heber. You have so to I open have my presentation, presentation and then uh, yeah. press on the uh, green button uh, down share screen. Okay. My God, sorry. Okay. Mm -mm. I can't find it. Sorry. You can't find the green button. No, I don't. I don't have any green button on my screen. Uh, down on my Zoom the, screen, right? Yeah, down there's the questions and answers, and then the chat, and then the share screen button. It's no. Uh, I have the, I have raise hand, so um, it's it looks it's like beside I'm, raise hand. It's green one. I have green sittings. Icon. 
raise hands and then sittings and then more. No, it's, it's a green um, icon. I green did, icon uh, with an icon. arrow share screen. I don't have it, sorry. You can press icon more. Yeah. There is an icon, open more, maybe find the chair screen. No, I still can't find it. So maybe I'm, I'm joining not as a panelist, rather as just um, uh, a viewer. No, you are a panelist. You are not okay. an attendee. You are a panelist. This is the link of the panels. Okay, once again, maybe let me just leave and try to join again. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Muhammad Shihab. Dr. Muhammad, you are with us? Yes. Dr. Dr. Mah Dr. Muhammad or Dr. Mahmoud? No, Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad, yes. I think we are cousins because your name is Muhammad Shihab and my name is Muhammad Al Ashab. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Muhammad will speak about updates of recurrent club food treatment. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I hope the share screen is working. Yes, it's working, sir. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for my cousin, Dr. Muhammad. <laughs> um, I'm actually um, a fellow at McMaster Children's Hospital. I've been two years now with Dr. Krishta mainly focusing on pediatric uh, orthopedics. And our topic today is uh, kind of a common uh, problem. It's about clubfoot. And as much of you know that uh, uh, actually clubfoot is the most common congenital musculoskeletal deformity and the range of uh, prevalences between regions differs. It can go up to uh, seven per 1000 live birth. And most of these cases, most of these patients are bilateral. Uh, familial occurrences is about 25%. Fortunate for us and for the patient, 80% of them idiopathic. The rest, 90, uh, to, uh, the rest of 20% uh, are, are either associated with condition, uh, conditions such as arthrogryposis or myelodysplasia and other conditions, or uh, what considered to be an atypical club foot, which needs to be more uh, studied. Uh, the issue with the 20%, those who are associated with other conditions, the chance of relapse and residual deformity are higher. That's why going through the uh, uh, literature, you might find different percentages of those patients who end up with residual deformities after Ponsiti technique. Some of those uh, articles would mention that the percentage is 5 to 10%. Others would go high as, as, as 50%. And I'm quoting here Dr. Ponsiti that 11 to 48% of patients end up with residual deformity. And most probably those uh, uh, population are uh, um, among those who are uh, considered to be atypical club feet or uh, uh, associated with other conditions. I think uh, we are all familiar with the CAVE synonymous, which uh, summarizes the major uh, deformities that we encounter with the club feet uh, condition, cavus and uh, adductus of the forefoot, varus of the hind foot, and equinus. But what I wanted to mention that it is a much more complex multiple deformity that we have to look and consider. It, it, it involves a lot of uh, 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 bones, soft tissue from the ankle to the foot. It is an actually multiplanar type of deformity. And going through the literature to have a better understanding about pathoanatomy and pathophysiology of club foot, you will notice that there are different theories trying to um, uh, specify the pathoanatomy and pathophysiology. Some would advocate that the main cornerstone of the problem is uh, bony deformities or bony dysplasias, especially around the talus and navicular. Other would uh, uh, mention that the soft tissue problem is the cornerstone of, of the pathoanatomy and pathophysiology, which, which eventually might lead to uh, bony deformities in the long term. Other would um, uh, address it as a combined problem. But in this slide, I tried to mention most of the, uh, uh, the structures that could be involved, and I'm, I'm not going to be surprised if there are more structures, although in 80% or most of those patients with idiopathic, will not, we don't have to tackle all these issues, but when, when we are dealing with more severe and complex uh, uh, club feet deformity, yes, we might. How to make it a bit uh, simple, I'm trying to use these uh, pictures to make it sim uh, to simplify it a little bit. I mean the pathophysiology. Uh, 
in this uh, in the pictures on the left uh, you'll notice uh, normal appearances of uh, superior view and lateral view only mainly for the uh, talus and the and the naviculum and this angle actually measures the uh, angle between the head and neck of the talus and the body of the talus one of those theories would uh, um, uh, mention that the the main issue is the hip, the talus uh, dysplasia in which the head and neck uh, rotates on the medial side with the uh, naviculum subluxation or medialization and uh, 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 tailor body to be uh, rota rot rotated in the lateral uh, position. In the, in the lateral uh, view, you can notice the equinus effect that happens in uh, clubfoot uh, patients. If we add the calcaneus into the picture, you will notice again here we have the same deformity that we were talking about. And what happens is due to the subtalar effect, uh, subtalar joint effect on the calcaneus, that the calcaneus also uh, uh, distally uh, rotates uh, to, uh, in the same direction with the tails. And that might explain why in the X-ray in the AP view, we will notice that the talo calcaneal angle uh, gets uh, narrowed. This is a normal patient, a normal side, and this is a club foot uh, side. Going back again to this picture and the lateral view, you notice that again with a subtalar joint effect, the calcaneus goes also into equinus. And uh, viewing this uh, image, you will notice that the proximal part of the calcaneus is rotating actually uh, laterally, which uh, might confuse someone uh, that we know that the club foot goes into varus rotation, but in reality, the plane of deformity is different in the uh, hind foot varus. And that's why we should always look at it as a multiplanar type of deformity, more complex deformity. And then the lateral side, you, uh, again, this might explain why we see the, um, that the angle is, uh, uh, the parallelism of the angles between the calcaneus and the talus in the lateral view. Of course, the soft tissue and muscle tendons play a very important role in maintaining this deformity and aggravating this deformity, uh, uh, which uh, uh, should be tackled in the residual or uh, relapsed club foot. I will not go into details for the time. There are different ways to assess the club feet patient. It's very important to assess uh, the patient himself or herself, uh, looking for any associated conditions or underlying conditions. Uh, that would give us a better prognosis and an idea how to deal with such patients. The most uh, well-known or practiced uh, score is uh, Dr. Pirani's score, uh, which tackles different uh, um, uh, parameters in the uh, club feet. We all know that uh, 20 to 30 years back, the main uh, treatment was uh, with the classical posterior medial release, now, uh, the uh, first line of a treatment and the much more popular treatment is the Ponsetti technique uh, casting. Uh, definitely, uh, we cannot specify the uh, number of casts. It depends on the patient. Uh, after doing the serial casting, 90 to 95 percent of patients need uh, tenotomy. And afterward, three weeks of uh, uh, casting above knee and then uh, uh, boots and bars. And actually, Dr. Ponsetti, he has a very nice um, uh, uh, module that will explain how the treatment uh, uh, or the Ponsetti technique works. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, the module, uh, but I have this video that I took before. Uh, just one second. Okay, so uh, the first step of doing the uh, uh, correcting the club foot according to Ponsetti technique would be uh, doing it would be correcting the cavus deformity through supination. Although if you if you examine a new a newborn patient, especially flexible uh, 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 club foot, you will not you you might think that it would be reasonable to do a pronation and doing a pronation it might looks better clinically, but in reality you are aggravating the problem. If you are doing a pronation as I'm doing here in this video, you will notice that the cavus deformity will increase. So this is the first step of correcting uh, the, uh, according to Ponsetti technique, the second step would be correction of the forefoot and hind foot. And it's very important that the fulcrum of uh, rotation would be on the head of the talus here, as I'm pointing out in the video, it should not be on the calcaneus. Actually, Dr. Ponsetti himself, he, if you notice, he put the no, so you should not do the, uh, you should not press your thumb uh, uh, at this point it will not uh, correct the hind foot virus. And one other point I would like to add that 
most of us uh, uh, actually uh, use uh, once we put the cast on we we uh, we put the, our thumb on the head of the talus this might increases the chance of uh, skin uh, problems uh, one once i joined uh, dr kishta the way that we are doing it uh, is we apply the serial casting and then uh, sorry uh, the, the the way we do it is we do the correction the manipulation hold the patient, and then we ask our uh, assistant to um, add uh, the cast. We notice that this decreases any skin problems and actually is not affecting the, uh, the results. So uh, surgical intervention, uh, the, 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 as, as I mentioned before, before con CT casting, the main uh, uh, the, the main uh, uh, line of treatment was the classical posterior medial release. Uh, but still the soft tissue releases is very, uh, is very important and cornerstone of any uh, treatment or any surgical intervention for a club foot. And uh, after uh, the Ponsiti technique got more popular, the, uh, the, the amount of surgery that needed for the patient decreased. But still, we need to perform such surgeries for this, those patients with relapses and residual deformities, or those patients who have kind of a stiffer uh, club foot, especially those associated with other conditions, we might need to do to interfere with soft tissue releases early on, even during uh, Ponsiti casting, according to the patient. Now, if you go through the literature, you will notice that the role of recasting is getting more popular. Uh, although these, the best age uh, group that we can perform recasting is not clear yet, I've, I've came across some studies, they gone even up to age of nine and 10 years of age. Uh, they had um, reasonable uh, results. So I think that uh, recasting should be always considered for any residual or relapse club foot. In terms of uh, 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 the type of uh, surgical approach, I mean, soft tissue release, whether posterior release or posteromedial release, or the a la carte approach. I think that we need to have more studies about the a la carte approach because there is not a specific algorithm that we that I could uh, that I could find, and mainly it depends on the uh, experience of the surgeon. But overall, and looking at those uh, literature that they compared the a la carte approach versus the one size fit all procedure or the posterior med the classical posterior medial release, we found out uh, that the consecutive operations and the a la carte is less. They have improved muscle strength, less hind foot varus, less subtalar stiffness, and better radiological results. And then according to a recent study uh, published by Bochart, uh, they studied around 200 feet, 80% of them were idiopathic club feet and 20% non-idiopathic. They used a less extensive posterior medial soft tissue release, again, with not a specific algorithm. The mean follow-up was around 10 years and they found out that 70% of the patient had uh, very good results, 27 good scores, and uh, around 2% with the fair scores. And in another study in, in which they studied the plantar pressure following surgical release in children with a club foot, and they compared uh, two surgical groups with non-operative groups. So basically, we have three groups, non-operative. We have the posterior release or less extensive uh, release and the classical posterior media release. They uh, used the pedograph data, which were collected for five years for 72 feet, and they studied the maximum force the contact area, the contact time, hind foot, forefoot angle, displacement of the center of pressure. And uh, the results showed that uh, comparing the non-operative with operative, both groups, the posterior release and the posterior medial release had increased in contact time in the medial midfoot, uh, sorry, in the medial hind foot and uh, midfoot and an increased lateral hind foot uh, contact time in the posterior medial group. Lateralization of the center of pressure and changes in the angle was uh, 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 noticed in both groups and both uh, surgical groups. And in the posterior, uh, posterior release groups, the minimal invasive group uh, exhibited, they had more comparable, uh, 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 they were more comparable to uh, those patients who did not have any surgery. And they have more normal kinematic patterns that resembles the non-operative versus the posterior medial release, which was much more obvious. 
surgically treated clubfoot exhibit reduced plantar flexion and they had reduced push off pressure in both uh, groups in the posterior release and the posterior medial release, but it was much more noticeable in the posterior medial release. So the, uh, uh, the, the study would go and support with the non operative treatment as much as we can and to uh, consider the uh, posterior release or less invasive uh, uh, posterior medial release in comparison to classical posterior medial release. Tendon transfer, uh, the tendo Achilles, uh, sorry, the uh, tibialis anterior tendon transfer was introduced in 1940. This uh, as procedure is um, uh, for treating the dynamic supination, uh, which could be caused due to different uh, causes, either anatomically due to uh, dysplasia and the naviculum mainly, or sometimes the talus, or functional due to the slippage of the tibialis anterior tendon. There are different ways to do this, such this procedure, either through two incision versus three incision, full versus split tendon transfer. And according to a recent study, which they did uh, their study on a cadaver, uh, and the results were measured by biomechanical effect. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a very good study which recently published uh, clinically. The best that I came, uh, came up with uh, the cadaveric study. Uh, and, the, and their results, they found out that all three techniques may be useful and deliver varying degree of increased forefoot pronation. But with the three incision and whole tendon transfer, they found that it will provide uh, uh, most for, uh, forefoot pronation. And then uh, according to Holt et al, the tibialis anterior tendon transfer does not provide much improvement in rigid and partially correctable feet. So uh, again, uh, patient selection, uh, and according to the deformity, the residual deformity that the patient has is crucial, and plus the uh, age of the patient. Midfoot osteotomy, there are different types of midfoot osteotomies. Uh, you have either the medial uh, column or the lateral column. I, what I'm presenting, two studies that uh, combined or the double column osteotomies. The first one done by Glaza et al, and they studied 20 feet. What they did is uh, they used a double column osteotomy. They did a closing with osteotomy of the cuboid and medial cuneiform opening osteotomy in conjunction with the soft tissue release, plantar fasciotomy, abductor hallucis release. They did a less in, an invasive type of release. And their mean follow-up was for two years. What they found out, they had a good radiological, uh, uh, through their radiological assessment, demonstrated improvement in forefoot abduction in 16 and part uh, 16 feet and partial improvement in four feet. And another study in which they use the double column osteotomy plus the transcuniform osteotomy, plus of course, uh, soft tissue releases, uh, they reported uh, good clinical and radi radiological improvement. Most of the authors, I found that they recommend the medial osteotomy after the age of five due to the cuneiform ossification center. And bear in mind, although I'm mentioning each procedure by itself now, but usually these procedures are done in combination. A lot of patients with residual deformity, especially with semi-rigid deformity, they need more than just a soft tissue. They need a combination of soft tissue procedure and uh, um, osteotomies. The way to do the midfoot osteotomy, there are different ways, either through using um, uh, an osteotome directly or through a jiggly saw. The, the correction can be either um, uh, at one stage, as I mentioned in the previous studies by uh, bilateral column or gradual using uh, different type of frames. Distraction osteogenesis, uh, over the last decade, many researchers advocated more uh, or have concentrated more on distraction osteogenesis. Most of these patients that uh, uh, end up with such procedure are those who were not uh, responding to non-operative or even surgical correction. The, uh, the benefits of doing such a procedure uh, is the gradual correction that allows lengthening and opposed to shortening and the, the three-dimensional correction with the, with the same frame and it could be more individualized uh, to the treatment uh, to, to the patient itself. Different uh, frames can be used, hexapod, X-fix, uh, Lizarov, or, uh, uh, or according to uh, another study here, which they use the TSF, they studied the, uh, they, they, they used the TSF for, uh, for nine patients to do distraction osteogenesis, and eight of them had good results. With such intervention, as we know, with any surgical intervention, there are always complications. 
aside from the uh, expected complication from any club foot surgery with distraction osteogenesis, they found out that there is a specific, there are specific complications that we can face, especially the subluxation of the talus at the first metatarsopharyngeal joint. That's why some uh, would advocate for temporary fixation. Uh, we have the lysis of the uh, distal tibial epiphysis. It depends on the pin insertion and it should be taken care of. And also the vascular complication if uh, uh, over distraction was done. Hind foot osteotomies, uh, the most well known, uh, which is more historically now, especially with pediatric patient, pediatric age, is the dual calcaneal osteotomy with a closing wedge osteotomy. Uh, it does not mean that uh, the hind foot osteotomy does not have any rule, no. Um, uh, lateralizing slide, uh, lateralization uh, slide osteotomy of the calcaneus would be a viable uh, option, especially for adolescent uh, and young adults. Uh, Taylor neck, uh, the other hind foot uh, osteotomy, which was tried, the Taylor neck uh, dorsal osteotomy, although it gives a very good correction, but the problem is, as expected, the AVN and the AVM rate is up to 50%. And again, these uh, procedures are uh, uh, should be done for more uh, rigid and uh, uh, severe type of cases. The other uh, 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 deformity that we face is the uh, uh, clubfoot quinus deformity or rigid clubfoot quinus deformity. For a skeletally immature patient, hemiopathesiodesis is one of the options, the anterior distal tibial epithesiodesis. According to Ebert et al., they, use, they studied 23 feet in which the pre-operative ankle dorsiflexion was around minus three. Post-operatively, they had successful of uh, the dorsiflexion was improved up to 6.1. The other uh, uh, modality of the treatment, the supramalular osteotomy that can be used for skeletally immature patients too. Uh, uh, definitely, we cannot use the, the hemiopathesis for uh, skeletally mature patients. Uh, the, the advantage of supramalar osteotomy would be for those patients who have rotational uh, problem uh, that can be corrected, um, uh, while in the hemiopathesis we cannot do that. But uh, the, the success rate is uh, less than the hemiopathesis. I'm talking here for uh, skeletally mature patients. And most of the author have noticed that they, uh, uh, they recommend uh, correcting the rotational uh, uh, part of the, of the of, of correction before the angular uh, correction. And uh, 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 according to uh, Nelman et al., which is recently published, uh, uh, they did uh, mo most of their patients were actually skeletally immature, in which they did supramalar osteotomy. 66% had successful outcome, while 33 patients needed more uh, surgeries in the future. Salvage of procedure. Uh, we all try not to go into uh, uh, this, uh, but unfortunately, some patients need the uh, uh, eventually a salvage procedure. Uh, telectomy was the most uh, one studied. Uh, most of the um, um, articles were, um, uh, most of the patients that were included in such articles were those patients who are associated with other conditions, uh, such as arthrogryposis and myelum uh, meningocele and other syndromic uh, patients. Uh, 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 and according to a recent study, in which the follow-up was seven seven point five years. Uh, they studied twenty four patients. Most of them there were arthrogropotic patients. Two of them were myeloma meningocele. They did the uh, telectomy for uh, for these patients. Success rate was um, uh, around uh, thirty three. In which uh, patient did not need any correction and pain free. Forty percent of them. Uh, were pain-free, but they had recurrent uh, hind foot deformity, and 25% demonstrated poor results. Although the outcomes are not that good, uh, but again, this is a salvage procedure, and this should be the last uh, resort uh, uh, for such patients. This is a patient uh, that uh, we operated upon a few months ago. This patient is Amayilu Menegusil. She is non-walker. She had a very severe rigid uh, deformity in which she ended up with ulceration in both sides. After the ulcer healed, we did the telectomy and we added the cuboid uh, uh, closing wedge osteotomy in order to have a better correction. And you can see the differences between the two sides. And we, do, we did the operation in, 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 in both sides. So uh, at the end, I would just, uh, I think that uh, in the future, we need to have a better understanding 
about the atypical club foot uh, and, and, er and in a way uh, to have an early recognition of uh, atypical club foot because most of these patients are diagnosed during the serial casting or during the follow-up of the patient. The other thing, I think we also uh, should look more into a way of having a better and uh, understanding of a la carte procedure because so far it's mainly depending on the uh, surgeon uh, uh, experience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Shihab, for this very interesting talk. And we have a question for you, sir, from one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Abdullah Al Hatim. He's uh, asking a question Can you please elaborate about the level of osteotomies for rigid club foot using TSF or Elizaro? Level of osteotomies, sorry? Yeah. Level uh, of, of, of osteotomies for a rigid club foot using TSF or Elizaro. Yeah, it, uh, most of them, again, the same uh, picture that I showed you, actually this was uh, taken from one of the, those articles. They did the uh, uh, trans uh, uh, cuneiform uh, osteotomy. Most, most of them, the level of the osteotomy was on that level. Yeah. Another question, please, for you, sir, uh, from uh, our colleague, uh, Harris Mahmoud. Uh, uh, Pirani score, uh, we do it after correction or uh, neutral position? Pirani score would be a useful uh, tool um, uh, to uh, do it during even the correction. Uh, it will give you a, a prognostic uh, value uh, in, in, in how much of a serial casting you need to go. And you can also observe the, uh, the correction of, uh, of, uh, of the foot. Actually, we don't use it in, in McMaster, but when I was in Kuwait, uh, because different surgeons were treating uh, the patient, it was not only one surgeon. So I think it was a very useful tool because uh, from one week to one week, there were different surgeons. This would be a kind of a, uh, a tool that we can all agree upon and we, ha we would know the progression of the patient. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We have no other questions. Thank you so much, my dear cousin. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think the technical problem with uh, Professor Hebel Dakri has been solved. Professor Hebel, you are with us. Yes, sorry for. Uh, you are ready yeah. to share. Uh, Dr. Hamdi, yes. if you please yeah. uh, stop your uh, sharing your screen, please, sir. Yeah, um, this is uh, how, how can I close it? This is my question. Maybe I can override. Let's try. Oh, I cannot. I have to. So, any idea how can I. Uh, Just to stop sharing oh, screen, sir. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Dr. Heva, you are ready? Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. PowerPoint. Oh my God. Sorry, one second. It's, uh, I have a disclaimer. This is a new computer and it's causing me all the difficulties. I'm sorry about that. You don't have the green icon down, uh, Professor, sh sharing I, I have it, I have it, but now it's closing. You have to me. open your uh, presentation first and then uh, press on the share screen. Yes. Open your presentation first and then press on the uh, green icon down with the arrow sharing screen. I'm doing that, but now there is, um... sorry, sorry guys. Share. Okay, can we go to the next lecture and then I'll do the lecture after? Okay, because okay. Is, thank you so much. I'm so now sorry. We, we will go to the next lecture by Professor Gamal El Asiri. Uh, Professor Gamal will speak about updates in calcaneal fractures. Professor Gamal, you are with us, sir. Hey, I know you guys see the camera or not. Anyway. Uh, I'm Jamal. Thanks for the committee. To, uh, thank you so much, sir, for joining us. For this, and uh, especially thank you, Dr. Walid, the first off, who actually uh, for his invitation for uh, for this meeting. I'm gonna start sharing this to save the time. Okay. okay, I'm gonna jump from pediatric to an adult right now. So I do apologize just to be, even before we start about the kind of a long. Hopefully we'll go through it fast. We cover most of the point, but we'll go through it as much as we can. So Kirkia's fracture is known as a lover fracture or Don Juan fracture. I mean, people should call it here in Canada as a roof fracture because of all this shuffling, the snow from the roof, 
or I think back home in Egypt or I'm from Saudi, we should call it a lateral fracture. Um, okay, so a couple of points about anatomy. Looking at this carcinous fracture, especially the first soft tissue covering the lateral flap, it's important when you decide to do any fixation for, an, uh, for a calcaneus fracture. The main three blood supply for the lateral flap on the ankle is one A, it's labeled there as an A from the, it's a lateral carcinial artery, which is a branch of the per peroneal perforator artery. Then you have B is a sec second artery from called a la lateral malar artery, and the third one from the lateral tarsal artery with a contribution from the medial side coming from the medial calcaneal branch of the posterior tibial artery. If you see with the, all the three red lines, they come all the way, and we have a watershed area, weakest point of blood flow at the corner. And if everybody here, if we, anybody doing a calcaneus extensile lateral approach, this is the corner of your horizontal and vertical limb. And just bear that in your mind, guys, we're gonna come back again to this picture. This is the watershed area. So let's go back to the history, history of the calcaneus fracture. If you look at the timeline here, you can see there's a couple of points here, starting with the, with uh, the description of the calcaneus fracture and then going back to the first classification, the start point here is that the, the invention of the X-ray, where it actually, change the, the vision to the, how you manage calcaneus fracture, but starting from operative or non-operative. Another factor that happened to change that the timeline was the antibiotic discovery, after which like the discovered in 1928, then they start talking about open reduction. Let's open it because they're gonna decrease the infection rate that they had before. And again, looking at this one, in general alignment, we can see the, the history going between non-operative and operative uh, through this timeline with every time there is an impact or an impact point affecting that decision. This is just a historical picture that what the uh, 1930s with Polar, what they, what, he do, what they used to do to actually reduce the fracture because everybody know with the calcaneus fracture we have a widening you have a blown out like a burst of fracture of the heel bone and the whole thing is widened they use a hammer they use a couple of uh, ancient instrument to actually try to put that back together in general it's two percent of all the fractures not the huge compared to um, general fractures but it's two-thirds of these calcaneus and uh, calcaneus fracture are actually um, intra-articular and to represent two-thirds of tarsal fracture hind for the fractures. Remember, when you have a calcaneus fracture, it's the heel bone, you have to look at the, all the associated injuries, including lumbar spine, tibial spine, ankle, other side ankle fracture, same side ipsilateral foot fracture, and even a stab fracture. I put this in, a, in red, just to remember, when you had a calcaneus fracture patient that you see in the clinic on the ER, Remember, there is 26% that the fracture can involve the other side. When people fall, because it's usually an axial force from falling from high, they fall on both feet. Yes, they may land in one mainly, but they hit the second foot in the ground. So remember that, and because an axial load, remember 10% of these one may have a compression fracture of the spine. So remember these two things you can, you need to check on that. And unfortunately, calcaneus fractures, it's very, it carries a huge socioeconomic burden. Most of people, this injury happened to 90% of people who are between 20 and 40. And look at that age, 20 to 40, the most active people. So it's high, it has a high impact on uh, socioeconomic status there. Again, this is just to remind everybody, don't forget this picture. Okay, let's go in mechanical classification. The most common classification for these fractures are either a joint depression or a tongue type depression. The main difference is with the depressive fragment when the tail is embedded into the call, you had a fracture lot that can involve the posterior facet. If the fragment, that interarticular fragment has an extension all the way to the posterior part of the calcaneus, um, the calcaneus, uh, calcaneus tuberosity, that's a tongue type. If it dissociates from the tuberosity, like in the top uh, three pictures, that's a depression type. And this is an ASIC tuberosity um, classification. This is a common for a joint depression fracture. This is a common fracture line where you see constant piece or the, um, or the staculum tail -like fragment stay in place. But because the it's an axial load and the, the, the calcaneus will, it, will be driven with the shear forces laterally that widen your, um, widen your calcaneus or your widen your heel with the lateral wall blow, uh, blown out. But at the same time, because the shear forces and oblique fracture line 
the healing generally goes in various. So deformity is going to be various and lateralization and, uh, and lateralization of the calcaneal tuberosity. And this picture show it, uh, show that deformity clearly. In another pictures and they look at this view, like but again, this the uh, sagittal cut. Usually, you can see the fracture line or the depressive fracture on the lateral side. You see the part of the stack and tail immediately, but also you see a fracture line that can involve the anterior anterior process. It could be just like a splitting that your process from all, everything behind, or actually a sagittal fracture line goes into uh, the anterior process, and that can affect your calcaneal keyboard joint alignment. Again, this is the, another picture of, uh, that been described by multiple um, uh, authors, including Carl et al. Let's go back to Sonder classification. Why are we talking about it? I, at least um, it's it showed a lot of um, prognostic factor. I mean, it like any any common classification. It's important when the classification give you an idea about the prognosis or the severity. Look at this, this classification rely on CT scan and corona and axial views. And it's all depends on the how many fracture. And by sense, by common sense, type one, non-displaced, regardless how many numbers you have fracture, non-displaced, that's less severe than a displaced fracture. When we hit a displaced fracture, it depends on how many fragments and where these are fragments located, are they close to the lateral side or where we can approach them or they are way medially mm -hmm. and high to reach them when you do any uh, surgical uh, fixation. And at the same time, the more immediate you go, that's the more small constant fragment you're gonna rely on your fixation. And that's with common sense for the sounder classification type one is less severe compared to type four. And again, this is important the classification because it can give us an idea about the prognosis and the management, some of them. So question here, where do we go? What do we do? Should we fix it? But you guys, you thought you've been talking about all this oscillating timeline. So where we are, why we have talked about operative and non-operative. If we talk in non-operative treatment, you if you leave a calcaneus fracture, displaced calcaneus fracture, you will end with a tibiotelar impingement, lateral uh, lateral will blown up that can lead to peroneal tendon impingement. And at the same time, it's it's distorted septalar joint, you're gonna end with an arthritis. You have the lateral wall blown out, you have the sore nerve, but that's gonna affect your shoe wear. But on the other hand, if you think about operative, what's the problem of fixing it? You look at this number, 25% gonna be have, you have a wound dehiscence, 5% with deep infection. But what's the advantages? It may facilitate the fusion procedure down the road. Okay, so how do we know which way we need to go? Cochrane, uh, there's um, Bruce and his group did a Cochrane review. It's published um, in 2013, where they include four trials at that time with uh, more than around 600 patients, including a really a no, well-known studies there. But all of these, every trial has some method methodological flaws. And the good thing with this uh, trial, the, their follow-up was up to 15 years. But look at the results. No statistically or clinically significant difference. And in all the scores, except two of these trials showed some tendency for a higher return to previous employment after surgery. And again, look back, the age that affects this patient is actually between 20 to 40. You, any, any community, any place, they need these people to be the active persons. But at the same time, which we don't disagree with that, it's a major complication for uh, if you go for surgery, up to 15 to 20%. Okay, so another, another um, Dr. Bandari, who is our chair of surgery here at McMaster in 2021, he had his uh, second book of uh, evidence based book where they look at all these uh, best evidence in dealing with that calcaneus fracture. They include eight randomized trials, four meta analysis, a good number of that. What they have, they showed non operative patient failed to resume pre injury work. But in the same time, operative intervention was associated with more complication, which is similar to the previous results. No statistically significant difference in pain. But look at the other side of uh, the coin. Surgically managed patient may have resumed re-injury uh, work with a light to moderate work, not a heavy labor, baby, <clears throat> but the functional results, uh, especially with uh, this pain with the pollen angle that being restored, that's mean anatomical reduction of your fracture if you're gonna go for surgery. And the complication rate is still high, but they rated around five to 15%, still high. So in summary, 
Operative care, slightly better in younger patient. Functional outcome is slightly better in operative uh, management. Return to heavy labor is unlikely. And that based on the, all these uh, qualities. You're gonna get better results with if you restore the anatomy. And in general, as mentioned here, no difference in pain or functional outcome. Septal arthrodesis, its rate significantly decreased after operative treatment. And with the, with the prerequisite that you restore the anatomical landmark. Okay, so now I've been talking about all this Cochrane with the complication. The real question is, should we do it? Should we leave it? Or maybe. Let's talk about if we can treat this patient. It's, it, oh, the decision should be tailored to the individual fracture. How is that soft tissue, so it's running soft tissue, any associated injuries and function demand of the person and is the patient has any comorbidities that can affect the medical incident? And don't forget, surgery experience and performance. Crucial question, therefore, is not whether to operate or not, but when and how to operate on calcaneal fracture of surgery is decided. So you now you decide to go for surgery. How are you going to do it? If operative treatment chosen, this is the prerequisite that this is the, the goal of any surgery you're going to do it. It's the restoration of the length, width, height, axis of the calcaneus. And that's a, that can have proven to provide good functional results and facilitate to provide better outcome for the future procedure, such as fusion if needed. And then there's a question mark here. Should we do a Nixon sign or an MIS or minimally invasive? So back to the question, when? So most of these people, it's a high energy trauma falling from height. You have another a clearer blisters or hemorrhagic blisters. So bottom line, surgical incision should be modified to avoid area of blisters, uh, blister the skin if possible. And that's been brought in with the Giordano in 1995. I mean, I had this patient a couple of months ago. I, I have to re, um, reschedule the case. I cannot do anything, neither minimal or extensile. So we, if we're going to wait, we have to wait for the wrinkle test, which actually is showing that it decreased the complication rate if you're waiting for a wrinkle sign. So what's the predictors to, so I know if, we're gonna get, if this patient is going to get better by surgery or not? Buckley in 2002, but this schedule and it's in, just summarized people that the, the fact that associated with improved outcome, especially in female gender or non-worker compensation that did not work related injuries. But at the same time, factor associated with improved outcome in non-worker compensation, <laughs> younger patient, lower polar angle, light workload, common uterine fracture, and again, anatomical reduction. Dr. Bandari summarized that one also with the age. It's the same thing as uh, age, uh, sex, and the polar angle, and again, the classification. So now we'll say we waited, and the patient is ready to go for surgery. So what do we need to do? Should we go open reduction to fixation like with an extensile approach? Use a closed reduction um, and inter fixation, like percutaneous or arthroscopy assisted, elizarov or acute, or you know what, it's too comminuted. Let's just if you use a septalar joint and just save him another surgery. Most of us, most common procedures extended the lateral approach. It's an L shape, patient lateral position, you have a, a vertical limb and a horizontal limb, and you have a no touch technique, you make a full flap, no undermining tissues, you, you look at the lateral, lateral wall. Some people will take the lateral wall, blown out, and use it as a bone graft or put it back again, and you reduce your joint and apply your plate. A nice illustration how you can reduce it for uh, junior uh, residents if they are with us or junior staff. This is what they usually do. The deformity, which we know about that CT scan cut, it's a shortened, it's in varus. So if you look at the numbers there, when you put a chance pin there, the first number is pulling it out to length. And then you're gonna, uh, you're gonna kick the varus to a valgus, a normal valgus, correcting that one. And then you're gonna medialize the calcaneal tuberosity to match the, uh, to be in line with the staculum tailor, uh, with the staculum tailor. And then you're gonna see the last picture that you reduce the joint. And AO in their website, AO surgery, have a nice illustration, this step by step and with the fragments there. And again, now we did the surgery. We had the plate, you can see the plate there. 
and you have the fixation there and surgery is done. Question is, how we get, I mean, I'm putting a blade there. Is there any difference between locking and unlocking blade? Like some blade can have a lock and screws. There is no difference. You, you can do, uh, you can do either. The only difference that they said in kind of, kind of the studies they're showing, is, which is common sense, that most of them talk about uh, using a lock and screws in osteoporotic bone. Okay, let's go back again to this picture. Most of these with the breast fragment will have a void. When you elevate the joint, which is, you can, sorry, I'm gonna go back a little to the next slides. And you can see in these two pictures there, the void there. So in this AO, they talk about bone grafting, that's like a brown color there. So is there any evidence of that one? Yes, there is. Even in 1999, long time ago, uh, third son demonstrated that the, in the cadaveric biomechanical study that calcium phosphate cement was superior to bone grafting, which was being confirmed or actually be rehearsed by a group of McMaster in two different years and uh, uh, that the calcium phosphate cement can improve the function and radiographic outcome and reduce the, the subsidence of the articular, uh, articular reduction. Now we fix the bone, we put bone graft, we put mm -hmm. the plate, and mm -hmm. then we wanna close the wound. Is there any difference? How are you gonna close the wound? Are we talking about the extensile approach? Is the symbol suture or is there a horizontal mattress, vertical mattress? I'll go to uh, the Nati suture, which is, I'm gonna explain there. There is, they run a, um, a study, uh, say guy run a study to see the capillary refill to the flap compared to all these suture technique. And they found that with the algo Donati technique, they have the better, the flap has a better, uh, better blood flow and decrease the chance of dehiscence. Okay, why this is important? This is a, again back to the extensile lateral approach anatomy and the, the importance of that surgical, that corner of your extensile lateral approach. What's the problem? Because that, that's what we are doing, uh, all these steps, no touch technique, we try to get the best, uh, uh, the best uh, suturing technique because of all the blood flow into the watershed area. You may end with this. I know how many of you guys have did, done this one and it ended with uh, a wound that has sent exactly at that corner. So this is study done by Dr. Mohammed Saidi, our Saidi, our Saidi. I know he's actually from Tanta, from anatomical session from Tanta, I mean, uh, from Egypt. He did the study and tried to find what is the anatomical base of this lateral um, calcaneal artery. They found that there is a, it's called a danger, uh, uh, it's a triangular shape danger zone. What if you put a point from the tip of the fibula to the tip of the calcaneal tuberosity and, to, uh, to, uh, and you have the midway between them and you go up around three to 4.5 centimeter, that triangle, you have a higher chance you hit the lateral, lateral, lateral calcaneal artery at this triangle. Based on this anatomical study, which was done in 2009, Cohn in 2017 suggested after reviewing all this, say, so why we wanna make the vertical limb a bit back and just move it a little bit back away from the danger, uh, the, the triangle danger zone. And they suggested to go 0.75 around that, let's have uh, three quarters, uh, three quarter centimeter from the anterior edge of the calcaneal center, which is relatively posterior to the midline. I do apologize if it's a long talk, but uh, trying to go as much as I can. Uh, MIS, a couple of points about MIS, it's been scrapped a long time uh, uh, before with the Gisein spike. A sex diversity also talk about the tongue type when he just classified tongue on depression and the principle is just to bring in that piece and uh, brush it down. And then they talk about the sinostarsi approach, where you have a small incision just between the fibula to the base of the floor. And you look at the joint, you reduce the joint, like with the direct visualization, you fix it, and then you do indirectly with the X-ray uh, to the tuberosity. It's, um, it's been described a long time ago, even 1948 by Palmer, but nobody could replicate his results. That's why it's all out of favor. Look at this sinostarsia approach. We've talked about it. The same deformity that we talk about in the extensile lateral approach. You just make a small incision. You reduce the joint and you fix it. You have you can slide a smaller blade through that small wound to reduce the joint directly. 
and then you can slide um, the another blade to reduce the, tubra the um, articular segment to the tubra to the calcaneal tuberosity after you correct the virus to form it. Okay, um, but it was the game. It's, if you're gonna go sinus RC approach, you have to do it like, soon with the whole fragment is mobile. Advantage, less one complication, improve early postoperative motion and decrease stiffness. And that can be, uh, that was a problem with the multiple studies in internet and for GAN. It still needs a skill and learning curve, like anything minimally invasive. Uh, if you fix it using minimally invasive, is there any difference between a screw or a blade fixation? There is no difference. So it's a, like it's a dealer choice. You can do whatever you want. And uh, this is study showing that uh, the schematic review between the sinus RC and extensile comparing both the approaches in 2019, it showed the less bone complication with the 4.9%, uh, less time to surgery, and once you get used to it, and some uh, same function outcome. This is being rehearsed again in 2021 by again another meta analysis. It showed exactly the same thing. Incision complications were lower in uh, sinus RC, less time, less link, length of stay if somebody can admit the patient to sexually faster, discharge them uh, easier. A high post operative um, American orthopedic foot and ankle side score, which is a functional score. Um, I'm going to go just the last. I promise you the last point about acute primary septal effusion described a long time ago. You can see a lot of people talk about it. Till 2013, we didn't have any. It's all the studies while retrospective studies. And then Dr. Buckley uh, did a, a randomized control trial to see if we, can, if we fix or actually acute effuse at standard four. And in his study showing uh, the basin satisfaction was significantly higher in a few in a fusion site. And the second receptor arthrodesis was conducted in five patients after the RF, but at the same time, did not much showed much difference between both of them, except decrease the health system cost. That means instead of doing the fixation for a, a, a type four, a standard four, and then most likely they will get, get an arthritis that need require a uh, second surgery, you just do the fusion for the first time. I think that's. My talk, and I do apologize, taking a long time. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gamal, for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> Doctor, Doctor Shihab was raising his hand. I think he has a question. No, sorry, actually by mistake, sorry. Okay, thank you, sir. We have two questions for you, sir, uh, Dr. Jamal. One question, uh, any clinically or radiological signs uh, is indicator of bad prognosis post-operative? Any indicator for both of them? I mean, apart from the moon complication, I mean, at the end, in drop or post off, you need to make sure that whatever you do, whatever you end with in, in the surgery, that you restore the anatomy, you correct the various deformity, you restore the polar angle, get the joint as much as you can. Sometimes it's mad, but at least you get the shape of the, the, the length, the axis of the calcaneus. That can decrease your issues down the road or complicated down the road. But again, if you're gonna do an extensile lateral approach, try to go a little posterior than the usual midline between the fibula and the extensile, uh, between the uh, fibula and the Achilles tendon, trying to avoid that one. Meticulous handling of the soft tissue and close it well, keep an eye on it. And some people, even though I did not mention it here, they, some people will start even talking about what we call it, um, uh, incisional back. Instead of putting a vac or an open wound, we start applying that for a high energy wound, such as a calcaneus fracture. It might improve the blood flow there and might improve the quality of the wound or the wound uh, healing. Yes, sir. Thank you. We, ha we have another two questions, sir. Uh, would you prefer early subtalar arthrodesis uh, to or, or better to wait and do it if the patient complains in case of comminuted calcaneal fractures? I mean, there is two ways to look at it there. A few ways, that means the patient is going to heal in a short, various, deformed calcaneus, and most of the people are going to heal with a various, and if you're going to fuse it, it's your call. I mean, either you're going to fuse it trying to restore the septal alignment and correct the calc virus, which is usually you need, especially with the shortening also, you might need destruction of throdesis, which is going to be an issue with the wound, like wound closure. Uh, I find it is easier to do with, um, I mean, if you make a decision to 
to do take the patient surgery and smash, I would just feel that even though if you use just an important bones, even if you're gonna do an acute primary septal fusion for Sander for something, please restore the anatomy as much as you can. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, another question, sir. Which type of fracture that are treated by sinus tarsi approach? It depends how how comfortable you are with the sinus tarsi. If you just starting, I'm um, advised. I started with the basic one, like barely just a small depression fracture, like type standard two. But then once you get more comfortable, you can go more and more again. I think I get at least I've been trained by Dr. Petrosor who's here. We did. I started with an infantile lateral approach. I mean, yeah. I did the whole thing. Once you know what's the problem, what's the deformity, what's all these fragments that makes you, what is the pathology of these fragments, and what is the deformity forces, it makes it easier for you to deal with the sinus RC. But what type? I mean, type four, I don't think if I'm going to use it, just maybe to give me something. But don't forget, sinus RC give you an access to articular segment. If you're reducing articular segment to the day because it's it's something you can rely on, I think standard two and three. But if somebody who's gonna just start sinus RC, start with a the two, then go to three. Yeah. Uh, another question, sir. Uh, is it mandatory to repair the calcaneo fibular ligament if cut transversely in sinus tarsi approach to extend the view? I never find the answer for that, but I can't tell what I do. I, unless somebody else have an answer for this one. I, I agree with that too, because you get a full picture of the sinus tarsi, the posterior facet, sometimes to just to just to pull the perineal tendon, you still have the CFL in front of you. So I did actually incise it. It's a thick, I mean non uh, non-traumatized CFL uh, CFL. You actually it's a thick tissue. So I sometimes I put a stitch there. A lot of time. I just leave it there and say, most likely because I'm going to be in a cast, they're going to be in a whole thing. It's just like it's surgically open. Most likely they're going to heal. I don't know if actually needed. I yeah. don't think I, I have any patient. They more they usually end with a stiffness more than instability. Yeah, the, the last question is from me, sir. You said in your presentation, a, a very important statement that the bone substitute has a superior effect uh, when managing uh, bone uh, uh, bone defects in calcanean fractures than the bone grafting. I'm right? Yep. Uh, so I think all of us uh, know that uh, the, the, the bone graft uh, is has a better effect. So uh, can we correct uh, this uh, idea for us? Sorry, sorry. The two studies that done, one done by Dr. Bajamal, who is actually an alumni from McMaster, second one done by Dr. Um, uh, Herman Johal, who is actually a faculty with us now, uh, they're both supporting that the calcium phosphate is actually better in supporting the articular segment for preventing from subsidence more than the bone graft. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Uh, now we come back to uh, Dr. Heba. Dr. Heba, you're with us. Uh, yes, yes, I am. And I hope I can. Yeah, it's obvious now. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, I think Dr. Okay, well, you shared it, okay. All right, um, so I can start. <laughs> so my uh, presentation will be about uh, imaging the ankle and foot in pediatric population. I'll be concentrating more, mainly on uh, plain films with uh, some, uh, some uh, I'll show some uh, MRI and CT images uh, depending on the uh, different uh, pathologies. So can we go to the next slide? Okay, so the objectives of my talk are, uh, first, I'll just uh, talk about how to successfully interpret pediatric ankle and foot x-rays, and I'll be reviewing uh, some imaging, imaging findings of some of the common pediatric ankle and foot traumatic and painful pathologies. Next, please. Okay, so uh, for the pediatric age group, uh, what's different from the adults is the presence of the ossification centers. And so the most important thing to successfully interpret a pediatric uh, ankle and foot x-ray is to know these ossification centers, their sequence of development, their normal appearance, normal variants, and when do they actually fuse? Because you will spare yourself from calling a normal variant a, a, a pathology if you know those things. Uh, next, please. Okay. Uh, so these are, um, I'm not sure if it's showing, these are images of uh, ankles for uh, uh, children at different age groups. 
Um, so for example, the, the four months, eight months, and three years. Uh, so you can see at birth, usually uh, the distal tibia and fibula, they don't have uh, the epiphyseal ossification centers are uh, not ossified yet. So uh, yeah. And then uh, the distal tibial epiphysis starts uh, ossifying in the first year of life, followed by the distal fibular epiphysis. And at the same time, the distal tibia and fibula themselves, they increase in uh, transverse dimension. Can we go next, please? Um, so here is uh, like also older children. Sorry, let me just go to the, okay. Yeah, five years, eight years and 11. And again, you can see there is increase in the transverse dimension, increased size of the epiphyses uh, as the age, um, as they increase in, in age. Usually after five years of age on the AP view, uh, the tibia and the fibula start uh, to overlap or like they approach each other on the AP view. And then with time, they also start overlapping. Uh, okay, next please. So this is uh, the mortis view. Uh, on the mortis view, actually the overlap between the tibia and fibula uh, happens at a later age. Uh, so usually in um, females, it's like the, the, both bones, they overlap at the age 10 and in males, they overlap in 16 years. So like, look at, like if you look at this uh, x-ray and you see this uh, space as wide, this is not really pathological widening. This is normal in this uh, age group. And also the media clear space, you can see like in the younger age group, of course, um, it's very wide and it, it uh, it is still wide as they grow up, but it approaches the normal adult uh, value as they, they approach skeletal maturity. So it becomes less than four millimeters. Next, please. Okay, um, and now for a skeletal maturity or gr uh, closure of the growth plate, uh, the distal tibial uh, growth plate fuses or closes in a, like a different pattern compared to other uh, bones. Usually it starts fusing in the anterior aspect of the physis medially, and then it moves uh, medially, posteriorly, and then posteriorly. And then the last part of the physis to fuse is the uh, lateral, uh, anterior lateral aspect of the physis. So early on with the closure, the first part of uh, the physis, it forms more like an undulation. You can see, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow. Can you guys see my arrow? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so it forms an undulation and this we, it, we call it comes bump. It's important to uh, be aware of this uh, undulation because uh, this is the first part to fuse and uh, in order not to mistake it with a bony bar formation as a complication of a fracture. And you can see on the lateral X-ray, see how the first part of the, like the anterior part of the physis uh, closes first, which is the anterior medial part of the physis. Next, please. Okay, sorry, that's my daughter. Okay, and these are images for uh, the foot also in different uh, children. So at birth, the only uh, tarsal bones that are ossified are the uh, talus, uh, calcaneum, and the cuboid. And then in the first year of life, uh, the navicular bones start ossifying. Um, the last uh, tarsal bone to ossify, sorry, I mean the cuneiforms start ossifying. And the last tarsal bone to ossify is the navicular bone. Uh, it usually starts ossifying between uh, two to five uh, years of age. And then of course with age, the, like the size of all the um, um, tarsal bones and the metaphyses and phalanges increase. Next, please. Okay. So for trauma, the difference between adult and children is the presence of uh, physis. Um, so uh, the physis is actually the weak link in the pediatric skeleton. So injuries that an adult can cause um, uh, uh, ligamentous injury, ligamentous tear or fractures in children, they usually cause injury to the uh, physis and the growth centers, including also the apophyses. Mm -hmm. Next. So I'll start now with the showing cases and showing their imaging findings and then discuss uh, um, the, basically the uh, different entities. So the first case is a 21 month old uh, female uh, baby uh, presented with trauma. So uh, we are presented with uh, AP, mortis and lateral ankle x-rays. As you can see, there is an oblique fracture line extending from the medial aspect of the distal tibial epiphysis into the growth plate. Um, so um, this is, and there is no significant widening of the physis, uh, no other fractures seen. The ankle alignment is maintained. Um, next, please. 
So this is a distal tibial Salter Harris II fracture. Next. Uh, so as you all know, Salter Harris uh, uh, is a classification criteria of uh, growth plate injury in the pediatric age group. There are five types of the Salter Harris uh, uh, fracture. Type number one is physial widening, and this is really not a, um, a, a radiological diagnosis. It can be very subtle on x-rays. Typically, they present with tenderness, and it's more like clinical diagnosis. Uh, type two is a uh, physial widening injury through the physis with, uh, sorry, this is type one, and type two injury of the physis with extension into the uh, metaphysis. Type three is injury of the physis with extension through the epiphysis. And type four is a fracture line extending through the epiphysis and uh, metaphysis. Type five is a compression or crush injury of the uh, physis. So of course, different mechanisms of injury, depending on how uh, the foot was uh, uh, positioned at the time of injury, they result in different fracture mechanisms and there are different uh, classification criteria, which I will not go through. This is very clinical. Uh, for imaging, uh, usually with the Salter Harris uh, fractures, uh, x-rays are sufficient for the diagnosis and uh, deciding the management. So for uh, the ankle, we do the three uh, planes, the three, I mean, uh, imaging views, AP, lateral and mortis views. Not frequently we use the weight-bearing views uh, for the ankle imaging. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging is only used if a patient is presenting with the prolonged symptoms and the x-rays are still negative. So we want to look for occult fracture and also if we need um, cross-sectional imaging for pre-operative pl uh, planning. Uh, for the, the Salter Harris 3, which is the epiphyseal uh, fracture, and 4, uh, fracture through, th through the epiphysis and metaphysis, there is increased risk of uh, complications. Most importantly are growth arrest, deformity, and degenerative joint disease. So for growth arrest, basically we'll be looking on imaging uh, on, uh, to, uh, we'll be seeing a focal uh, narrowing of the growth plate, and uh, we can see also bridging of the bone meaning that the, the physis has closed in this area, which, which is known as uh, bony bar formation. This results uh, in, in the younger age group, uh, it results in, it has a very bad like complications or ramifications, including leg length discrepancy and angular deformity. Uh, so uh, it's important also to differentiate between the bar, bar formation versus the expected fusion, because uh, as you remember, we said that the physis actually starts fusing in the, in the medial aspect of the, uh, distal tibia. So at one point of the growth, there is irregular physis as a normal uh, growth. So basically, uh, the, the, the most important thing to dif for differentiation is the age. We know that the age of uh, this fusion, the, the normal fusion of the tibia, usually between 12 to 18 years. In, in females, 12 to 14, and in males, 14 to 18 years. So uh, any uh, like uh, focal narrowing of the physis earlier than that uh, should raise the suspicion of uh, bony bar formation. Next, please. Okay. So case number two is 11 year old female, um, a history of trauma. Okay, uh, so we can see here as uh, there is a fracture line extend there, extending through the epiphysis, extending into the articular surface. And uh, as you can see on the lateral X-ray, there is a widening of the physis, focal widening of the physis, and another fracture line extending through the uh, metaphysis. So this is a Salter Harris uh, four fracture. Can I go next? Or what is known as triplane fracture. Next. Uh, case number three, a 15 year old male, uh, also history of trauma. So here we see there is a displaced fracture in the uh, distal tibial epiphysis. Please note that the physis has almost completely fused in this patient, so he's at an older age. And then we have a, a fracture through the physis and the epiphysis with displacement of the fracture fragment. Um, you can see it here, part of the fracture fragment is displaced. So it's displaced anterolaterally, and there is an addition an undisplaced distal fibular fracture that is best seen on the lateral view. The ankle mortis is uh, preserved, uh, is congruent. Next. So this is a Salter Harris III fracture or uh, what's known as juvenile tilo fracture. Next, please. So the, uh, juvenile, the triplane fracture and the tilo fracture are really transitional fractures. They usually occur in the uh, like older children, in the adolescents. Uh, they occur in the at the time of the uh, physis closure. 
So early in the physis closure, typically triplane fractures happen, while in the later phases of the physis closure, tilo fractures uh, are, happen more frequently. And because they, these fractures happen close to the physis, uh, like in the, in the time where the, the physis closes, really there is no significant growth arrest uh, related to those fractures, unlike the fractures that happen in, a, in the younger age group. So for the triplane fracture, as we mentioned previously, it is a Salter Harris type four fracture. Typically there is a coronal plane of the fracture in the posterior metaphysis, and then the fracture line runs in the transverse plane in the physis, and then goes through the epiphysis in the sagittal plane, hence the name triplane fracture. Uh, usually it is uh, uh, the classification criteria uh, divides it uh, according to the number of frag fragments uh, resulting. So two fragments versus three fracture fragments, or more comminuted uh, four fracture fragments. Uh, uh, typically for the triplane fracture, we typically use a CT sometimes if there is a lot of distraction and basically mainly for the preoperative uh, planning. And it's important to point uh, to always pay attention for the articular surface gap because if there is a large articular surface gap and uh, step deformity, this will uh, uh, of course change the management. And for the tilo fracture, it is a Salter Harris three fracture of the anterior lateral uh, tibial physis because this part of the physis, as we mentioned uh, before, is the last part to close in the physis. So it, it is the weak point. So uh, usually the mechanism of injury is will be uh, that the ankle will be an external rotation, and the ATFL is stronger than the, the will be stronger than this part of the physis that is not closed. So it will avulse the. Uh, epiphysis resulting in the um, Salter Harris three fracture. Um, again, CT scan is uh, a lot of the time often uh, requested, requested or done to uh, aid in uh, preoperative planning. And again, we should look, uh, we should measure the articular surface gap and look for uh, step deformity. Next. Okay, case uh, four. Um, an eight-year-old male presented with chronic ankle pain. Okay, so uh, the x-ray here shows um, a loosened subchondral or subchondral uh, bone defect seen in, uh, along the lateral aspect of the uh, Taller dome. Um, we don't see uh, any, I, don't, I didn't put the other images, but there were no um, loose bodies. We don't see any uh, loose bodies in the joint space. And you can see there is irregular appearance uh, of the medial malleolus, but there is no overlying soft tissue swelling. This is a nice example of uh, uh, normal variant uh, ossification of the apophysis. Apophys apophysial uh, ossification centers can be very irregular in children for the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. So it's always important to correlate to the clinical uh, findings. Next, please. So the MRI of this patient is showing, again, the subchondral uh, lucent, sorry, the subchondral uh, lesion. Um, it is, uh, you can see that there is, this is a T2, the first uh, study, yes, there is, it's a T2. So we can see a thin, hyper-intense and the hypo-intense line, uh, and then the lucent lesion or the hyper-intense lesion. And then there is surrounding bone marrow edema and remainder of the talus. And on the lateral uh, X-ray, the lateral stir X-ray, we see the same lesion. Basically, we use both views to measure the size of the lesion. And the last uh, MRI sequence is um, a cartilage sequence. This is a 3D disc. And basically, we use this sequence to assess the cartilage to see if there is, you can see that the subchondral bone plate is actually disrupted anteriorly and posteriorly, but the articular cartilage, we don't see uh, obvious defect on the overlying cartilage. We don't see as well, uh, I'll talk about it in the next slide, the um, MR criteria for instability. Can we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, yeah, the diagnosis is Teller dome osteochondral lesion, or previously known as uh, osteochondritis desiccans. Next. Okay, so osteochondral lesions are characterized by uh, necrosis of the bone, followed by uh, bone reossification and healing. Uh, the etiology of which is really, um, it's not 100% certain. There are different, uh, etio different uh, theories as to what causes it, but uh, uh, most people uh, agree that it is the result of repetitive microtrauma. Uh, and in more than 50% of the cases, there is a history of acute trauma prior to uh, the presentation. 
Um, it is common in the adolescents. So the most commonly it happens in 10 to like age group 10 to 20 years. It's more common in males and we see it more in athletes. Presentation, it can go asymptomatic for many years. Uh, other types of, uh, it can present with pain that is aggravated by exercise, swelling, or like chronic pain, and if it can present with locking, and in this case, we should really look for loose bodies. So imaging, um, again, x-ray, you can see the uh, subchondral lucency. Of course, the commonest place, as you all know, is the knee. Uh, the ankle is not one of the, it is uh, not the commonest place, but it, we see it often. Um, so for the x-ray, we mentioned there is the hypo, the hypodense line, subchondral hypodense line, uh, and you can see either a slightly displaced or a completely displaced uh, uh, lesion. Uh, MRI is mainly used uh, for assessing uh, for stability of the lesion. You want to look for if, if the lesion is stable versus unstable. The MRI criteria for assessment of instability include presence of fluid-filled cleft between the fragment and the underlying bone. The, the, the presence of cleft means that actually the, the fragment is uh, almost detached, which means it's unstable. Um, if the overlying cartilage is disrupted, if presence of loose bodies, and if there are perilesional cysts, usually more than five millimeters, multiple lesions, multiple perilesional cysts uh, increase, are seen with more with unstable lesions. Um, there is a recent research uh, by Maya Patel et al. They actually suggested that uh, the most uh, important or the mo uh, criteria for assessing of instability is the regional skeletal maturity. So if the child is uh, more closer to being uh, skeletally mature or older age, uh, uh, the risk of being unstable increases. So the younger age group, their lesions are typically more stable. Next, please. Okay, case number five is 11 year old male presented with chronic bilateral feet pain. Okay, so um, we don't see any fractures. Alignment looks normal on the AP view. Um, I mean, there is a little bit of widening of the anterior aspect of the navicular, but it's not super obvious on the AP view. On the lateral view, we can see that there is uh, elongation of the anterior calcaneal process bilaterally associated with irregular articular surfaces and a little bit of sclerosis. Similar findings are also seen on the subjacent uh, navicular. So, so the articulation between navicular and the uh, calcaneum is narrowed with these uh, sclerotic irregular changes. Next. So this is a calcaneum navicular coalition and uh, it's not, it is uh, of the fibrocartilaginous type because the bones are not fused. Next, 13-year-old male, right midfoot pain. Okay, so uh, on the AP view, we can see that there is increased uh, anterior telocalcaneal angle on the right side, and there is also some bony uh, prominence along the lateral aspect of the talus. On the lateral view of the right side, you can see that there is more like, uh, a, a, like anterior tel tibial, sorry, teller beaking some soft tissue swelling, and um, I'm not sure why, yeah, we can see also the complete C sign or the complete C sign uh, compared to the contralateral side where we see it's not a complete C sign, there is interruption, there is lucency here, and the anterior aspect of the talus looks normal without any beaking. So this is a case of a right talocalcaneal collision. Sorry, I forgot to mention that also there is you can, you can appreciate the flattening of the foot arch on the right side compared to the left side. So typically this will present with more like a flat foot deformity. Okay, so tarsal coalition, it means a congenital fusion of two or more tarsal bones. The fusion can happen uh, at a later age at, for many different reasons, including trauma, infection, or instrumentation. But the term coalition is usually uh, reserved for the congenital fusion of the tarsal bones. The fusion can be osseous, cartilaginous, or fibrous. The most common subtypes are the calcaneonavicular and telonavicular, uh, almost 45% each. Uh, although they are congenital fusions, typically they present in uh, adolescents, and they are more common in males. And why they present in adolescents? Because 
um, the as with the skeletal maturity, with the uh, the um, ossification of the bones, more like uh, it becomes more rigid, and so uh, the, like the fusion between the bones, and so the presentation happens at a later age. It's uh, bilateral in uh, fifty percent of the cases, and it can present with recurrent sprains, midfoot pain, and limited subtalar uh, motion. In addition, oftentimes they present with spat spastic flat foot. For the Calcanian Navicular Coalition, again, said 45% of the cases, um, the best radiograph to diagnose the Calcanian Navicular Coalition is the oblique foot x-ray. And we, as uh, we mentioned, we, you will see the, the elongation, the widening, and the sclerosis of the uh, anterior um, calcaneum and the subjacent navicular. Um, and on the lateral x-ray, sometimes you can see the elongation of the uh, anterior calcaneal process. And it is it looks similar to the anteater nose sign. Um, the CT and the MRI are, are helpful in confirming the diagnosis. And also, um, can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, on MRI, uh, so it helps us also in uh, uh, looking for secondary findings uh, of uh, calcaneo navicular coalition, which include bone marrow edema at both uh, sides of the coalition, and sometimes cystic changes. Um, yeah, basically these are the most important. And of course, the, the elongation and the irregularity and the narrowing of the joint space and uh, the um, uh, subchondral sclerosis. This patient is an interesting case because he presented at eight years of age for a totally different uh, reason. Uh, and then we notice that there is more like a hypo, this is um, a T2 or stair uh, image. So there is hypo intense tissue between the calcaneum and the navicular. The anterior, the calcaneal process is not necessarily uh, elongated at this uh, stage, but there is this tissue, which on the cartilage sequence shows uh, cartilage um, uh, characteristics. So it was suggestive of a calcaneo navicular coalition, but there was really nothing to suggest uh, more like a biomechanical stress related to that, uh, the coalition. Three years later, you can see there with the progressive maturity of the bones and the ossification, there is now uh, elongation that that part that was cartilaginous has ossified. There is elongation of the anterior calcaneal process and bone marrow edema at the Taylor side and the, and the navicular side with uh, some irregularity uh, indicating. And then, okay, on the, on the axial view, you can see also the widening of the uh, articulation. So, uh, and at this age, he, the patient was presenting with pain, uh, chronic pain related to the calcaneal navicular coalition. For the tail calcaneal coalition, it is also um, one of the commonest uh, types of coalition. Um, typically, uh, most commonly, it happens along uh, the coalition happens along the middle facet of the septalar joint, but it can involve any of the three uh, uh, facets of the septalar joint. Uh, on the lateral X-ray, we can see the uh, C sign, and you can see it here nicely. So basically, complete C sign. Uh, and you can see the teller beak sign. We don't see it always, but it is uh, when it's seen, it, uh, it can raise the suggestion of, uh, along with the complete C sign, it can raise the suge suggestion of Taylor Calcaneal Coalition. This is another case of a Taylor Calcaneal Coalition. Actually, this was a complete fusion, complete bony fusion between the two bones. And it, this is a much younger patient. He was actually a syndromic patient. He had a multiple. Um, skeletal uh, abnormalities, including the complete fusion of the uh, talus and uh, calcaneum. Next, please. And again, for the CT, again, we see the same CT and MRI, we see the same findings. There is widening of the uh, middle facet in this patient with sclerosis and ir irregularity and some cystic changes on the CT. And similarly, we see bone marrow edema on MRI with widening and irregularity. Uh, so this is a coronal, and the, the middle one is the sag plane. You can see the edema and the significant approximation of the bones with almost loss of the joint space. And the last uh, sequence on the right is uh, the cartilage sequence. And you can see there is loss of the cartilage in the uh, area of the uh, an appro like, uh, approximate, like uh, almost bony fusion in the area of the uh, coalition. Next. So cases seven and eight, a four-year-old male and seven-year-old female, both of them present with right midfoot pain. 
Okay, so the four-year-old, I'll just show the x-rays of four-year-old. We can see uh, the navicular uh, ossification center is sclerotic on the right side compared to a normal uh, ossification center on the left. Otherwise, the foot x-ray looks unremarkable on both sides. Okay, uh, for the seven-year-old, unfortunately, I didn't have an x-ray, so that's why I had to show both patients. Um, we can see that the navicular ossification center, maybe this is the best, uh, like the SAGE sequence, is narrowed, is small, thinned, I mean, let's say thinned, and it's very hypo-intense in comparison to remainder of the bones. And on the T1, it's nicely seen that the first image on the left, uh, it's very hypo-intense. Typically, bone marrow um, should be bright. Within, uh, within six months of development of the secondary ossification center, you should see it bright because it, it has fatty marrow. So this is dark on both T1, T2, and the cartilage sequence. So the diagnosis is a navicular a AVN or osteochondrosis. Next, yeah. So um, navicular osteo, it's uh, chondrosis or Coiler's disease. It's an osteonecrosis of the navicular bone. Uh, this disease is a self-limiting. Usually it presents with pain, but uh, treated with uh, wrist and it resolves spontaneously. Uh, as most of the other osteochondroses or osteonecrosis, the etiology is incompletely understood, but uh, people favor that uh, in this uh, bone, in navicular bone, it's related to vascular incident, uh, specifically because the navicular bone is the last bone to ossify in the tarsal bones. Um, it's commoner in younger children, four to six years, males more than females, and typically they present with pain and swelling. On the x-ray, we see thinning and fragmentation of the navicular ossification center, sclerosis, plus minus soft tissue swelling. We should keep in mind, though, that normally the, nav the navicular ossification center can be fragmented. But the sclerosis typically is not a normal finding in a developing uh, navicular. So the sclerosis uh, tells you more that it is suggestive of um, uh, uh, like osteonecrosis. And one more thing is uh, usually uh, the uh, the patchy appearance of the navicular happens as a normal development happens at a younger age, between two to four, while the, uh, the osteochondrosis typically it happens in older children, but still, still young, young enough until seven, eight years. For MRI, as we mentioned, uh, early on, uh, you would see a low signal on T1, high signal on T2, indicating edema, and later on, you will see low signal on T1 and T2, indicating uh, necrosis. Next. This is the last case. Um, sorry, am I good on time or should I stop? No, no, you, you, you can go. Okay. So a 12-year-old female, she presented with left forefoot pain. Um, so as you can see on the x-ray, there is flattening of the second metatarsal head associated with the sclerosis. Um, on the MRI, we can see this is a cartilage sequence. Uh, there is a mixed signal intensity of the uh, second metatarsal head uh, and mainly bright high, high signal. And on T1, there is low signal of the metatarsal head. And T2, there is high signal with irregularity and flattening, indicating there is a decreased uh, blood supply or osteonecrosis to the region. Next. So this is Freiburg disease. So Freiberg disease is another osteochondrosis uh, happening in the uh, foot region. It most commonly happens in the second metatarsal head, less likely third and fourth metatarsal head. It happens in more older age group in adolescents, 10 to 14 years, and it's more common in females. Etiology is also not well understood. One of the suggested etiologies is uh, overuse and also uh, the use of high heels. Um, and again, uh, we saw the imaging findings on X-ray and MRI, mainly the flattening sclerosis. Sometimes you get subchondral cystic changes and uh, fragmentation. And uh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hepa, for this very illustrative presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a question for you from one of our colleagues, Dr. Adnan El Mofleh from El Yemen. Uh, Dr. Adnan is saying that uh, tarsal coalition can be diagnosed after 25 years old? Uh, theoretically, it can be diagnosed. If it wasn't treated, it can be diagnosed at that stage. And maybe uh, the symptoms were not 
يعني strong enough to uh, indicate imaging earlier than that. So yes, definitely be, it can be. Okay. Thank I have so one much. question. Yeah. Yes, please, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, what about the level of the fibular physis in pediatric age regarding fibular shortening? Uh, is this a sharp demarcation that we know that uh, fibular physis uh, got a line with the Taylor, uh, Taylor surface or through the ankle joint or the distal, uh, uh, distal tibial physis to diagnose um, the fibular shorts? So, um... I'm unaware, usually it's just by looking at it, but honestly, I'm not aware of the, a specific measurement for assessing uh, like uh, if the fibula, usually it's at the same level, it's, it's lower, normally it's lower in liver than the distal tibia. This is the normal uh, anatomy, but uh, honestly, I'm unaware of measurement. There might be that I don't know about it. So we, we have another question, uh, Dr. Heba. Uh, how to know the cartilage sequence radiology? Oh, uh, so uh, when you look at it, when to, to know the cartilage sequence, how to know it? Yeah. Is this okay, yeah. so the, most, the, simple, the simplest way to, to do that is the cartilage sequence, uh, um, basically um, only the cartilage appears bright, but everything else is suppressed. So you look at the bones, Everything, the soft tissues, everything is almost black. The only thing that is bright is the cartilage. But of course, if there is edema, you'll see a little bit of high signal intensity, but your uh, clue is to look at the bones in general. If they are very dark and the soft tissues and only the cartilage is bright, you know you are looking at a cartilage sequence. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Heba, okay. for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. so much. And sorry for all the technical- No, 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 no problem at all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we will move to uh, our next speaker, Professor Brad Peterson. Uh, Professor Brad will speak about Les Frank injuries. Professor Brad, you are with us, sir. <clears throat> thank you. I'm here. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> hoping everybody can hear me. Uh, yes. Sir. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Prof Kishta, and thank you to uh, the Bena Faculty of Medicine for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, I know it's late for everybody, um, and so I'll try and be. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and get things going here. So I'm going to share my screen uh, here. And I'm talking uh, tonight about Lisfranc frank injuries. Um, and is that okay? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. So I do, uh, I work at the Hamilton General Hospital at McMaster University. Um, and I do trauma, mainly trauma, and I do a foot and ankle. My, my practice is split between trauma and foot and ankle reconstruction. And they're, they're a nice uh, marriage together because a lot of foot and ankle reconstruction is post-traumatic. Um, and I don't know about where you guys are, where we are, a lot of people don't like doing foot and ankle reconstruction. So, <laughs> so that's what I, uh, I went to. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, not a little bit, we're going to talk about Liz Frank. I, I, I always like to um, um, understand. Are we okay? Everybody can hear me? We can hear you clear. Okay, all right. So, um, uh, so who, who was Liz Frank? And I guess everybody probably knows Liz Frank, but these stories go rampant. Uh, so he was a French surgeon at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. He wasn't Napoleon's surgeon, but he was a surgeon. And he was actually a gynecologist. And so he described the surgical resection of the rectum for rectal carcinoma, amputation of the cervix uteri, and he's become eponymously known and affiliated with the Lys Frank joint when he described an amputation through this joint in 1815. So it's interesting to me, and I think it's kind of funny. Um, he studied under de Puitren, but the thing that's funny to me is it says in Wikipedia, as you'll all go back and search it, that he was filled with controversy and rage towards Velpo. What Velpo did to him back in the day, it would be interesting for me to find out. I have no idea. But on his gravestone, his epitaph reads, surgery is bright when operating, but it is still brighter when there is no blood and mutilation and leads to the patient's recovery. So that's on his tombstone in France. 
And uh, I just thought it was uh, interesting. I, I, I wonder what fills a surgeon with rage and controversy towards some guy of Velpo. And Velpo, now we know about different x-ray views and slings, et cetera. So of course, Liz Frank's joint is the, the metatarsal tarsal joint uh, involving the three medial cuneiforms and the cuboid as well as the metatarsals. And um, when you look at the x-rays, uh, Typically, I'm not going to go into big radiology depth, but typically the second metatarsal should line up with its middle cuneiform here, as you can see my pointer, I think you can see my pointer. Typically, the space between the medial cuneiform and the base of the second metatarsal should be less than two millimeters equal to the other side. If we go to the oblique view, so we want a 30 degree oblique view. The third metatarsal should line up with its middle, its lateral cuneiform, and the fourth metatarsal should line up with the cuboid here. So those are the, th the, th the three things that really need to line up and stand up on regular views for all the residents that are in the audience. On the lateral view, there should be a nice straight line between the, the cuboids and the metatarsals as it comes down. And you can see down here, there's a step. So that shouldn't be there. And again, you can bring about Miri's angles in terms of the Taylor angle here being in line with the metatarsal as well. It's just another thing to look at when you're looking at the radiology, at least for, um, for those of us who are learning about Liss Frank injuries. Now, clearly here's a case of a Liss Frank disruption. And you can see that everything uh, to our a, a nod and a hat off to our radiology colleagues. There's lots of arrows here uh, that show us that the uh, um, the Liss Frank ligament, the, the Liss Frank uh, joint is clearly disrupted on all fronts. But we'll come back to that in a second. So you can see that again, nothing lines up with the cuneo the cuboids, or the cuneiforms. Nothing lines up with the cuboid. The third is not lining up with anything. The first is off. There's a nice big step on the lateral, etc. And again, if we get a 3D reconstruction, then you can, you can see that everything is off. And we'll come back to that a, li a little bit later. Now, the anatomy of the Lisfranc ligament is known a little bit more, and it's a little bit more involved. So for the residents in the audience, um, it's a little bit more involved than it seems to be, as I remember studying for it a number of years ago. But there, this is the cuneiform, and this is the second metatarsal. So we're looking at a cut. Here's the me medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal base. And so we're taking a cut right across there. You can see that black line. So there's a dorsal component to the ligament. There's an interosseous component to the ligament and there's a plantar component. And the plantar component is actually broken up into the base of the second metatarsal attachment and actually a base of the third metatarsal attachment. And so there are questions that arise on exams throughout the world, OIDs and Canadian fellowship exams, and I suspect uh, exams in Egypt about what piece of the Lisfranc ligament is bigger or smaller, et cetera. So just some things to keep in mind, the dorsal is the smallest, the interosseous is the biggest, and the plantar is in between. So the, the plantar is twice the size of the dorsal and the interosseous is twice the size of the plantar. So I kind of think of it as one to two to four even, uh, if we think about what ligament. And if you think about the old studies that looked at the ligaments, they really just talked about dorsal and plantar. And I think they, they lumped that interosseous and the plantar together. So remember the dorsal is weak, the plantar is next strongest and the interosseous is the biggest, it's the thickest. Um, so if you sequentially cut these ligaments, what actually happens? So here again is the cuneiform, first cuneiform or the medial cuneiform and the metatarsals bases. They have, there's attachments there. So the Lisfranc ligaments goes to both. And also remember there's intercuneiform ligaments. So this group has sectioned the ligaments and what they identify is what they call transverse patterns where you get a transverse shift of the metatarsals. And they also identify longitudinal patterns where not only do you get a break between the base of the metatarsal and the cuneiform, but you get intercuneiform widening as well. And so those are important things to think about. So one of the things that when you, the exam questions ask to get a transverse pattern where you get lateralization of your second metatarsal, what needs to happen? Well, these guys who did the study say, you actually have to section the interosseous between the cuneiform and the metatarsal and the 
the cuneiform metatarsal um, plantar ligaments to get that transverse sliding. So you need to resect all of that. You need to section all of that. And then you get instability. To get the longitudinal pattern, you need that, plus you need sectioning of the cuneiform inter, inter osseae ligaments. So you can actually have different variations of this transverse pattern, longitudinal pattern, involvement of the interosseal cuneiforms, as well as the bases of the metatarsal. Now, they also did this sectioning and identified the differences between injury-specific abduction stress radiographs and weight-bearing weighted radiographs. And what they identified was that maybe weight-bearing radiographs aren't good enough to pick up all the subtle injuries. And I think we've noticed that. I think Dr. Alassiri and I have noticed that in the clinic, weight bearing may not pick up everything. And that's why 20 to 40% of these can be missed oftentimes in, in um, emergency rooms. Um, and I've been doing, according to, as well as uh, what this study has showed, but I've been doing injury specific abduction stress views. So I'll get in there if I'm worried and put my hands on the foot and stress them into abduction, stress them both ways, get my thumb right in between the first and second intermetatarsal space and push hard to see if there's anything there. So I don't rely on weight-bearing x-rays completely. Now, I will get weight-bearing x-rays if I'm doing bilateral foot and I wanna see if there's any significant differences and I wanna look at the other side. So that is when I will get weight-bearing x-rays. However, I do put my hands on the patient a lot more for stress x-rays, especially if I'm worried about it and I'm unsure. Obviously for the big ones that are quite displaced, you don't need any of this stuff, um, but these are for the subtle ones. Now for the residents, again, there's, uh, there's classifications and this is the hard castle and the Cormac classification or the hard castle classification, uh, which is sort of a classic one that's discussed. It's actually a modified Chenu and Coos classification. And it talks about type A incongruity and partial incongruity and complete divergent. I'm putting it up here for historical reasons. We tend not to use it, to be honest. It doesn't seem to be prognostic for some reason, and it doesn't really guide our treatment. The, re the main reason it doesn't guide treatment is because treatment is predicated on making the joint anatomic, period. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so I don't, and I also don't think it guides prognosis. The thing that guides prognosis more, we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, you do need to know kind of the names of Hardcastle and the, the classification. And again, Mark Meyerson, who's the probably one of the biggest, bigger names in the foot and ankle world, rejigged the Hardcastle classification. It looks pretty similar to be honest with you, but they added a few more subgroups uh, within the Hardcastle. So this is the modified Hardcastle and it's Meyerson's classification. Um, and I mention it because it's there. I tend not to use it, to be honest with you. But what do you think, what do we think we know about Lisfranc frank injuries in general? Well, we know that prognosis, poor outcomes are associated with Lisfranc ligamentous injuries. Poor outcomes are associated with compensation claims like all auto orthopedics. And poor outcomes are associated with the delay in diagnosis. So once you get a delay in diagnosis, and you start to get some plainness within the foot and all that sort of stuff, it becomes much more difficult to correct. And anywhere from 20 to 40% can be missed in emergency rooms. And I don't know about you guys, but I still see people coming in uh, with injuries that are Liz Frank injuries that may not have been picked up. Now, what else do we think we know? Anatomic reduction is arguably key um, and a two millimeter rule. So you know, I think of evidence-based medicine as a form of epistemology. You know, how do we know what we know? Well, two millimeters comes from uh, really this study that Mark Meyerson published in 1986, and it's a retrospective review. They did the usual log logistic regression analysis and identified, in fact, that two millimeters is probably the number um, that is prognostic of some degree of development of arthritis. And that's why two millimeters is usually the number that people will, will pull the trigger and operate. And I don't know about your group, but our group is pretty aggressive. And even if there's subtle instabilities there, a lot of us are still taking the patient to the operating room because um, operating for subtle instabilities is, very, is not a huge deal and you can often do it minimally invasively, but we'll get to that in a bit. But these are some of the things we think we know about Lisfranc injuries. Now, 
What is the standard? I don't know. Um, fixing and fusing has been uh, sort of um, the, the controversy over the past number of years. And this controversy stems back to the 50s and 60s. They were arguing about fixing and fusing things. But what is the paper that really, and, and so those, that's a controversy. What other the controversies? Well, do we use screws? Do we use plates? What about the flexible fixation and mini tightrope? I don't know if you guys have been experimenting with mini tightropes, I have, uh, or do we fuse it? And if we're gonna fuse it, how do you fuse it? Do you use screws, do you use plates? Do we have the answer? I don't think we do, but we'll talk about it anyway. So this study by Lyon Cotier in 2006 really pushed the, the discussion away from fixing to primary fusion. And you go to any meeting after 2006, the big question was, are you fusing it? Are you fusing it? Are you fusing it? And I personally never adopted the primary fusion. I did if I just couldn't reconstruct things, but I never really adopted it. And if you actually look at the trial, it was it had a, a few, some methodology flaws in it, and it used some outcome measures that really weren't validated for what they were trying to show. They identified a clear difference though. They said that fusion was better, but the numbers were really low. And one study doesn't make everything. So when we look at this, we should look at the totality of the evidence. And Smith, Craig Stone and Andrew Fury uh, they're all out in Newfoundland in the east end of Canada. And in fact, Andrew Fury is the, is the premier of Newfoundland now. He's gone into politics. He's still a really good orthopedic surgeon. Um, but they looked at a meta-analysis looking at the trials. And as you can see down at the bottom, there really are only three trials that have looked at this. And what do all of the trials show? Well, if we look at the forest plots from all of them, this line is the line of no difference, okay? So forest plots, these are the individual studies, and this diamond represents the cumulative data. So when you look at all of the data in these three trials, if you fix them, it results in more hardware removal, clearly, right? Because most people protocol taking the hardware out. But if you look at the functional evidence, the functional values, so this is the AOFAS or Baltimore Painful Foot Cyst score, shows no difference between the two. Uh, this is another functional outcome score um, that shows uh, uh, whether or not you can obtain an anatomic reduction, shows no difference between the two, no differences in functional outcomes. And actually, if you exclude hardware removal, there's no difference in revision procedures between the two of fusion or fixation. So that's sort of the latest evidence on fixing versus fusion. It seems there's not a lot of difference between the two, and it seems there's not a lot of difference between functional outcomes. So now, what does this one show us? This included not only randomized trials, but prospective cohorts and retrospective case series. Uh, and again, there was really no difference between fixing them or fusing them. And so really at this stage, it's still dealer's choice. And my personal bias is if I can fix it, I'm going to fix it because, um, you know, if they have problems, then I can get the hardware out. If they have problems, I still have the next step. Do you know what I mean? And, um, but I'm not seeing those problems, to be honest with you. We, we do see, we certainly do see post-traumatic arthritic change, but it seems to be reasonably tolerated in this joint. And we can talk about that after if we have time. Again, revision surgery was really no different between the two groups. And the only different stuff was hardware removal. So in those that you fix, most people protocol taking them out. I don't, I only take it out if it bugs people. Now, this was interesting. They looked at the surgical trends in the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery certifying exam database. So if you guys know anything about the ortho boards, they all pit pull cases and then they go through them and they get grilled on their cases. It's different than the Canadian system. It's different than the British system or I, I suspect your system, but maybe not. But anyway, the orange is the treatment of list frank injuries with ORIF, and the blue is the treatment of, or, of, of list frank injuries with uh, primary arthrodesis. And you can see that most people 
continue to treat with ORIF, at least in the States anyway. And I would argue uh, most people within the Canadian Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society would treat with an ORIF. We have this conversation, everybody has the argument, but most people tend to swing towards open reduction internal fixation. So this is kind of interesting um, that even though that run where RCT came out, it didn't necessarily change people's practice. Now, what about screws versus plates? The data is very, very limited. But this study looked at list frank fixation techniques and functional outcomes and really identified that there were only two trials, very low numbers, methodologic issues within the trials, using the AOFAS foot score, which arguably maybe shouldn't be used. But they identified, in fact, that there may be higher functional scores with plate fixation versus screws. Is that real? I don't know. My personal bias has been moving more and more to plates, but we'll talk about that after. So what about techniques? So the literature would tell us that fix it or fuse it, the functional outcomes are pretty equivalent, but that's only two-year data. We don't know down the line how it goes. Um, what do we use, plates or screws? So which incisions, which screws, what about plates? So here's our patient again with the Lisfranc injury. The I'm going to talk about the classic way to fix it. And then I'm going to talk about how I fix it. So the classic way to fix it is sort of two incisions, one in line with the second metatarsal, one in line with the third metatarsal. And the principles of fixation are progress from medial to lateral, rigid anatomic medial fixation, flexible lateral fixation anatomic. And there's one key tip when you have a big dislocation like this, even though you wanna fix medial to lateral, or at least I, I argue fix medial to lateral in principle, you will not be able to get a reduction here until this fourth cuboid is reduced. It often hangs up because the arch it often hangs up when it's dorsally dislocated on the lateral aspect of the cuneiform. And it's, you can't reduce your midfoot until that drops down and gets in, in line. And then things come back. I had a case just like that three days ago. I was fixing it. It's not, nothing's going. Get a Howard, a Holman elevator, a Holman in between or a Howarth. Drop that, shoehorn that fourth down, and then everything falls back and then do your medial to lateral fixation. Now, these are the classic incisions using your Lisfranc screw for, I would go usually from the medial cuneiform, dorsal, distal to, to, sorry, proximal plantar to dorsal distal in the second metatarsal. But I've changed how I do that. Uh, now I like to go from the second metatarsal down into the, uh, navicular, I think it's easier to get your spot on the second metatarsal, um, and it's easier to get compression, standard AO compression clamp across the two. Uh, this is extensor digital uh, halixis brevis. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's classic, okay? And that was what you'll see in some textbooks. Now, Paul Ternetta, a number of years ago at the Orthopedic Trauma Association, presented this study that says, move your incision a little bit more lateral. Move it all along the lateral border of the second metatarsal, or I even go along the border of the third metatarsal. Why? Because it gives you, it takes you away from that extensor halysis brevis. It allows you to find your neurovascular triangle better. It allows you to isolate your flexor tendons better, your extensor tendons better, and get down into the joint. It gets better exposure of the second and third metatarsals. And then if you need it, you can do a medial incision to do your medial plating if you need it. So then you don't need it. And you can often just do the fourth and fifth percutaneously if you need to, as long as you remember what I said before. So again, I take the incision a bit more lateral here, and then you're nicely in this plane. It makes it look like it's over here, but it's not. I'm telling you, go over here, and then you'll be able to identify this. Now, if I just come out of this um, sharing for a second and then reshare here, um, this is a little video that Tim Daniels and I did categorically. This was initially for Stryker back in the day. 
showing that a little bit more lateralized incision. So uh, is it playing? Oh, you can't see yeah. it. Is it just green? Yes, it's green. We can see it, sir. You can see it? No. Ah, what's happening? Try, try to minimize the picture for a second. How do I do that? Just like the small arrow on the side, like uh, beside bars and just there with the, yeah, just beside the edge. See there's a small arrow there. I need to make. Sorry guys, where's the small arrow? Mm. That's annoying. Uh, if we try to minimize the, sometimes when you minimize the video, it actually is sharp. It's green, now it's even green on my screen. Large exposure, I just make sure that I make. Are you seeing just my face right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me find it again. I'll be two seconds. Technology is great, I think, until the moment I need it. Okay, it's playing on my screen. Let me just see what I can do here. A second, I I just simply use a very how's uh, that central okay. yeah, that's great awesome. incision. I need to make Good. a large So yeah, so we, this is the incision that I was using, and I just I used it the same the other night. You can still see it, right? Yeah. So it's a little bit more lateral. You don't have to go this lateral, and this is a cadaver, so we're going big just for demonstration purposes. Um, but you come down, you can get the cutaneous nerves that come there. Remember, there's the dorsal cutaneous branch of the, of the SPN that comes across. But this is what I like. Here, you can see your extensor tendons just here. And you can see the extensor uh, um, uh, hallux's brevis here. And so once you do that, can you see that? Now you've got a perfect example of coming down and being lateral to your triangle. The neurovascular bundle sits right in the triangle of the short extensor tendon and the EHL here. And so now you can, between this interval and this interval, you can come straight down to the bone, nothing in between, nothing there. And then you can work underneath your neurovascular bundle here and elevate and clean out the area between the cuneiform and the second metatarsal, you can nicely have space for your plate here, which I'll show you um, a plate construct um, and, and get the dissection there. And if you need to, you can make a more medial incision here and put, your dor put a sort of a dorsal medial plate on without any problem at all. Or if you're not a plater, you can get your screws in there easy enough too. That's not a problem. But your reduction here is nice and easy. And then you can even, and I did it just the other night, you can slip a little Howarth down way over here and just lever your fourth over if you need to, or even make a little small incision. So this is all I wanted to show. It just gives a really nice exposure there. And for me, in recently, um, especially in the past few years, identifying this triangle, working on the other side of it, I do that every time that I'm doing one of these big list franks. Now, not necessarily for the subtle ones or for the little ones or the minimal ones, um, but, but I still will make it often for the minimal ones. Why? Because even though they're radiographically minimal, just like the syndesmosis, there's always stuff that's flipped down in there. And you can put an AO clamp on there and crank like crazy, but there's still often stuff flipped in there. So I'll just clean it out with the Howarth if, if it's a subtle one. So uh, I'll just stop that for a second and uh, just go back to my talk, which is now off the screen. Sorry, one second. One second, one second, sorry. Um, so, 
So um, back to the technique. So this again would be a classic way to do it, right? Medial anatomic fixation. These probably should be fully threaded so you're not getting any compression through here. Fix, 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 your list frank screw um, and lateral sided fixation. But for these really bad ones, to be honest with you, I've been moving much more towards this sort of type of fixation where you get your medial plate getting nice, good reduction of your, your first MT cuneiform and then doing your plating of uh, the second metatarsal. Now, we've been using the Anchorage system uh, that's now a striker system. Doesn't matter what system that you use. Um, you know, we're a striker shop, so I have to disclose the fact that we, uh, we do have striker contracts and stuff, but it doesn't matter what plating system that you use. This is a construct that I found, personally, I like a lot um, just for those bad actors, you know, when everything's off, you need really good stability. We're still not violating the joint. Um, you can still drop a regular list Frank screw down here. In this case, I used an endo button for uh, various reasons. I'll tell you why in a bit. And then I'm still using lateral sided or lateral border flexible fixation, which hasn't changed in 20 years, I don't think. But again, that's, this, this to me is a standard fixation strategy for the bad ones. For the ones that are more subtle, the ones where you know they come to clinic and you've just got two millimeters of second metatarsal, maybe third, fourth and fifth are okay. I've been moving a lot more towards the endo button strategy. I think it's a good flexible strategy. Some of my most non-compliant patients, I had one guy who's a videographer, he, said, he just looked at me and said, I'm walking on this, I don't care what you do. And uh, I said, okay, well, I use this strategy and I find that it's been working, but there are a couple of real technical tips and tricks we could talk about if you want to talk about it or if there are questions on that. You, you may not be, I have a colleague who laughs at me a little bit and says fixing fractures with string. I, I do think that it's a flexible joint um, and this flexible fixation I have found has been working. Sometimes I'll supplement it with this. That is based on my own anecdotes. That is not based on the literature. We don't have all the data, but the, the data is coming, but it's just not there yet. Um, but uh, I think it's good for some of the very subtle ones where you think, yeah, I wanna go in and stabilize that kind of thing. Now, what about return to sports and return to activity? Uh, there is some interesting retrospective review and Gino Kirchhoff, he's in the, the, the Netherlands, he's a big EBM guy, he does a lot of Cochrane reviews, but really at the, the end of the day, about 90% of people with bad list Frank injuries will get back to some form, form of sport and about 70 to 80% back will get to high level stuff. Interesting, actually. Uh, this study was pretty much the same and found the same results. They, people do get back to high, high energy stuff. What about hardware removal? The British Orthopedic Association looked at that and suggest that it might be 40%. In my patient population, I'm not a taker outer. I'm a, I'll take it out if it bugs you. And uh, so it's, but still probably around 30% for me. So what are the take home points? Arguably make it anatomic, make it stable, especially the, the medial and the middle columns. Suture button, I think, I think it does have an, a, a role that's coming out. Uh, but it's mainly for the subtle ones. I am not using it for the big, bad, ugly ones. I'm leaning more and more towards plate fixation for the big, bad, ugly ones. Um, and, uh, but, but classic technique screws is, is just fine. Um, but people can get back to their life, uh, I find. So I apologize if that was too long. I think it probably was. Um, but uh, thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much for uh, talking about Les Franks. Thank you so much, Professor Peterson, for this very, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have uh, one question, and I think you have already answered it, sir, the rule of suture button for Les Frank, and you have just mentioned it. Uh, another question, the rule of primary fusion in Les Frank. Yeah, um, I'm not a primary fuser uh, for various reasons. Uh, like we said, I, I think that people with fixation do functionally uh, well. Um, I think if they, uh, it, it, you know, a fusion gives me a bailout down the road, should I need it? But it's interesting, yeah, I'm not seeing all those people coming back. Who do I see people coming back with fusions? The ones that were missed, you know, the ones that weren't treated initially. I see more of those 
um, uh, than that. Now, I do see people coming back with grumbling pain. That's not to say. Uh, so I am not a primary fuser. I, I just I don't feel comfortable taking a 21 year old's primarily ligamentous injury and and fusing it. I just I just don't. And, and I'm not sure the and I think the evidence would support that. Um, uh, but but if I cannot fix it, like if it's dusted, then I will fuse it. You know what I mean? I would rather have a stable anatomic fused than something that I can't fix and leave alone and have drift off into, into you know, into um, uh, plainness and that sort of stuff. That's much more, that's much more difficult to deal with. Uh, percutaneous screw fixation. Yeah, yeah, I do. I certainly do, especially for the subtle ones. But I still feel, like I said, like with the syndesmosis, I just like to get my Howarth and sweep it around. I like to get it sweeped, swept through in between the cuneiform and the base of the metatarsal. You, you don't need a big incision. You can still do a snap incision down. I just don't feel comfortable because I know when we open it, there's always stuff in there. And so I just do a sweep, get the AO clamp on, and then I will do a perk. Now, if I'm doing it perk, I have moved away from doing it cuneiform to metatarsal. I'll make a small incision metatarsal to cuneiform. Then I can just get my perfect start point on the metatarsal. And then I've also realized that if you are doing an endo button technique, do metatarsal to cuneiform because you can really come more lateral on the metatarsal. The very first one I did, I did my usual standard and I came out way too dorsally on the metatarsal and I was really worried that it was going to pull through. So you can make a small incision, put it and the same with the screw or the tightrope, um, make it nice and lateral, get it perfect on your metatarsal and then take it out the cuneiform medially and then tighten it. The other technical trip that I've trip trick that I've learned with a tightrope is don't tie the knot on the medial side over the cuneiform. Bugs people, drives them crazy. Tie it laterally. And that's different than the operative techniques manual. So, but I, that knot is, drives them crazy um, because the mini tightrope isn't a knotless one like the ankle one is. Yes, sir. Another question, sir. The timing of surgery in Les Frank if there is major soft tissue injury and edema? Um, we tend to be going in we tend to be going in early. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not waiting two or three weeks for these. I'm not convinced that A, the evidence is there, uh, or B, um, the same issue applies uh, as a plafond. I, I just, I'm, I'm not. And because I've been moving much more to a sort of a, a little bit of a more midline single incision approach, it's, it, I haven't found it that bad. Now, if there are massive hemorrhagic blisters, obviously, okay, we'll wait it out. Yeah, I'll wait a week, or week, week, week and a half. What we found waiting things out, and and you know Jamal, Willie, you can you guys can all chime in. It's it's sometimes a bun fight. It's just a real bun fight, you know. And then then your colleague says I'm going to wait, and then three or four weeks later they show up. So I, you know, unless there's massive big hemorrhagic fracture blister, fracture blisters, sw a swelling for me isn't isn't a isn't a stop surgery. Yes, Professor Brad, one of our colleagues from Sudan, sending his greeting to you. And uh, thanks for the nice lecture, Professor Brad. What about your experience for post-operative protocol and timing for removal, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, my post-op protocol, if I've got, I'll, I'll put them in, I will put them in the usual cast for a couple of weeks. We all seem to do that as an orthopedic, you know, soft tissue swelling kind of thing, get to let them settle down. Um, the subtle ones, the subtle ones that I treat with a uh, tightrope, I'll actually get them putting weight on it with a bunion boot at two weeks. Um, you know, I, I think they can do that. Now, if the big bad, the big bad ones that I put a plate on and I'm worried, um, I can still go with a bunion boot as long as I really know that they're going to heal weight bear. Um, and it depends on a conversation with the patient. If I think they're not going to be really compliant with that, I'll just cast them six weeks and then get them weight bearing after that. The classic, the classic thing for me was eight weeks full, you know, non weight bearing, but I've been changing that. And I've been moving a little bit more to the bunion boot. If I, if I'm happy with the patient and happy with the fixation and with the tightrope, I'm weight bearing 
sooner. Now, if I have pins sticking out of the foot on the lateral side, then they're not weight bearing until I take the pins out. Yeah. The, the last question, sir, is that do you use bone graft with fusion? Yes, I do, because the ones that I'm fusing are the ones that I just, I can't fix for whatever reason. Um, and so um, they're associated with fractures, they're really common neutered. We deal with high end trauma, just like you guys do at our trauma center. So if there's bone loss, that sort of thing, then, then I'll be using graft. Uh, if they're open wounds, I won't graft acutely. You know, if they're open, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my fixation and then I'll take them back to graft. Um, but if I do a late stage fusion with good bone, bone stock and quality, you're not missing a lot of bone, then I'm not using a lot of allograft. Uh, I, we may use something like augment and that sort of thing. Uh, if the patient has poor, if the, if the patient factors are poor, smoking, diabetes and all that sort of stuff, then I'll bring in bone graft um, or bone stimulators if necessary, but not routinely. Uh, so bone graft mainly for void filling. Um, I will bring in biology if, as I say, the patient factors dictate that I should. I'm sorry, sir. We have an another questions. Can we take it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, my time is your time until you kick yeah. me off. <laughs> what about uh, what about open injury? Um, uh, what about open injury? Is that in the Q and A? Um, yeah. Where am I missing? Uh, so what's specifically about open injuries? So there's two types of open injuries in the midfoot. One is that you can cover with soft tissues uh, and one that you can't. Uh, if you cannot cover it at all, like if we have a mangled foot that's non-coverable, then we're going to go with a free flap reconstruction at the time of our reconstruction. So within, within that week, we're, uh, we're early adopters of, of reconstruction with a free flap. There's no rotational flaps that are going to do the job at all. If the tendons are exposed, they, they need a flap. Uh, if the soft tissue is covered and the tendons are covered um, and there's a little bit of ulcerations, we'll vac those and you know <clears throat> leave that. So in my books, open injuries are either soft tissues are coverable, uh, tendons are coverable, or they're not. If they're not, they need a flap as soon as you fix it. If, they, if they're coverable, then it gives you time uh, to deal with it. I won't acutely bone graft things that, I, that uh, I need. I'll come back and bone graft them. But those cases are few and far between, to be honest. Yes, sir. However, one of, one of our patient, colleagues is asking about the removal of metal work. Is it recommended? I, I think you have mentioned it, sir. You have something to it, sir? Yeah, my, my, my protocol is not to routinely remove. Uh, but I do have the discussion with people, but not until six months. Um, and I, 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 I've seen a couple of list Frank people, list Franks, uh, where the metal was removed at three months, everything recurs. And then I'm just going in there and doing fusions and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a lever in her. If it bugs people, fine. Then that gives me a, you know, another step. Okay. I'll take the hard route and see how you do a little debris mall, see how they do. Um, but I am not an early taker outer at all. I'll leave those plates in for a year easily. I don't think they violated the joint. Um, if I need to take it out, I can take it out. Um, so that, that's, that's me. Um, I don't know, Jamal, what are you? Yeah, I thank you so much, Professor Brad. Now, no, Professor no. Gamal? I say that, I uh, think it's the same thing with me. I just leave them alone. If they, if it bugs them, just take it out. I don't recall at least for the last seven years, since or yeah. something. I yeah. haven't except one patient who was just like, adamant about taking one screw out. Yeah. The lateral pins all pop out at six weeks. I'll leave, I'll, I'll take them out at six weeks. Um, and then uh, there was one more question in the chat that, oh, I think that was it, the hardware one, yeah. Yeah. This Thank you so much, Professor Brad. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk there. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for having me. It was great. Thank you. Now we come to the uh, last presentation. My dear friend, Professor Walid Kashta from McMaster University. Professor Walid uh, is uh, one of my best friends in Canada and in Egypt. Professor Walid will speak about pediatric food case presentation. I think it will be a very nice presentation, Professor Walid. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Professor uh, Mohammed al -Ashab and uh, it's very hard to uh, to talk after uh, this great presentation and great presenters. Um, and uh, now I'm between uh, all of the audience and their bed. Uh, I know it's at 12.30 a.m. in Egypt and maybe 1.30 in uh, 
in, uh, in other countries uh, more far uh, uh, east. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Premier League is done and no more uh, Mo Salah games. And, uh, and Ahli has lost his uh, African Cup, so no more games Saturday. So uh, it should be fine for you to stay uh, a little bit. This, this is only a case presentation. And it's, uh, it's one case. And uh, we'll go through it. And uh, let me know your thoughts. Interrupt me. Uh, it's a very short case. Uh, so if you please uh, stay with me for five minutes, uh, I would appreciate it. Um, so history is a nine-year-old boy uh, has progressive, progressive uh, left foot swelling and pain and not able to wear his shoes. He's actually a soccer player. He uh, has uh, no fever, no redness, uh, no night pain, uh, no loss of weight or appetite. He's healthy otherwise and no family history of any uh, other conditions. Examination, he has a severe foot swelling, which is hard, uh, although he has a normal sensation and he's moving his toes. And here is the X-ray and feel free to write your comments uh, on uh, what you see or what's your differential diagnosis. Oh, look at the chat. You can write in the chat? Yeah, you can write in the chat and, and I'm looking at the chat and um, we'll give it a few seconds and then we can move forward so won't, won't delay you. Yeah, Dr. Mustafa Fahmi, ABC and chondroma, bone cyst, ABC, GCT, osteoblastoma, chondroblastoma, amazing. So that's, that's a great differential diagnosis. Uh, until this moment, I haven't seen this patient, uh, has been treated by, uh, by another surgeon and um, who decided to get an MRI, uh, which I think uh, you, might, you might order and uh, he'll, he'll also uh, get a CT scan, but any comments on the MRI that make the differential less? Yeah, so the MRI fluid fluid level, excellent, Dr. Uh, Korshid. Um, benign, yes, fluids, yes. So yeah, it looks like there is some fluid fluid level. Uh, it's not the best of use to see the, the uh, axial section for the fluid fluid level, which is diagnostic of uh, aneurysmal bone cyst or ABCs. And, uh, and uh, MRI also commented there is some kind of granulation tissue inside uh, the cyst. CT scan has been ordered and uh, some of you would order some not. And uh, it shows like the cortex is still intact, although there is a, a expanding lesion. And you see also the growth plate uh, approximately is still intact. And of note, the growth plate of the yeah, first metatarsal is more proximal uh, compared to the rest of the toes that it's all uh, distal. A 3D, just for fun. And, uh, and yeah, so, so the surgeon did uh, curettage and, uh, added uh, synthetic bone graft after curettage. And this is a picture of the X-ray two weeks post-operatively. And actually the, the cysts get bigger. Uh, so what's your thoughts? I'm still looking at the chat. Giant, round tumor. Well, what makes it that incomplete evacuation? Curitage was not enough. Need adjuvant curitage. Dislodged bone graft. Giant cells. Excellent. So that's all. Uh, excellent thoughts. I, I would add, I, I thought about all of this um, when, when I get consulted to see this patient and aggressive ABC, uh, giant cell tumor, ABC. Uh, yeah, so, so I thought about this adding maybe infection as well. Maybe infection happened and because it's two weeks post-operatively. So uh, 
So I've seen the patient discussed with, uh, with him and, and his mom. Histology, histopathology was, uh, was aneurysmal bone cyst. Yeah, at that time, the pathology was ABC. So yeah, I discussed with his mom the need for uh, a revision. And uh, I thought, uh, if this is not an infection, this is a very aggressive ABC that uh, uh, I haven't seen. And usually ABCs, uh, we know it's aggressive and it's locally aggressive tumor, and there is high risk of recurrence uh, for uh, mostly boys and they're, if they're under age of 10, uh, but uh, risk of recurrence, uh, I don't see it as quick as two weeks. Um, some people talk about sclerotherapy therapy and, and, uh, and any adjuvant uh, therapy intraoperatively. So uh, here is what I thought of taking this patient to the OR, or you let me know. Yeah, let me know what do you think. Anyone wants to write uh, something and uh, it might be different than uh, what I thought. So this is two weeks post-operative, needs a structural bone graft, Dr. Uh, Alanezi. Uh, from Saudi, who was actually was uh, was a fellow with us, and who uh, did the surgery with with us, uh, maybe or was after he he um, or was before he started the fellowship. Uh, bone scan first, uh, recuritage uh, adjuvant, okay, surgical excision and fibular uh, uh, strut uh, graft. Uh, Doctor Mustafa Fahmi, Doctor Mustafa Fahmi, what do you do the strut graft like autograft, allograft? Uh, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa revision, high speed bear with cementation, uh, post orbitive radiation. Dr. Mohammed Riyad, I'm, I'm not sure about radiations you will accept it, especially in, uh, in children. Autograph, Dr. Mustafa Fahmi, excellent. Perfect, so that's a great thought. So I, I thought about the same thing. I, I, I thought of going to uh, OR and open this. It might be infection, might find pass right away. So we'll treat it as an infection versus it's a recurrence. And I also added something. I thought the synthetic, uh, uh, synthetic graft uh, can make the ABC angry. It's already angry uh, lesion and uh, it might irritate it. Uh, so I agree with most of you that we might change the strategy of the bone graft from synthetic to something uh, as uh, like autograft or allograft. And, and someone mentioned the fibular strut graft. But I thought even the fibular strut graft or autograft uh, might not resist the, the, the uh, aggressiveness of this lesion. And I found that the uh, allograft resists the lesions uh, more. Although we see delayed healing uh, or delayed incorporation of bone with the allografts, but I think this is the best case that needed the allograft was the delayed fighting between the aggressiveness of the lesion and the, and the bone graft. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing I was concerned about the, the growth plate and he might get a very short big toe, but that's not the, the big concern. So I went inside and uh, I, I thought this is the shape of the first metatarsal. I wanted this happen uh, uh, down the road, maybe in, in three, four years. And uh, I thought of having fibular allograft and I wanted to cut uh, the graft into two pieces as a T-shaped. Uh, so I put this on the base of the metatarsal and this is at the medulla and at the end of remodeling and the whole process, it might take the same shape of what I wanted to have for the, for the metatarsal. And I also added some cancellous at allogra uh, allograft around it um, when I did the surgery. So when we opened, there was no uh, infection. And uh, I'm not sure you can see this picture, but yeah, this is the first uh, post-operative X-ray. And uh, what I did is also, uh, I use the KOR just, uh, I'm not sure about the growth plate, but at least to preserve whatever is remaining. And I bought the graft as a T-shape. This is uh, uh, cancellous bone chips. 
and um, and it's also controversial for the neocortex to excise it or or not. So what I've done, I use the high speed bear uh, as some of you recommended to me, and uh, and I sutured the neocortex uh, on top of the graph just as much as I can. I'm trying to make a, a, a metatarsal. When I opened, I couldn't find anything. There is no bone here, uh, just a piece of the head, a piece of the uh, base, and nothing, nothing in between, except of the neocortex. So I decided to use the neocortex as a periosteum, and um, although some, some wouldn't do this, but um, uh, this is my thought at that time. And here is uh, some of the post-operative X-rays, and. Uh, and then uh, this patient came to me uh, just last week, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's about uh, four years post-operative now. Uh, he has a good length of the big toe, although you see the growth plate is almost uh, gone at the middle, has a high bar. Uh, you see the growth plates are distal on the other toes, just, uh, just as a basic science principle. Has these cystic changes, but uh, I'm not worried because uh, we know this is an allograft. The T-shaped made the, the thinking that we thought about. This will make it like a white base and, and a canal. And uh, still see a growth plate here. He's a high level soccer player now. And uh, uh, when I've seen him last week, he looks like, um, um, like this player in, uh, in uh, Manchester City. De Bruyne, the best player in, uh, in the Premier League. Uh, he didn't know him, but he's happy to know that he looks like De Bruyne. When he's seen his picture, uh, his mom was uh, was very happy. Uh, so yeah, this is it. Uh, any comments? Great job, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mohammed. I haven't used the uh, adjuvant uh, treatment, although his mom, every time she keeps asking uh, the adjuvant, one of her friends told her about it. Uh, I thought when I use a uh, high speed bear, it creates heat, and this is this is my adjuvant. Um, I'm not sure about the other stuff and and the evidence about the other stuff. Right. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. I will stop sharing and. Uh, I'll give it uh, back to Dr. Alasha. Any other questions to Professor Walid about this very interesting case? Okay. Uh, why didn't you use cement, sir? I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've never used cement in children. We. Sometimes we use uh, 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 Prudence uh, and it's injectable synthetic bone graft, but uh, recently I found, uh, I get more recurrence with the Prudence. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very happy with the allografts for uh, these aggressive tumors. Uh, so what, uh, there was another question. I just... yeah, yeah, are you worried about recurrence, sir? Yes, I was worried uh, about recurrence. Was at high risk of recurrence at the beginning, because uh, uh, he already came with a recurrence after two weeks, and that's an aggressive uh, lesion. If uh, allograft is not allowed, um, so some studies showed that with aggressive lesions, the autograft wouldn't stay longer, and there's high risk of recurrence. And uh, and that's another uh, recommendation was fibrous dysplasia, as we know, it's it's aggressive. And, uh, and it eats uh, autograft and there's a recommendation and it's uh, even for the usual teaching of our residents, Dr. Michelle Gert here, always telling them not to use autograft for fibrous dysplasia and I wouldn't even use it for similar lesion. But uh, I don't know if you don't have an autograft, uh, you, you might use autograft uh, in this case. And, uh, and when you use the autograft, uh, you, you need, a big piece. Um, I hate cutting a piece of fibula in, in children and except for excision of a tumor in the fibula itself, but using a piece of fibula for uh, a graft for the metatarsal might be your next option or you can take uh, iliac graft, uh, tricortical graft, but it, it needs a longer piece. Um, 
I think this would be your uh, uh, next option, but uh, you might find uh, a higher risk of recurrence. I think we have uh, no other comments. Professor Walid, thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. You, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mohammed. Finally, Asher. sir, Thanks I would to like to thank all our colleagues from McMaster University for this great event. Uh, special thanks for you, uh, Dr. Walid, for uh, your help and support, and all our colleagues from McMaster, Professor Wagih Musa from Southampton, and all our colleagues from different Egyptian universities. It was a great, great webinar. We stayed for six hours, more than 14 presentations. Uh, it's a great honor for us. Thank you so much, and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Take care. طبعا اشكر زملائنا الحاضرين جميعا يعني ان شاء الله بنوعدهم ب يعني ويبينار كبير برضه في الشهر الجاي ان شاء الله باذن الله تعالى. Thank you so much professor Reid. Thank you so much my colleagues. Thank you so much.